Chapter 8 of Ten Days That Shook the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas Longhurst. Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed. Chapter 8 Counter Revolution. Next morning, Sunday the 11th, the Cossacks entered Chakoya Selo, Kerensky himself riding a white horse, and all the church bells clamouring. From the top of a little hill outside the town could be seen the golden spires and many-coloured cupolas, the sprawling grey immensity of the capital spread along the dreary plain, and beyond the steely gulf of Finland. There was no battle, but Kerensky made a fatal blunder. At seven in the morning he sent word to the second Chakoya Selo rifles to lay down their arms. The soldiers replied that they would remain neutral, but would not disarm. Kerensky gave them ten minutes in which to obey. This angered the soldiers. For eight months they had been governing themselves by committee, and this smacked of the old regime. A few minutes later, Cossack artillery opened fire on the barracks, killing eight men. From that moment there were no more neutral soldiers in Charkoya. Petrograd woke to bursts of rifle fire, and the tramping thunder of men marching, under the high, dark sky, a cold wind smelt of snow. At dawn, the military hotel and the telegraph agency had been taken out by large forces of Junkers and bloodily recaptured. The telephone station was besieged by sailors who lay behind barricades of barrels, boxes and tin sheets in the middle of the Moshkoya, or sheltered themselves at the corner of the Gorokovaya and of St. Isaac Square, shooting at anything that moved. Occasionally, an automobile passed in and out, flying the Red Cross flag. The sailors let it pass. Albert Riss Williams was in the telephone exchange. He went out with the Red Cross automobile, which was ostensibly full of wounded. After circulating about the city, the car went by devious ways to Mikulovsky Junker School, headquarters of the counter-revolution. A French officer in the courtyard seemed to be in command. By this means, ammunition and supplies were conveyed to the telephone exchange. Scores of these pretended ambulances acted as couriers and ammunition trains for the Junkers. Five or six armoured cars belonging to the disbanded British Armoured Car Division were in their hands. As Louise Bryant was going along St. Isaac Square, one came rolling up from the Admiralty on its way to the telephone exchange. At the corner of Gogolia, right in front of her, the engine stalled. Some sailors ambushed behind woodpiles began shooting. The machine gun in the turret of the thing slewed around and spat a hail of bullets indiscriminately into the woodpiles and the crowd. In the archway where Miss Bryant stood, seven people were shot dead, among them two little boys. Suddenly, with a shout, the sailors leapt up and rushed into the flaming open. Closing around the monster, they thrust their bayonets into the loopholes again and again, yelling. The chauffeur pretended to be wounded, and they let him go free to run to the Duma and swell the tale of Bolshevik atrocities. Among the dead was a British officer. Later, the newspapers told of another French officer, captured in a Junker armoured car and sent to Peter Paul. The French embassy promptly denied this, but one of the city councillors told me that he himself had procured the officer's release from prison. Whatever the official attitude of the Allied embassies, individual French and British officers were active these days, even to the extent of giving advice at executive sessions of the Committee for Salvation. All day long, in every court of the city, were skirmishes between Junkers and Red Guards. Volleys, single shots, and the shrill chatter of machine guns could be heard far and near. The iron shutters of the shops were drawn, but business still went on. Even the moving picture shows, all outside lights dark, played to crowded houses. The streetcars ran. The telephones were all working. When you called central, shooting could be plainly heard over the wire. Schmolny was cut off, but the Duma and the Committee's Salvation were in constant communication with the Junker schools and with Kerensky at Chakoya. At seven in the morning, the Vladimir Junker school was visited by a patrol of soldiers, sailors and Red Guards, who gave the Junkers twenty minutes to lay down their arms. The ultimatum was rejected. An hour later, the Junkers got ready to march, but were driven back by a violent fusillade from the corner of the Grebechkaya, and Bolshoi Prospect. Soviet troops surrounded the building and opened fire, two armoured cars cruising back and forth with machine guns raking it. The Junkers telephoned for help. The Cossacks replied that they dared not come, because a large body of sailors with two cannon commanded their barracks. 
The Pavlov school was surrounded. Most of the Mikhailov Junkers were fighting in the streets. At half past eleven, three field pieces arrived. Another demand to surrender was met by the Junkers shooting down two of the Soviet delegates under the white flag. Now began a real bombardment. Great holes were torn into the walls of the school. The Junkers defended themselves desperately, shouting waves of red guards assaulting, crumpling under the withering blast. Kerensky telephoned from Charkoya to refuse all parley with the Military Revolutionary Committee. Frenzied by defeat and their heaps of dead, the Soviet troops opened a tornado of steel and flame against the battered building. Their own officers could not stop the terrible bombardment. A commissar from Shmolny, named Kirillov, tried to halt it. He was threatened with lynching. The Red Guard's blood was up. At half-past two, the Junkers hoisted the white flag. They would surrender if they were guaranteed protection. This was promised. With a rush and a shout, thousands of soldiers and Red Guards poured through the windows, doors and holes in the wall. Before it could be stopped, five Junkers were beaten and stabbed to death. The rest, about two hundred, were taken to Peter Paul under escort, in small groups so as to avoid notice. On the way, a mob set upon one party, killing eight more Junkers. More than a hundred Red Guards and soldiers had fallen. Two hours later, the Duma got a telephone message that the victors were marching towards the Ingenierie Jamok, the engineer school. A dozen members immediately set out to distribute among them armfuls of the latest proclamation of the Committee for Salvation. Several did not come back. All the other schools surrendered without resistance, and the Junkers were sent unharmed to Peter Paul and the Kronstadt. The telephone exchange held out until afternoon, when a Bolshevik armoured car appeared and the sailors stormed the place. Shrieking, the frightened telephone girls ran to and fro. The Junkers tore from their uniforms, all distinguishing marks, and one offered Williams anything for the loan of his overcoat as a disguise. They will massacre us! They will massacre us! they cried. For many of them had given their word at the Winter Palace not to take up arms against the people. Williams offered to mediate if Antonov were released. This was immediately done. Antonov and Williams made speeches to the victorious sailors, inflamed by their many dead. And once more the Junkers went free, all but a few who in their panic tried to flee over the roofs or to hide in the attic, and were found and hurled into the street. Tired, bloody, triumphant, the sailors and workers swarmed into the switchboard room, and finding so many pretty girls, fell back in an embarrassed way, and fumbled with awkward feet. Not a girl was injured, not one insulted. Frightened, they huddled in the corners, and then, finding themselves safe, gave vent to their spite. Ugh! The dirty, ignorant people! The fools! The sailors and red guards were embarrassed. Brutes! Pigs! shrilled the girls, indignantly putting on their coats and hats. Romantic had been their experience, passing up cartridges and dressing the wounds of their dashing young defenders, the Junkers, many of them members of noble families, fighting to restore their beloved Tsar. These were just common workmen, peasants, dark people. The commissar of the Military Revolutionary Committee, Little Vishniak, tried to persuade the girls to remain. He was effusively polite. You have been badly treated, he said. The telephone system is controlled by the municipal Duma. You are paid 60 rubles a month and have to work 10 hours and more. From now on, all that will be changed. The government intends to put the telephones under control of the Ministry of Posts and Telegraphs. Your wages will be immediately raised to 150 rubles and your working hours reduced. As members of the working class, you should be happy. Members of the working class indeed. Did he mean to infer that there was anything in common between these, these animals and us? Remain? Not if they offered a thousand rubles. Haughty and spiteful, the girls left the place. The employees of the building, the linemen and labourers, they stayed. But the switchboards must be operated. The telephone was vital. Only a half-dozen trained operators were available. Volunteers were called for. A hundred responded. Sailors, soldiers, workers. The six girls scurried backward and forward, instructing, helping, scolding. So, crippled, halting, but going, the wire slowly began to hum. The first thing was to connect Shmolny with the barracks and the factories. The second was to cut off the Duma and the Junker schools. Late in the afternoon, word of it spread through the city, and hundreds of bourgeois called up to scream, Fools! Devils! How long do you think you'll last? Wait till the Cossacks come! Dusk was already falling. On the almost deserted Nevsky, swept by a bitter wind, 
a crowd had gathered before the Kazan Cathedral, continuing the endless debate. A few workmen, some soldiers, and the rest shopkeepers, clerks and the like. "'But Lenin won't keep Germany to make peace?' cried one. A violent young soldier replied, "'And whose fault is it? Your damn Kerensky, dirty bourgeois! To hell with Kerensky! We don't want him! We want Lenin!' Outside the Duma, an officer with a white band was tearing down posters from the wall, swearing loudly. One read, To the population of Petrograd, At this dangerous hour, when the municipal Duma ought to use every means to calm the population, to assure it bread and other necessities, the right socialist revolutionaries and the cadets, forgetting their duty, have turned the Duma into a counter-revolutionary meeting, trying to raise part of the population against the rest so as to facilitate the victory of Kornilov Kerensky. Instead of doing their duty, the right socialist revolutionaries and the cadets have transformed the Duma into an arena of political attack upon the Soviets of workers, soldiers and peasants' deputies against the revolutionary government of peace, bread and liberty. Citizens of Petrograd, we the Bolshevik municipal councillors, elected by you, we want you to know that the right socialist revolutionaries and the cadets are engaged in counter-revolutionary action, have forgotten their duty, and are leading the population to famine, to civil war. We, elected by 183,000 votes, consider it our duty to bring the attention of our constituents what is going on in the Duma, and declare that we disclaim all responsibility for the terrible but inevitable consequences. Far away still sounded occasional shots, but the city lay quiet cold, as if exhausted by the violent spasms which had torn it. In the Nikolai Hall, the Duma session was coming to an end. Even the truculent Duma seemed a little stunned. One after another, the commissars reported. Capture of the telephone exchange, street fighting, the taking of the Vladimir school. The Duma, said Trupp, is on the side of the democracy in its struggle against arbitrary violence. But in any case, Whichever side wins, the Duma will always be against lynchings and torture. Konovsky, cadet, a tall man with a cruel face. When the troops of the legal government arrive in Petrograd, they will shoot down these insurgents and that will not be lynching. Protests all over the hall, even from his own party. Here there was doubt and depression. The counter-revolution was being put down. The Central Committee of the Socialist Revolutionary Party had voted lack of confidence in its officers. The left wing was in control. Aksentiev had resigned. A courier reported that the committee of welcome sent to meet Kerensky at the railway station had been arrested. In the streets could be heard the dull rumble of distant cannonading south and southwest. Still Kerensky did not come. Only three newspapers were out, Pravda, Dielo Naroda and Novoya Zhin. All of them devoted much space to the new coalition government. The Socialist Revolutionary paper demanded a cabinet without either cadets or Bolsheviki. Gorky was hopeful. Shmolny had made concessions. A purely socialist government was taking shape, all elements except for the bourgeoisie. As for Pravda, it sneered. We ridicule these coalitions with political parties whose most prominent members are petty journalists of doubtful reputation. Our coalition is that of the proletariat and the revolutionary army with the poor peasants. On the walls, a vainglorious announcement of the Vishkel, threatening to strike if both sides did not compromise. The conquerors of these riots, the saviors of the wreck of our country, these will be neither the Bolsheviki nor the Committee for Salvation, nor the troops of Kerensky, but we, the Union of Railway Men. Red Guards are incapable of handling a complicated business like the railways. As for the provisional government, it has shown itself incapable of holding the power. We refuse to lend our services to any party which does not act by authority of a government based on the confidence of all the democracy. Shmolny thrilled with the boundless vitality of inexhaustible humanity in action. In trade union headquarters, Lozovsky introduced me to a delegate of the railway workers of the Nikolai Line who said that the men were holding huge mass meetings, condemning the action of their leaders. "'All power to the Soviets!' he cried, pounding on the table. "'The Oberonsi and the Central Committee are playing Kornilov's game. They tried to send a mission to the Stavka, 
but we arrested them at Minsk. Our branch has demanded an all-Russian convention, and they refuse to call it. The same situation as in the Soviets, the army committees. One after another, the various democratic organizations all over Russia were cracking and changing. The cooperatives were torn by internal struggles. The meeting, the peasants' executive, broke up in stormy wrangling. Even among the Cossacks, there was trouble. On the top floor, the Military Revolutionary Committee was in full blast, striking and slacking not. Men went in, fresh and vigorous, night and day, and night and day they threw themselves into the terrible machine and came out limp, blind with fatigue, hoarse and filthy, to fall on the floor and sleep. The Committee for Salvation had been outlawed. Great piles of new proclamations, see Appendix 8, Section 2, littered the floor. The conspirators who have no support among the garrison or the working class, above all counted on the suddenness of their attack. Their plan was discovered in time by Sub-Lieutenant Blagon Ravov, thanks to the revolutionary vigilance of the soldier of the Red Guard, whose name shall be made public. At the center of the plot was the Committee for Salvation. Colonel Polkovnikov was in command of their forces, and the orders were signed by Goetz, former member of the Provisional Government, allowed at liberty on his word of honor. Bringing these facts to the attention of the Petrograd population, the Military Revolutionary Committee orders the arrest of all concerned in the conspiracy, who shall be tried before the Revolutionary Tribunal. From Moscow, word that the Junkers and Cossacks had surrounded the Kremlin and ordered the Soviet troops to lay down their arms. The Soviet forces complied, and as they were leaving the Kremlin, were set upon and shot down. Small forces of Bolsheviki had been driven from the telephone and telegraph offices. The Junkers now held the center of the city, but all around them the Soviet troops were mustering. Street fighting was slowly gathering way. All attempts at compromise had failed. On the side of the Soviet, 10,000 garrison soldiers and a few Red Guards. On the side of the government, 6,000 Junkers, 2,500 Cossacks and 2,000 White Guards. The Petrograd Soviet was meeting and next door the new Chaika, acting on the decrees and orders, see Appendix 8, Section 3, which came down in a steady stream from the Council of People's Commissars in session upstairs, on the order in which laws are to be ratified and published, establishing an eight-hour days for workers and Lunacharsky's basis for a system of popular education. Only a few hundred people were present at the two meetings, most of them armed. Shmolny was almost deserted, except for the guards, who were busy at the hall windows, setting up machine guns to command the flanks of the building. In the Chaika, a delegate of the Vishkel was speaking. We refuse to transport the troops of either party. We have sent a committee to Kerensky to say that if he continues to march on Petrograd, we will break his lines of communication. He made the usual plea for a conference of all the socialist parties to form a new government. Kamanyev answered discreetly. The Bolsheviki would be glad to attend the conference. The center of gravity, however, lay not in composition of such a government, but in its acceptance of the program of the Congress of Soviets. The Chaika had deliberated on the declaration made by the left socialist revolutionaries and the social democrats, internationalists, and had accepted the proposition of proportional representation at the conference, even including delegates from the army committees and the peasant Soviets. In the Great Hall, Trotsky recounted the events of the day. We offered the Vladimir Junkers a chance to surrender, he said. We wanted to settle matters without bloodshed, but now that blood has been spilled, there is only one way pitiless struggle. It would be childish to think that we can win by any other means. The moment is decisive. Everybody must cooperate with the Military Revolutionary Committee, report where there are stores of barbed wire, benzene, guns. We won the power, now we must keep it. The Menshevik Gyov tried to read his party's declaration, but Trotsky refused to allow a debate about principle. Our debates are now in the streets, he cried. The decisive step has been taken. We all, and I in particular, take the responsibility for what's happening. Soldiers from the front told their stories. One from the Death Battalion, 481st Artillery. When the trenches hear of this, they will cry, This is our government! A Junker from Peterhof said that he and two others had refused to march against the Soviets, and when his comrades had returned from the defense of the Winter Palace, 
they appointed him their commissar to go to Schmolny and offer their services to the real revolution. Then Trotsky again, fiery, indefatigable, giving orders, answering questions. The petty bourgeoisie, in order to defeat the workers, soldiers and peasants, would combine with the devil himself, he said once. Many cases of drunkenness had been remarked the last two days. No drinking, comrades. No one must be on the streets after eight in the evening, except the regular guards. All places suspected of having stores of liquor should be searched, and the liquor destroyed. See Appendix 8, Section 4. No mercy to the sellers of liquor. The Military Revolutionary Committee sent for the delegation from the Viborg section, then for the members from Putilov. They clumped out hurriedly. For each revolutionist killed, said Trotsky, we shall kill five counter-revolutionists. Downtown again, the Duma, brilliantly illuminated, and great crowds pouring in. In the lower hall, wailing and cries of grief. The throng surged back and forth before the bulletin board, where was posted a list of Junkers killed in the day's fighting, or supposed to be killed, for most of the dead afterwards turned up safe and sound. Up in the Alexander Hall, the Committee for Salvation held forth. The gold and red epaulettes of officers were conspicuous. The familiar faces of the Menshevik and socialist revolutionary intellectuals, the hard eyes and bulky magnificence of bankers and diplomats, officials of the old regime, and well-dressed women. The telephone girls were testifying. Girl after girl came to the tribune, overdressed, fashion-aping little girls, with pinched faces and leaky shoes. Girl after girl, flushing with pleasure at the applause of the nice people of Petrograd, of the officers, the rich, the great names of politics, girl after girl to narrate her sufferings at the hands of the proletariat and proclaim her loyalty to all that was old, established and powerful. The Duma was again in session in the Nikolai Hall. The mayor said hopefully that the Petrograd regiments were ashamed of their actions. Propaganda was making headway. Graphic. Proclamation for wine pogroms. Revolutionary law and order. A proclamation of the Finland Regiment in December 1917, announcing desperate remedies for wine pogroms. For translation, see Appendix 5. Emissaries came and went, reporting horrible deeds by the Bolsheviki, interceding to save the Junkers, busily investigating. The Bolsheviki, said Trupp, will be conquered by moral force and not by bayonets. Meanwhile, all was not well on the revolutionary front. The enemy had brought up armoured trains mounted with cannon. The Soviet forces, mostly raw red guards, were without officers and without a definite plan. Only 5,000 regular soldiers had joined them. The rest of the garrison was either busy suppressing the Junker revolt, guarding the city, or undecided what to do. At 10 in the evening, Lenin addressed a meeting of delegates from the city regiments, who voted overwhelmingly to fight. A committee of five soldiers was elected to serve as general staff and in the small hours of the morning the regiments left their barracks in full battle array. Going home I saw them pass, swinging along with the regular tread of veterans, bayonets in perfect alignment, through the deserted streets of the conquered city. At the same time, in the headquarters of the Vishkel, down on the Sadovaya, the conference of all socialist parties to form a new government was under way. Abramovich, for the centre Mensheviki, said that there should be neither conquerors nor conquered, that bygones should be bygones. In this were agreed all the left-wing parties. Dan, speaking in the name of the right Mensheviki, proposed to the Bolsheviki the following conditions for a truce. The Red Guard to be disarmed, and the Petrograd garrison to be placed at the orders of the Duma. The troops of Kerensky not to fire a single shot or arrest a single man. A ministry of all the socialist parties, except the Bolsheviki. For Shmolny, Ryazhanov and Kamenev declared that a coalition ministry of all parties was acceptable, but protested at Dan's proposals. The socialist revolutionaries were divided, but the executive committee of the peasant Soviets and popular socialists flatly refused to admit the Bolsheviki. After bitter quarrelling, a commission was elected to draw up a workable plan. All that night the commission wrangled, and all the next day, and the next night. Once before, on the 9th of November, there had been a similar effort at conciliation, led by Martov and Gorky. But at the approach of Kerensky and the activity of the Committee for Salvation, the right wing of the Mensheviki, 
socialist revolutionaries, and populist socialists suddenly withdrew. Now they were awed by the crushing of the Juncker rebellion. Monday the 12th was a day of suspense. The eyes of all Russia were fixed on the grey plain beyond the gates of Petrograd, where all the available strengths of the old order faced the unorganized power of the new, the unknown. In Moscow a truce had been declared. Both sides parlayed, awaiting the result in the capital. Now the delegates to the Congress of the Soviets, hurrying on speeding trains to the furthest reaches of Asia, were coming to their homes, carrying the fiery cross. In wide-spreading ripples, news of the miracle spread over the face of the land, and in its wake, towns, cities, and far villages stirred and broke. Soviets and military revolutionary committees against Dumas, Zemstovs, and the government commissars, red guards against white, street fighting and passionate speech. The result waited on the word from Petrograd. Shmolny was almost empty, but the Duma was thronged and noisy. The old mayor, in his dignified way, was protesting against the appeal of the Bolsheviki councillors. The Duma is not a centre of counter-revolution, he said warmly. The Duma takes no part in the present struggle between the parties. But at a time when there is no legal power in the land, the only centre of order is the municipal self-government. The peaceful population recognises this fact. The foreign embassies recognize only such documents as are signed by the mayor of the town. The mind of a European does not admit of any other situation. As the municipal self-government is the only organ which is capable of protecting the interests of the citizens. The city is bound to show hospitality to all organizations which desire to profit by such hospitality, and therefore the Duma cannot prevent the distribution of any newspapers whatever within the Duma building. The sphere of our work is increasing, and we must be given full liberty of action, and our rights must be respected by both parties. We are perfectly neutral. When the telephone exchange was occupied by the Junkers, Colonel Polkonivkov ordered the telephones to Shmolny, disconnected. But I protested, and the telephones were kept going. At this there was ironic laughter from the Bolshevik benches, and imprecations from the right. And yet, went on Schreider, they look upon us as counter-revolutionaries and report us to the population. They deprive us of our means of transport by taking away our last motor cars. It will not be our fault if there's famine in the town. Protests are of no use. Koboshev, Bolshevik member of the town board, was doubtful whether the military revolutionary committee had requisitioned the municipal automobiles. Even granting the fact, it was probably done by some unauthorized individual in the emergency. The mayor, he continued tells us that we must not make political meetings out of the Duma. But every Menshevik and socialist revolutionary here talks nothing but party propaganda, and at the door they distribute their legal newspapers, Iskri, Sparks, Soldatsky Golos, and Rabochaya Gazeta, inciting to insurrection. What if we Bolsheviki should also begin to distribute our papers here? But this shall not be, for we respect the Duma. We have not attacked the municipal self-government, and we shall not do so. But you have addressed an appeal to the population, and we are entitled also to do so. Followed him Shingaryov, cadet, who said that there could be no common language with those who were liable to be brought before the Attorney General for indictment, and who must be tried on the charge of treason. He proposed again that all Bolshevik members should be expelled from the Duma. This was tabled, however, for there were no personal charges against the members, and they were active in a municipal administration. Then, Two Mensheviki internationalists declaring that the appeal of the Bolshevik councillors was a direct incitement to massacre. If everything that is against the Bolsheviki is counter-revolutionary, said Pinkovich, then I do not know the difference between revolution and anarchy. The Bolsheviki are depending upon the passions of the unbridled masses. We have nothing but moral force. We will protest against massacres and violence from both sides, as our task is to find a peaceful issue. The notice posted in the streets under the heading, To the Pillory, which calls upon the people to destroy the Mensheviki and socialist revolutionaries, said Nazaryev, is a crime which you, Bolsheviki, will not be able to wash away. Yesterday's horrors are but a preface to what you are preparing by such proclamation. I have always tried to reconcile you with the other parties, but at present I feel for you nothing but contempt. The Bolshevik councillors were on their feet, shouting angrily, assailed by horse, hateful voices and waving arms. Outside the hall I ran into the city engineer, the Menshevik Gomberg and three or four reporters. They were all in high spirits. 
See, they said, the cowards are afraid of us. They don't dare arrest the Duma. Their military revolutionary committee doesn't dare to send a commissar into this building. Why, on the corner of the Sadovaya today, I saw a red guard try to stop a boy selling soldatsi golos. The boy just laughed at him, and a crowd of people wanted to lynch the bandit. It's only a few hours more now. Even if Kerensky wouldn't come, they haven't the men to run a government. Absurd. I understand they're even fighting among themselves at Shmolny. A socialist revolutionary friend of mine drew me aside. I know where the committee salvation is hiding, he said. Do you want to go and talk with them? By this time it was dusk. The city had again settled down to normal shop shutters up, lights shining, and on the streets great crowds of people slowly moving up and down and arguing. At number 86 Nevsky we went through passage in a courtyard, surrounded by tall apartment buildings. At the door of apartment 229 my friend knocked in a peculiar way. There was a sound of scuffling. An inside door slammed, then the front door opened a crack, and a woman's face appeared. After a minute's observation, she led us in, a placid-looking middle-aged lady who at once cried, Kirill, it's all right! In the dining room, where a samovar steamed on the table, and there were plates full of bread and raw fish, a man in uniform emerged from behind the window curtains, and another dressed like a workman from a closet. They were delighted to meet an American reporter. With a certain amount of gusto, both said that they would certainly be shot if the Bolsheviki caught them. They would not give me their names, but both were socialist revolutionaries. Why, I asked, do you publish such lies in your newspapers? Without taking offence, the officer replied, Yes, I know, but what can we do? He shrugged. You must admit it's necessary for us to create a certain frame of mind in the people. The other man interrupted, This is merely an adventure on the part of the Bolsheviki. They have no intellectuals. The ministries won't work. Russia is not a city, but a whole country. Realizing that they can only last a few days, we've decided to come to the aid of the strongest force opposed to them, Kerensky, and help to restore order. That is all very well, I said, but why do you combine with the cadets? The pseudo-workman smiled frankly. To tell you the truth, at this moment the masses of people are following the Bolsheviki. We have no following now. We can't mobilize a handful of soldiers. There are no arms available. The Bolsheviki are right to a certain extent. There are at this moment in Russia only two parties with any force, the Bolsheviki and the reactionaries, who are all hiding under the coattails of the cadets. The cadets think that they are using us, but it's really we who are using the cadets. When we smash the Bolsheviki, we shall turn against the cadets. Will the Bolsheviki be admitted into the new government? He scratched his head. That's a problem, he admitted. Of course, if they are not admitted, they will probably do this all over again. At any rate, they will have a chance to hold the balance of power in the constituent, that is, if there is a constituent. And then too, said the officer, that brings up the question of admitting the cadets into the new government, and for the same reasons. You know the cadets do not really want the constituent assembly, not if the Bolsheviki can be destroyed now. He shook his head. It is not easy for us Russians, politics. You Americans are born politicians. You have had politics all your lives. But for us... Well, it has only been a year, you know. What do you think of Kerensky? I asked. Oh, Kerensky is guilty of the sins of the provisional government, answered the other man. Kerensky himself forced us to accept coalition with the bourgeoisie. If he had resigned, as he threatened, it would have meant a new cabinet crisis only sixteen weeks before the constituent assembly, and that we wanted to avoid. But didn't it amount to that anyway? Yes, but how were we to know? They tricked us, the Kerenskys and Ashkemtyevs. Gotch is a little more radical. I stand with Chernoff, who is a real revolutionist. Why, only today Lenin sent word that he would not object to Chernoff entering the government. We wanted to get rid of the Kerensky government too, but we thought it better to wait for the constituent. At the beginning of this affair I was with the Bolsheviki, but the central committee of my party voted unanimously against it. And what could I do? It was a matter of party discipline. In a week the Bolshevik government will go to pieces. If the socialist revolutionaries could only stand aside and wait, the government would fall into their hands. But if we wait a week, the country will be so disorganized that the German imperialists will be victorious. That is why we began our revolt with only two regiments of soldiers promising to support us, and they turned against us. That left only the Junkers. How about the Cossacks? The officer sighed. They did not move. At first they said that they would come out if they had infantry support. They said, moreover, that they had their men with Kerensky, and that they were doing their part. 
Then, too, they said that the Cossacks were always accused of being hereditary enemies of democracy. And finally, the Bolsheviki promised that they will not take away our land. There is no danger to us. We remain neutral. During this talk, people were constantly entering and leaving, most of them officers, their shoulder straps torn off. We could see them in the hall and hear their low, vehement voices. Occasionally, through the half-drawn portiere, they caught a glimpse of a door opening in the bathroom, where a heavily built officer in a colonel's uniform sat on the toilet, writing something on a pad held in his lap. I recognized Colonel Polkovnikov, former commandant of Petrograd, for whose arrest the Military Revolutionary Committee would have paid a fortune. Our program, said the officer, this is it. Land to be turned over to the land committees. Workmen to have full representation in the control of industry. An energetic peace program, but not an ultimatum to the world such as the Bolsheviki issued. The Bolsheviki cannot keep their promises to the masses, even in the country itself. We won't let them. They stole our land program in order to get the support of the peasants. That is dishonest. If they had waited for the Constituent Assembly... It doesn't matter about the Constituent Assembly, broke in the officer. If the Bolsheviki wanted to establish a socialist state here, we cannot work with them in any event. Kerensky made the great mistake. He let the Bolsheviki know what he was going to do by announcing the Council Republic that he had ordered their arrest. But what, I said, do you intend now? The two men looked at one another. You will see in a few days. If there are enough troops from the front on our side, we shall not compromise with the Bolsheviki. If not, perhaps we shall be forced to. Out again on Nevsky, we swung on the step of a streetcar bulging with people, its platforms bent down from the weight and scraping along the ground, which crawled with agonizing slowness the long miles to Shmolny. Meshkovsky, a neat, frail little man, was coming down the hall looking worried. The strikes in the ministry, he told us, were having their effect. For instance, the Council of People's Commissars had promised to publish the secret treaties, but Neratov, the functionary in charge, had disappeared, taking the documents with him. They were supposed to be hidden in the British Embassy. Worst of all, however, was the strike in the banks. Without money, said Menshisky, we are helpless. The wages of the railroad men, of the postal and telegraph employees, must be paid. The banks are closed, and the key to the situation, the state bank, is also shut. All the bank clerks in Russia have been bribed to stop work. But Lenin has issued an order to dynamite the state bank vaults, and there is a decree just out, ordering the private banks to open tomorrow, or we will open them ourselves. The Petrograd Soviet was in full swing, thronged with armed men. Trotsky reporting. The Cossacks are falling back from Krasnoye Shelo. Sharp, exultant cheering. But the battle is only beginning. At Polkovo, heavy fighting is going on. All available forces must be hurried there. From Moscow, bad news. The Kremlin is in the hands of the Junkers and the workers have only a few arms. The result depends upon Petrograd. At the front, the decrees on peace and land are provoking great enthusiasm. Kerensky is flooding the trenches with tales of Petrograd burning and bloody, of women and children massacred by the Bolsheviki, but no one believes him. The cruisers Oleg, Avrora, Respublika are anchored in Neva, their guns trained to the approaches to the city. Why aren't you there with the Red Guards? shouted a rough voice. I'm going now, answered Trotsky, and left the platform, his face a little paler than usual. He passed down the side of the room, surrounded by eager friends, and hurried out to the waiting automobile. Kamenev now spoke, describing the proceedings of the reconciliation conference. The armistice conditions proposed by the Mensheviki, he said, have been contemptuously rejected. Even the branches of the Railway Men's Union had voted against such a proposition. Now that we've won the power and are sweeping all Russia he declared. All they ask of us are three little things. One, to surrender the power. Two, to make the soldiers continue the war. Three, to make the peasants forget about the land. Lenin appeared for a moment to answer the accusations of the socialist revolutionaries. They charge us with stealing their land program. If that is so, we bow to them. It is good enough for us. So the meeting roared on, leader after leader, explaining, exhorting, arguing, soldier after soldier, workman after workman, standing up to speak his mind and his heart. The audience flowed, changing and renewed continually. From time to time men came in, yelling for the members of such and such a detachment to go to the front. Others, relieved, wounded or coming to Shmolny for arms and equipment, poured in. 
It was almost three o'clock in the morning when, as we left the hall, Holtzman of the Military Revolutionary Committee came running down the hall with a transfigured face. It's all right, he shouted, grabbing my hands. Telegram from the front. Kerensky is smashed. Look at this. He held out a sheet of paper scribbled hurriedly in pencil, and then, seeing that we couldn't read it, he declaimed aloud, Pulkovo, staff, 2.10 a.m. The night of October 30th to 31st will go down in history. The attempt of Kerensky to move counter-revolutionary troops against the capital of the revolution has been decisively repulsed. Kerensky is retreating. We are advancing. The soldiers, sailors, and workers of Petrograd have shown that they can and will, with arms in their hands, enforce the will and authority of the democracy. The bourgeoisie tried to isolate the revolutionary army. Kerensky attempted to break it by the force of the Cossacks. Both plans met a pitiful defeat. The grand idea of the domination of worker and peasant democracy closed the ranks of the army and hardened its will. All the country from now on will be convinced that the power of the Soviets is no ephemeral thing, but an invincible fact. The repulse of Kerensky is the repulse of the landowners, the bourgeoisie, and the Kornilovists in general. The repulse of Kerensky is a confirmation of the right of the people to a peaceful free life, to land, bread, and power. The Pulkovo detachment, by its valorous blow, has strengthened the cause of the workers' and peasants' revolution. There is no return to the past. Before us are struggles, obstacles, and sacrifices. But the road is clear and victory is certain. Revolutionary Russia and the Soviet power can be proud of the Pulkovo detachment, acting under the command of Colonel Walden. Eternal memory to those who fell, glory to the warriors of the revolution, the soldiers and officers who were faithful to the people. Long live revolutionary, popular socialist Russia. In the name of the council, L. Trotsky, People's Commissar. Driving home across Zhanemsky Square, we made out an unusual crowd in front of the Nikolai railway station. Several thousand sailors were massed there, bristling with rifles. Standing on the steps, a member of the Vishkel was pleading with them. Comrades, we cannot carry you to Moscow. We are neutral. We do not carry troops for either side. We cannot take you to Moscow, where already there is terrible civil war. All the seething square roared at him. The sailors began to surge forward. Suddenly another door was flung open. In it stood two or three brakemen, a fireman or so. This way, comrades, cried one. We'll take you to Moscow or Vladivostok, if you like. Long live the revolution! End of chapter 8 Recording by Nicholas Longhurst Chapter 9 of Ten Days That Shook the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Beck Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed Chapter 9 Victory Order Number 1 To the Troops of the Pulkov Detachment November 13th, 1917, 38 minutes past 9 a.m. After a cruel fight, the troops of the Pulkovo detachment completely routed the counter-revolutionary forces, who retreated from their positions in disorder, and under the cover of Zaroki Selo, fell back towards Pavlovsk II and Gatchinia. Our advanced units occupy the northeastern extremity of Tsarkoe Selo and the station Alexandrovskia. The Kolpino detachment was on our left, the Krasnoye Selo detachment to our right. I ordered the Polokovo forces to occupy Tsyokoyo Selo to fortify its approaches, especially on the side of Gachina. Also, to pass and occupy Palovskoloi, fortifying its southern side, and to take up the railroad as far as Dano. The troops must take all measures to strengthen the positions occupied by them, arranging trenches and other defensive works. They must enter into close liaison with the detachments of Kolpino and Krajovsnyod Selo, and also with the staff of the Commander-in-Chief for the Defence of Petrograd. Signed, Commander-in-Chief over all forces acting against the counter-revolutionary troops of Kerensky, 
Lieutenant Colonel Muravivov. Tuesday morning. But how is this? Only two days ago the Petrograd campagna was full of leaderless bands, wandering aimlessly, without food, without artillery, without a plan. What had fused that disorganized mass of undisciplined Red Guards and soldiers without officers, into an army obedient to its own elected high command, tempered to meet and break the assault of cannon and Cossack cavalry? See Appendix 9, Section 1. People in revolt have a way of defying military precedent. The ragged armies of the French Revolution are not forgotten. Valmy and the lines of Weizenburg, massed against the Soviet forces, were Yonkers, Cossacks, landowners, nobility, Black Hundreds, the Tsar come again, Okurana and Siberian chains, and the vast and terrible menace of the Germans. Victory, in the words of Carlyle, meant apotheosis and millennium without end. Sunday night, the commissars of the Military Revolutionary Committee returning desperately from the field. The garrison of Petrograd elected its committee of five, its battle staff, three soldiers and two officers, all certified free from counter-revolutionary taint. Colonel Moraevov, expatriate, was in command, an efficient man, but to be carefully watched. At Kolpino, at Obukohov, at Pulkovo, and Kryozny Selo were formed provisional detachments, increased in size as the stragglers came in from the surrounding country, mixed soldiers, sailors and red guards, parts of regiments, infantry, cavalry and artillery all together, and a few armoured cars. Day broke and the pickets of Kerensky's Cossacks came in touch. Scattered rifle fire, summons to surrender. Over the bleak plain on the cold, quiet air spread the sound of battle, falling upon the ears of roving bands as they gathered about their little fires, waiting. So it was beginning. They made towards the battle, and the worker hordes pouring out along the straight roads quickened their pace. Thus, upon all the points of attack, automatically converged angry human swarms to be met by commissars in their assigned positions, or work to do. This was their battle, for their world. The officers in command were elected by them. For the moment, that incoherent multiple will was one will. Those who participated in the fighting described to me how the sailors fought until they ran out of cartridges, and then stormed. How the untrained workmen rushed the charging Cossacks and tore them from their horses. How the anonymous hordes of the people, gathering in the darkness around the battle, rose like a tide and poured over the enemy. Before midnight of Monday, the Cossacks broke and were fleeing, leaving their artillery behind them, and the army of the proletariat, on a long, ragged front, moved forward and rolled into Sarovsky, before the enemy had a chance to destroy the great government wireless station, from which now the commissars of Smolny were hurling out to the world peons of triumph. To all Soviets of workers and soldiers' deputies, the 12th of November, in a bloody combat near Savoki Selo, the revolutionary army defeated the counter-revolutionary troops of Kerensky and Kornilov. In the name of the revolutionary government, I order all regiments to take the offensive against the enemies of the revolutionary democracy, and to take all measures to arrest Kerensky, and also to oppose any adventure which might menace the conquests of the revolution, and the victory of the proletariat. Long live the revolutionary army! Muraviov. News from the provinces. At Sevastopol, the local Soviet had assumed the power. A huge meeting of the sailors on the battleships in the harbour had forced their officers to line up and swear allegiance to the new government. At Nizhny Novgorod, the Soviet was in control. From Kazan came reports of a battle in the streets. Yonkers and a brigade of artillery against the Bolshevik garrison. Desperate fighting had broken out again in Moscow. The Yonkers and White Guards held the Kremlin in the centre of the town, beaten upon from all sides by the troops of the Military Revolutionary Committee. The Soviet artillery was stationed in Skobliev Square, bombarding the City Duma building, 
the prefecture and the hotel metropole. The cobblestones of the Svernkaya and the Nitsikaya had been torn up for trenches and barricades. A hail of machine gun fire swept the quarters of the great banks and commercial houses. There were no lights, no telephones. The bourgeois population lived in the cellars. The last bulletin said that the Military Revolutionary Committee had delivered an ultimatum to the Committee of Public Safety, demanding the immediate surrender of the Kremlin or bombardment would follow. Bombard the Kremlin, cried the ordinary citizen. They dare not. From Volgadnia to Shita in far Siberia, from Pskov to Sevastopol on the Black Sea, in great cities and little villages, civil war burst into flame. From thousands of factories, peasant communes, regimes and armies, ships on the wide sea, greetings poured into Petrograd, greetings to the government of the people. The Cossack government at Novocherkass telegraphed to Kerensky. The government of the Cossack troops invites the provisional government and the members of the Council of the Republic to come, if possible, to Novocherkask, where we can organize in common the struggle against the Bolsheviki. In Finland, also, things were stirring. The Soviets of Helsingfors and the Trensko Trobalt, the Central Committee of the Baltic Fleet, jointly proclaimed a state of siege and declared that all attempts to interfere with the Bolshevik forces and all armed resistance to its orders would be severely repressed. At the same time, the Finnish Railway Union called a countrywide general strike to put into operation the laws passed by the Socialist Diet of June 1917, dissolved by Kerensky. Early in the morning I went out to Smolny, Going up the long wooden sidewalk from the outer gate, I saw the first thin, hesitating snowflakes fluttering down from the grey, windless sky. Snow! cried the soldier at the door, grinning with delight. Good for the health! Inside the long gloomy halls and bleak rooms seemed deserted. No one moved in all the enormous pile. A deep and easy sound came to my ears, and looking around, I noticed that everywhere on the floor, along the walls, men were sleeping. Rough, dirty men, workers and soldiers, splattered and caked with mud, sprawled alone or in heaps, in the careless attitudes of death. Some wore ragged bandages marked with blood. Guns and cartridge belts were scattered about. The victorious proletarian army! In the upstairs buffet so thick that they lay that one could hardly walk. The air was foul. Through the clouded windows a pale light streamed. A battered samovar, cold, stood on the counter, and many glasses holding dregs of tea. Beside them lay a copy of the Military Revolutionary Committee's last bulletin, upside down, scrawled with painful handwriting. It was a memorial written by some soldier to his comrades fallen in the fight against Kerensky, just as he had set it down before falling on the floor to sleep. The writing was blurred with what looked like tears. Alexei Vinogradov, D. Maskvin, S. Stobikovy, A. Voskrensky, D. Leonsky, D. Preobrazensky, V. Leidansky, M. Berchikov. These men were drafted into the army on November the 15th, 1916. Only three are left of the above. Mikhail Berkiov, Alexei Vozrensky, Dmitry Leonsky. Sleep, warrior eagles, sleep with peaceful soul. You have deserved our own ones, happiness and eternal peace. Under the earth of the grave you have straightly closed your ranks. Sleep, citizens. Only the Military Revolutionary Committee still functioned, unsleeping. Skripnik, emerging from the inner room, said that Goths had been arrested, but had flatly denied signing the proclamation of the Committee for Salvation, as had Avensky Sintiev, and the Committee for Salvation itself had repudiated the appeal to the garrison. There was still disaffection among the city regiments, Skripnik reported, and the Vorinsky regiment had refused to fight against Kerensky. Several detachments of neutral troops, with Chernov at their head, were at Gatchina, 
trying to persuade Kerensky to halt his attack on Petrograd. Skripnik laughed. There can be no neutrals now, he said. We've won! His sharp-bearded face glowed with an almost religious exultation. More than sixty delegates have arrived from the front with assurances of support by all the armies except the troops on the Romanian front, who have not been heard from. The army committees have suppressed all news from Petrograd, but now we have a regular system of couriers. Graphic. Order given me at staff headquarters by command of the Council of People's Commissars to transmit the first dispatch out of Petrograd after the November Revolution over the government wires to America. Translation. Staff. Military Revolutionary Committee. Soviet W and SD. 2nd November 1917. Number 1860. Certificate is given by the present to the journalist of the New York Socialist Press, John Reed, that the text of the telegram, herewith, has been examined by the government of People's Commissars, and there is no objection to its transmission, and also it is recommended that all cooperate in every way to transmit same to its destination. For the Commander-in-Chief, Antonov, Chief of Staff, Vladimir Bonch Bruvich. Down in the front hall, Kamenivik was just entering, worn out by the all-night session of the conference to form a new government, but happy. Already the socialist revolutionaries are inclined to admit us into the new government, he told me. The right-wing groups are frightened by the revolutionary tribunals. They demand, in a sort of panic, that we dissolve them before going any further. We have accepted the proposition of the Vigzel to form a homogeneous socialist ministry, and they're working on that now. You see, it all springs from our victory. When we were down, they wouldn't have us here at any price. Not everybody's in favour of some agreement with the Soviets. What we need is a really decisive victory. Kerensky wants an armistice, but he'll have to surrender. See Appendix 9, Section 2. That was the temper of the Bolshevik leaders. To a foreign journalist who asked Trotsky what statement he had to make to the world, Trotsky replied, At this moment, the only statement possible is the one we are making through the mouths of our cannon. But there was an undercurrent of real annexity in the tide of the victory, the question of finances. Instead of opening the banks, as had been ordered by the Military Revolutionary Committee, the Union of Bank Employees had held a meeting and declared a formal strike. Smolny had demanded some 35 millions of rubles from the state bank, and the cashier had locked the vaults, only paying out money to the representatives of the provisional government. The reactionaries were using the state bank as a political weapon. For instance, when the Vixel demanded money to pay the salaries of the employees of the government railroads, it was told to apply to Smolny. I went to the state bank to see the new commissar, a red-haired Ukrainian Bolshevik named Petrovich. He was trying to bring order out of the chaos in which affairs had been left by the striking clerks. In all the offices of the huge place, perspiring volunteer workers, soldiers and sailors, their tongues sticking out of their mouths in the intensity of their effort, were poring over the great ledgers with a bewildered air. The Duma building was crowded. There were still isolated cases of defiance toward the new government, but they were rare. The Central Land Committee had appealed to the peasants, ordering them not to recognize the land decree passed by the Congress of the Soviets, because it would cause confusion and civil war. Mayor Schreider announced that because of the Bolshevik insurrection, the elections to the Constituent Assembly would have to be indefinitely postponed. Two questions seemed to be utmost in all minds. Shocked by the ferocity of the civil war, First, a truce to the bloodshed. See Appendix 9, Section 3. Second, the creation of a new government. There was no longer any talk of destroying the Bolsheviki, and very little about excluding them from the government, except from the populist socialists and the peasant Soviets. Even the Central Army Committee at the Stavka, the most determined enemy of Smolny, telephoned from Mogilev. If, to constitute the new ministry... It is necessary to come to an understanding with the Bolsheviki. We agree to admit them, in a minority, to the cabinet. Pravda, 
ironically calling attention to Kerensky's humanitarian sentiments, published his dispatch to the Committee for Salvation. In accord with the proposals of the Committee for Salvation and all the democratic organizations united around it, I have halted all military action against the rebels. A delegate of the committee has been sent to enter into negotiations. Take all measures to stop the useless shedding of blood. The Vixal sent a telegram to all Russia. The conference of the Union of Railway Workers with the representatives of both the belligerent parties, who admit the necessity of an agreement, protest energetically against the use of political terrorism in the civil war, especially when it is carried on between different factions of the revolutionary democracy, and declare that political terrorism, in whatever form, is in contradiction to the very idea of the negotiations for a new government. Graphic. Popular leaflets sold in the streets just after the Bolshevik insurrection, containing rhymes and jokes about the defeated bourgeoisie and the moderate socialist leaders called How the Bourgeois Bourgeoisie Lost the Power. Delegations from the conference were sent to the front, to Gatchina. In the conference itself, everything seemed on the point of final settlement. It had even been decided to elect a provisional people's council, composed of about 400 members, 75 representing Smolny, 75 the old Saika, and the rest split up among the town doomers, the trade unions, land committees and political parties. Chernov was mentioned as the new premier. Lenin and Trotsky, rumour said, were to be excluded. About noon, I was again in front of Smolny, talking with the driver of an ambulance bound for the Revolutionary Front. Could I go with him? Certainly. He was a volunteer, a university student, and as we rolled down the street, shouted over his shoulder to me phrases of execrable German. Also, Ruth, we nach die Kasernen zu essen gehen. I made out that there would be lunch at some barracks. On the Kirochnaya we turned into an immense courtyard surrounded by military buildings, and mounted a dark stairway to a low room lit by one window. At a long wooden table were seated some twenty soldiers, eating shchik, cabbage soup, from a great tin wash tub with wooden spoons, and talking loudly with much laughter. Welcome to the battalion committee of the 6th Reserve Engineers Battalion! cried my friend, and introduced me as an American socialist. Whereat everyone rose to shake my hand, and one old soldier put his arms around me and gave me a hearty kiss. A wooden spoon was produced and I took my place at the table. Another tub, full of kasha, was brought in, a huge loaf of black bread, and of course the inevitable teapots. At once everyone began asking me questions about America. Was it true that people in a free country sold their votes for money? If so, how did they get what they wanted? How about this Tammany? Was it true that in a free country a little group of people could control a whole city and exploited it for their personal benefit? Why did the people stand it? Even under the Tsar such things could not happen in Russia. True, here there was always graft, but to buy and sell a whole city full of people, and in a free country, had the people no revolutionary feeling? I tried to explain that in my country people tried to change things by law. Of course, nodded a young sergeant named Baklanov, who spoke French, but you have a highly developed capitalist class. Then the capitalist class must control the legislatures and the courts. How then can the people change things? I am open to conviction, for I do not know your country. But to me it is incredible. I said that I was going to Tsarkoye Selo. I, too, said Baklanov suddenly. And I, and I, the whole roomful decided on the spot to go to Tsarkoye Selo. Just then came a knock on the door. It opened, and in it stood the figure of the colonel. No one rose, but all shouted a greeting. May I come in? asked the colonel. Prozim, prozim, they answered heartily. He entered smiling a tall, distinguished figure in a goat-skin cape embroidered with gold. 
I think I heard you say you were going to Tsarkoye Selo, comrades, he said. Could I go with you? Baklanov considered. I do not think there is anything to be done here today, he answered. Yes, comrade, we shall be very glad to have you. The colonel thanked him and sat down, filling a glass of tea. In a low voice, for fear of wounding the colonel's pride, Baklanov explained to me, You see, I am the chairman of the committee. We control the battalion ex absolutely, except in action, when the colonel is delegated by us to command. In action his orders must be obeyed, but he is strictly responsible to us. In barracks he must ask our permission before taking any action. You might call him our executive officer. Arms were distributed to us, revolvers and rifles. We might meet some Cossacks, you know. And we all piled into the ambulance, together with three great bundles of newspapers for the front. Straight down the Litenye we rattled and along the Zagordny Prospect. Next to me sat a youth with the soldier straps of a lieutenant who seemed to speak all European languages with equal fluency. He was a member of the battalion committee. I am not a Bolshevik, he assured me emphatically. My family is a very ancient and noble one. I, myself, am, you might say, a cadet. But how? I began bewildered. Oh, yes, I'm a member of the committee. I make no secret of my political opinions, but the others do not mind, because they know I do not believe in opposing the will of the majority. I have refused to take any action in the present civil war, however, for I do not believe in taking up arms against my brother Russians. Provocator! Kornilovitz! The others cried at him gaily, slapping him on the shoulder. Passing under the huge grey stone archway of the Moscovy Gate, covered with golden hieroglyphics, ponderous imperial eagles and the names of Tsars, we sped out on the wide, straight highway, grey with the first light fall of snow. It was thronged with red guards stumbling along on foot towards the revolutionary front, shouting and singing, and others grey-faced and muddy coming back. Most of them seemed to be mere boys, women with spades, some with rifles and bandoliers, others wearing the red cross on their armbands, the bowed, toil-worn women of the slums. Squads of soldiers marching out of steps with an affectionate jeer for the Red Guards. Sailors, grim-looking, children with bundles of food for their fathers and mothers, all these coming and going trudged through the whitened mud that covered the cobbles of the highway inches deep. We passed cannon, jingling southward with their caissons, trucks bound both ways, bristling with armed men, ambulances full of wounded from the direction of the battle, and once a peasant cart, creaking slowly along, in which sat a white-faced boy bent over his shattered stomach and screaming monotonously. In the fields on either side, women and old men were digging trenches and stringing barbed wire entanglements. Back northward the clouds rolled away dramatically, and the pale sun came out. Across the flat marshy plain Petrograd glittered. To the right, white and gilded and coloured bulbs and pinnacles. To the left, tall chimneys, some pouring out black smoke, and beyond a lowering sky over Finland. On each side of us were churches, monasteries. Occasionally a monk was visible, silently watching the pulse of the proletarian army throbbing on the road. At Pulkovo the road divided, and there we halted in the midst of a great crowd, where the human streams poured from three directions, friends meeting, excited and congratulatory, describing the battle to one another. A row of houses facing the crossroads was marked with bullets, and the earth was trampled into mud half a mile around. The fighting had been furious here. In the near distance riderless Cossack horses circled hungrily, for the grass of the plain had died long ago. Right in front of us an awkward red guard was trying to ride one, falling off again and again to the childlike delight of a thousand rough men. The left road, along which the remnants of the Cossacks had retreated, 
led up a little hill to a hamlet where there was a glorious view of the immense plain, grey as a windless sea, tumultuous clouds hanging over and the imperial city disgorging its thousands along the roads. Far over to the left lay the little hill of Cronyoi Sello, the parade ground of the Imperial Guard's summer camp and the Imperial Dairy. In the middle distance nothing broke the flat monotony but a few walled monasteries and convents, some isolated factories and several large buildings with unkempt grounds that were asylums and orphanages. Here, said the driver as we went on over a barren hill, here was where Vera Slutskaya died. Yes, the Bolshevik member of the Duma. It happened early this morning. She was in an automobile with Zalkind and another man. There was a truce, and they started for the front trenches. They were talking and laughing, when all of a sudden, from the armoured train in which Kerensky himself was riding, somebody saw the automobile and fired a cannon. The shell struck Vera Slutskaya and killed her. And so we came into Svarkoy all bustling with the swaggering heroes of the proletarian horde. Now the palace where the Soviet had met was a busy place. Red guards and sailors filled the courtyard. Sentries stood at the doors, and a stream of couriers and commissars pushed in and out. In the Soviet room a samovar had been set up, and fifty or more workers, soldiers, sailors and officers stood around, drinking tea and talking at the top of their voices. In one corner, two clumsy-handed working men were trying to make a multigraphing machine go. At the centre table, the huge Dibenko bent over a map, marking out positions for the troops with red and blue pencils. In his free hand, he carried, as always, the enormous blue steel revolver. Anon, he sat himself down at a typewriter and pounded away with one finger. Every little while, he would pause, pick up the revolver, and lovingly spin the chamber. A couch lay along the wall, and on this was stretched a young workman. Two red guards were bending over him, but the rest of the company did not pay any attention. In his breast was a hole. Through his clothes fresh blood came welling up with every heartbeat. His eyes were closed, and his young, bearded face was greenish-white. Faintly and slowly he still breathed, with every breath sighing, Mere Budit, Mere Budit, peace is coming. Peace is coming. Dibenko looked up as we came in. Ah, he said to Baklanov. Comrade, will you go up to the commandant's headquarters and take charge? Wait, I will write you credentials. He went to the typewriter and slowly picked out the letters. The new commandant of Zarkoye, Zello and I went toward the Ekaterina Palace. Baklanov, very excited and important. In the same ornate white room, some red guards were rummaging curiously around, while my old friend, the colonel, stood by the window biting his moustache. He greeted me like a long-lost brother. At a table near the door sat the French Bessarabian. The Bolsheviki had ordered him to remain and continue his work. "'What could I do?' he muttered. "'People like myself cannot fight on either side in such a war as this.' No matter how much we may instinctively dislike the dictatorship of the mob, I only regret that I am so far from my mother in Bessarabia. Baklanov was formally taking over the office from the commandant. Here, said the colonel nervously, are the keys to the desk. A red guard interrupted. Where's the money? he asked rudely. The colonel seemed surprised. Money? Money? Ah, you mean the chest. There it is said the colonel, just as I found it when I took possession three days ago. Keys? The colonel shrugged. I have no keys. The red guard sneered knowingly. Very convenient, he said. Let us open the chest, said Baklanov. Bring an axe. Here is an American comrade. Let him smash the chest open and write down what he finds there. I swung the axe and the wooden chest was empty. Let's arrest him, said the Red Guard venomously. He is Kerensky's man. He has stolen the money and given it to Kerensky. Baklanov did not want to. Oh no, he said. It was the Kornlyovitz before him. He is not to blame. The devil, cried the Red Guard. He is Kerensky's man. I tell you, if you won't arrest him, then we will, and we'll take him to Petrograd and put him in Peter Paul, where he belongs. 
At this the other red guards growled assent. With a piteous glance at us, the colonel was led away. Down in front of the Soviet palace, an auto truck was going to the front. Half a dozen red guards, some sailors, and a soldier or two, under command of a huge workman, clambered in and shouted to me to come along. Red guards issued from headquarters, each of them staggering under an armload of small, corrugated iron bombs, filled with grubbit, which, they say, is ten times as strong and five times as sensitive as dynamite. These they threw into the truck. A three-inch cannon was loaded and then tied onto the tail of the truck with bits of rope and wire. We started with a shout, at top speed of course, the heavy truck swaying from side to side. The cannon leaped from one wheel to the other and the grubbit bombs went rolling back and forth over our feet, fetching up against the sides of the car with a crash. The big red guard, whose name was Vladimir Nikolaevich, plied me with questions about America. Why did America come into the war? Are the American workers ready to throw over the capitalist? What is the situation in the Muni case now? Will they extradite Berkman to San Francisco? And other, very difficult to answer, all delivered in a shout above the roaring of the truck, while we held on to each other and danced amid the caroming bombs. Occasionally a patrol tried to stop us. Soldiers ran out into the road before us, shouted, Stoi! and threw up their guns. We paid no attention. The devil take you, cried the Red Guards. We don't stop for anybody. We're Red Guards. And we thundered imperiously on, while Vladimir Nikolaevich bellowed to me about the internationalization of the Panama Canal and such matters. About five miles out, we saw a squad of sailors marching back and slow down. Where's the front, brothers? The foremost sailor halted and scratched his head. Hmm. This morning, he said, it was about half a kilometre down the road. But the damn thing isn't anywhere now. We walked and walked and walked, but we couldn't find it. They climbed into the truck and we proceeded. It must have been about a mile further that Vladimir Nikolaevich cocked his ear and shouted to the chauffeur to stop. Firing, he said. Do you hear it? For a moment, dead silence. And then, a little ahead and to the left, three shots in rapid succession. Along here, the side of the road was heavily wooded. Very much excited now, we crept along, speaking in whispers until the truck was nearly opposite the place where the firing had come from. Descending, we spread out, and every man carrying his rifle went stealthily into the forest. Two comrades, meanwhile, detached the cannon and slewed it around until it aimed as nearly as possible at our backs. It was silent in the woods. The leaves were gone and the tree trunks were a pale one colour in the low, sickly autumn sun. Not a thing moved, except the ice of little woodland pools shivering under our feet. Was it an ambush? We went uneventfully forward until the trees began to thin and paused. Beyond, in a little clearing, three soldiers sat around a small fire, perfectly oblivious. Vladimir Nikolaevich stepped forward. Shrazvichi, comrades, he greeted, while behind him one cannon, twenty rifles and a truckload of grubbit bombs hung by a hair. The soldiers scrambled to their feet. What was the shooting going on around here? One of the soldiers answered, looking relieved. Why, we were just shooting a rabbit or two, comrade. The truck hurtled on towards Romanov through the bright empty day. At the first crossroads two soldiers ran out in front of us, waving their rifles. We slowed down and stopped. Passes, comrades! The Red Guards raised a great clamour. We are Red Guards! We don't need any passes. Go on, never mind them. But a sailor objected. This is wrong, comrades. We must have revolutionary discipline. Suppose some counter-revolutionaries came along in a truck and said, We don't need any passes. The comrades don't know you. At this there was a debate. One by one, however, the sailors and soldiers joined with the first. Grumbling, each red guard produced his dirty Bumaga paper. They were all alike except mine, which had been issued by the revolutionary staff at Smolny. The sentries declared I must go with them. The red guards objected strenuously, but the sailor who had spoken first insisted. This comrade we know to be a true comrade, he said. 
but there are the orders of the committee, and these orders must be obeyed. That is revolutionary discipline. In order not to make any trouble, I got down from the truck and watched it disappear, careering down the road, all the company waving farewell. The soldiers consulted in low tones for a moment, and then led me to a wall against which they placed me. It flashed upon me suddenly. They were going to shoot me! In all three directions not a human being was in sight. The only sign of life was smoke from the chimney of a dacha, a rambling wooden house a quarter of a mile up the side road. The two soldiers were walking out into the road. Desperately I ran after them. But comrades, see, here is the seal of the military revolutionary committee. They stared stupidly at my pass, and then at each other. It is different from the others, said one sullenly. We cannot read, brother. I took him by the arm. Come, I said, let's go to that house. Someone there can surely read. They hesitated. No, said one. The other looked me over. Well, why not, he muttered. After all, it is a serious crime to kill an innocent man. We walked up to the front door of the house and knocked. A short, stout woman opened it and shrank back in alarm, babbling. I don't know anything about them. I don't know anything about them. One of my guards held out the pass. She screamed, Just to read it, comrade. Hesitatingly, she took the paper and read aloud swiftly. The bearer of this pass, John Reed, is a representative of the American social democracy, an internationalist. Out on the road again, the two soldiers held another consultation. We must take you to the regimental committee, they said. In the fast deepening twilight, we trudged along the muddy road. Occasionally we met squads of soldiers who stopped and surrounded me with looks of menace, handling my pass around and arguing violently as to whether or not I should be killed. It was dark when we came to the barracks of the second Sykoi Cello Rifles, low sprawling buildings huddled along the post road. A number of soldiers slouching at the entrance asked eager questions. A spy? A provocateur? We mounted a winding stair and emerged into a great bare room with a huge stove in the centre and rows of cots on the floor, where about a thousand soldiers were playing cards, talking, singing and asleep. In the roof was a jagged hole made by Kerensky's cannon. I stood in the doorway, and a sudden silence ran among the groups, who turned and stared at me. Of a sudden they began to move slowly and then with a rush thundering with faces full of hate comrades comrades yelled one of my guards committee committee the throng halted banked around me muttering out of them shouldered a lean youth wearing a red armband who is this he asked roughly the guards explained give me the paper he read it carefully glancing at me with keen eyes and then he smiled and handed me the pass. Comrades, this is an American comrade. I am chairman of the committee and I welcome you to the regiment. A sudden general buzz grew into a roar of greeting and they pressed forward to shake my hand. You have not dined? Here we have had our dinner. You shall go to the officers club where there are some who speak your language. He led me across the courtyard to the door of another building. An aristocratic looking youth the shoulder straps of a lieutenant was entering the chairman presented me and shaking hands went back i am stepan grigorovich morovsky at your service said the lieutenant in perfect french from the ornate entrance hall a ceremonial staircase led upward lighted by glittering lustre on the second floor billiard rooms card rooms a library opened from the hall we entered the dining room at a long table in the centre of which sat about twenty officers in full uniform, wearing their gold and silver handled swords, the ribbons and crosses of imperial decorations. All rose politely as I entered and made a place for me beside the colonel, a large, impressive man with a grizzled beard. Orderlies were deftly serving dinner. The atmosphere was that of any officer's mess in Europe. Where was the revolution? You are not Bolsheviki? I asked Morovsky. A smile went round the table, but I caught one or two glancing furtively at the orderly. No, answered my friend. There is only one Bolshevik officer in this regiment. He is in Petrograd tonight. The colonel is a Menshevik. Captain Kurlov, 
there is a cadet. I myself am a socialist revolutionary of the right wing. I should say that most of the officers in the army are not Bolsheviki. But like me, they believe in democracy. They believe that they must follow the soldier masses. Dinner over, maps were brought, and the colonel spread them out on the table. The rest crowded round to see. Here, said the colonel, pointing to pencil marks, were our positions this morning. Vladimir Kirillovich, where is your company? Captain Kurlov pointed. According to orders, we occupied the position along this road. Karsevin, relieve me at five o'clock. Just then the door of the room opened, and there entered the chairman of the regimental committee with another shoulder. They joined the group behind the colonel, peering at the map. Good, said the colonel. Now the Cossacks have fallen back ten kilometres in our sector. I do not think it is necessary to take up advanced positions. Gentlemen, for tonight you will hold the present line, strengthening the positions by... If you please interrupted the chairman of the regimental committee. The orders are to advance with all speed and prepare to engage the Cossacks north of Gachina in the morning. A crushing defeat is necessary. Kindly make the proper dispositions. There was a short silence. The colonel again turned to the map. Very well, he said in a different voice. Stepan Grigorovich, will you please... Rapidly tracing lines with a blue pencil, he gave his orders, while a sergeant made shorthand notes. The sergeant then withdrew, and ten minutes later returned with the orders typewritten and one carbon copy. The chairman of the committee studied the map with a copy of the orders before him. All right, he said, rising. Folding the carbon copy, he put it in his pocket. Then he signed the other, stamped it with a round seal taken from his pocket, and presented it to the colonel. Here was the revolution. I returned to the Soviet powers in Tsoyski in the regimental staff automobile. Still the crowds of workers, soldiers and sailors pouring in and out. Still the choking press of trucks, armoured cars, cannon before the door, and the shouting, the laughter of unwanted victory. Half a dozen red guards forced their way through, a priest in the middle. This was Father Ivan, they said, who had blessed the Cossacks when they entered the town. I heard afterward that he was shot. See Appendix 9, Section 4. Dibenko was just coming out, giving rapid orders right and left. In his hand he carried the big revolver. An automobile stood with racing engine at the curb. Alone, he climbed into the rear seat and was off, off to Gachina to conquer Kerensky. Toward nightfall, he arrived at the outskirts of the town and went on afoot. What Dibenko told the Cossacks nobody knows, but the fact is that General Krasnov and his staff and several thousand Cossacks surrendered and advised Kerensky to do the same. See Appendix 9, Section 5. As for Kerensky, I reprint here the disposition made by General Krasnov on the morning of November the 14th. Gachina, November 14th, 1917. Today, about three o'clock a.m., I was summoned by the Supreme Commander, Kerensky. He was very agitated and very nervous. General, he said to me, you have betrayed me. Your Cossacks declare categorically that they will arrest me and deliver me to the sailors. Yes, I answered. There is talk of it, and I know that you have no sympathy anywhere. But the officers say the same thing. Yes, most of all, it is the officers... Who are discontented with you? What shall I do? I ought to commit suicide. If you are an honourable man, you will go immediately to Petrograd with a white flag. You will present yourself to the Military Revolutionary Committee and enter into negotiations as chief of the provisional government. All right, I will do that, General. I will give you a guard and ask that a sailor go with you. No, no, not a sailor. Do you know whether it is true that Dibenko is here? I don't know who Dibenko is. He is my enemy. There is nothing to do. If you play for high stakes, you must know how to take a chance. Yes, I'll leave tonight. Why? That would be a flight. Leave calmly and openly so that everyone can see you are not running away. Very well, but you must give me a guard on which I can count. Good. I went out and called the Cossack Ruskov of the 10th Regiment of the Don and ordered him to pick out 10 Cossacks to accompany the Supreme Commander. Half an hour later, the Cossacks came to tell me that Kerensky was not in his quarters, that he had run away. 
I gave the alarm in order that he be searched for, supposing that he could not have left Gachina, but he could not be found. And so Kerensky fled, alone, disguised in the uniform of a sailor, and by that act lost whatever popularity he had retained among the Russian masses. I went back to Petrograd riding on the front seat of an auto truck, driven by a workman and filled with red guards. We had no kerosene, so our lights were not burning. The road was crowded with the proletarian army going home, and new reserves pouring out to take their places. Immense trucks like ours, columns of military wagons, loomed up in the night without lights as we were. We hurtled furiously on, wretched right and left to avoid collisions that seemed inevitable, scraping wheels, followed by the epithets of pedestrians. Across the horizon spread the glittering lights of the capital, immeasurably more splendid by night than by day, like a dike of jewels heaped on the barren plain. The old workman who drove held the wheel in one hand, while the other he swept the far gleaming capital in an exultant gesture. Mine, he cried, his face all alight. All mine now, my Petrograd. End of chapter 9 Recording by Richard Beck Chapter 10 of Ten Days That Shook the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Beck. Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed. Chapter 10. Moscow. The Military Revolutionary Committee, with a fierce intensity, followed up its victory. November the 14th. To all army, corps, divisional and regimental committees. To all Soviets of workers, soldiers and peasants deputies. To all, all, all. Conforming to the agreement between the Cossacks, Yunkers, soldiers, sailors and workers, it has been decided to arraign Alexander Fyodorovich Kerensky before a tribunal of the people. We demand that Kerensky be arrested and that he be ordered, in the name of the organizations hereinafter mentioned, to come immediately to Petrograd and present himself to the tribunal. Signed, the Cossacks of the 1st Division of Usuri Cavalry, the Committee of Yunkers of the Petrograd Detachment of franc the Delegate of the 5th Army, People's Commissar Dibenko, the Committee for Salvation, the Duma, the Central Committee of the Socialist Revolutionary Party, proudly claiming Kerensky as a member, all passionately protested that he could only be held responsible to the Constituent Assembly. On the evening of November 16th, I watched 2,000 Red Guards swing down the Zagnorodny Prospect behind a military band playing the Marseillaise, and how appropriate it sounded, with blood-red flags over dark ranks of workmen to welcome home again their brothers who had defended Red Petrograd. In the bitter dusk they tramped, men and women, their tall bayonets swaying, through streets faintly lighted and slippery with mud, between silent crowds of bourgeois, contemptuous but fearful. All against them, businessmen, speculators, investors, landowners, army officers, politicians, teachers, students, professional men, shopkeepers, clerks, agents, the other socialist parties hated the Bolsheviki with an implacable hatred. On the side of the Soviets were the rank and file of the workers, the sailors, all the undemoralized soldiers, the landless peasants, and a few, a very few, intellectuals. From the furthest corners of Great Russia, where upon desperate street fighting burst like a wave, news of Kerensky's defeat came echoing back the immense roar of proletarian victory. Kazan. Saratov, Novgorod, Vinitsa, where the streets had run with blood, Moscow, where the Bolsheviki had turned their artillery against the last stronghold of the bourgeoisie, the Kremlin. They are bombarding the Kremlin! The news passed from mouth to mouth in the streets of Petrograd, almost with a sense of terror. Travellers from white and shining little mother Moscow told fearful tales, thousands killed, 
the Tverskaya and the Konetsky Most in flames, the church of Vasily Blazny a smoking ruin, the Spensky Cathedral crumbling down, the Spaskaya Gate of the Kremlin teetering, the Duma burned to the ground. See Appendix 10, Section 1. Nothing that the Bolsheviki had done could compare with this fearful blasphemy in the heart of Holy Russia. To the ears of the devout sounded the shock of guns crashing in the face of the Holy Orthodox Church and pounding to dust the sanctuary of the Russian nation. On November 15th, Lunacharsky, Commissar of Education, broke into tears at the session of the Council of People's Commissars and rushed from the room crying, I cannot stand it, I cannot bear the monstrous destruction of beauty and tradition. That afternoon his letter of resignation was published in the newspapers. I have just been informed, by people arriving from Moscow, what has happened there. The Cathedral of St. Basil the Blessed, the Cathedral of the Assumption, are being bombarded. The Kremlin, where I now gathered the most important art treasures of Petrograd and of Moscow is under artillery fire. There are thousands of victims. The fearful struggle there has reached a pitch of bestial ferocity. What is left? What more can happen? I cannot bear this. My cup is full. I am unable to endure these horrors. It is impossible to work under the pressure of thoughts which drive me mad. That is why I am leaving the Council of People's Commissars. I fully realise the gravity of this decision, but I can bear no more. See Appendix 10, Section 2. That same day, the White Guards and the Yunkers in the Kremlin surrendered and were allowed to march out unharmed. The Treaty of Peace follows. 1. The Committee of Public Safety ceases to exist. 2. The White Guard gives up its arms and dissolves. The officers retain their swords and regulation sidearms. In the military schools are retained only the arms necessary for instruction. All others are surrendered by the Yunkers. The Military Revolutionary Committee guarantees the liberty and inviolability of the person. 3. To settle the question of disarmament, as set forth in Section 2, a special commission is appointed, consisting of representatives from all organisations which took part in the peace negotiations. 4. From the moment of the signature of this peace treaty, both parties shall immediately give order to cease firing and halt all military operations, taking measures to ensure punctual obedience to this order. 5. At the signature of the treaty, all prisoners made by the two parties shall be released. For two days now the Bolsheviki had been in control of the city. The frightened citizens were creeping out of their cellars to seek their dead. The barricades in the streets were being removed. Instead of diminishing, however, the stories of destruction in Moscow continued to grow, and it was under the influence of these fearful reports that we decided to go there. Petrograd, after all, in spite of being for a century the seat of government, is still an artificial city. Moscow is real Russia, Russia as it was and will be. In Moscow we would get the true feeling of the Russian people about the revolution. Life was more intense there. For the past week the Petrograd Military Revolutionary Committee, aided by the rank and file of the railway workers, had seized control of the Nikolai Railroad, and hurled trainload after trainload of sailors and red guards southwest. We were provided with passes from Smolny, without which no one could leave the capital. When the train backed into the station, a mob of shabby soldiers, all carrying huge sacks of eatables, stormed the doors, smashed the windows and poured into all the compartments, filling up the aisles and even climbing onto the roof. Three of us managed to wedge our way into a compartment, but almost immediately about twenty soldiers entered. There was room for only four people. We argued, expostulated, and the conductor joined us, but the soldiers merely laughed. Were they to bother about the comfort of a lot of bourgeois bourgeois? We produced the passes from Smolny. Instantly the soldiers changed their attitude. 
Come, comrades, cried one. These are American tovarisht. They have come thirty thousand verse to see our revolution, and they are naturally tired. With polite and friendly apologies, the soldiers began to leave. Shortly afterwards, we heard them breaking into a compartment occupied by two stout, well-dressed Russians, who had bribed the conductor and locked their door. About seven o'clock in the evening, we drew out of the station, an immense long train drawn by a weak little locomotive burning wood, and stumbled along slowly with many stops. The soldiers on the roof kicked with their heels and sang whining peasant songs, and in the corridor, so jammed that it was impossible to pass, violent political debates raged all night long. Occasionally the conductor came through, as a matter of habit, looking for tickets. He found very few except ours, and after a half hour of futile wrangling, lifted his arms despairingly and withdrew. The atmosphere was stifling, full of smoke and foul odours. If it hadn't been for the broken windows, we would doubtless have smothered during the night. In the morning, hours late, we looked out upon a snowy world. It was bitter cold. About noon, a, pre a peasant woman got on with a basket full of bread chunks and a great can of lukewarm coffee substitute. From then on until dark, there was nothing but the packed train, jolting and stopping, and occasional stations where a ravenous mob swooped down on the scantily furnished buffet and swept it clean. At one of these halts, I ran into Noggin and Rykov, the seceding commissars who were returning to Moscow to put their grievances before their own Soviet. And further along was Bukharin, a short, red-bearded man with the eyes of a fanatic. More left than Lenin, they said of him. Then the three strokes of the bell, and we made a rush for the train, worming our way through the packed and noisy aisle, a good-natured crowd bearing the discomfort with humorous patience, interminably arguing about everything from the situation in Petrograd to the British trade union system, and disputing loudly with the few bourgeois who were on board. Before we reached Moscow, almost every car had organized a committee to secure and distribute food, and these committees became divided into political factions who wrangled over fundamental principles. The station at Moscow was deserted. We went to the office of the commissar in order to arrange for our return tickets. He was a sullen youth with shoulder straps of a lieutenant, when we showed him our papers from Smolny, he lost his temper and declared that he was no Bolshevik, that he represented the Committee of Public Safety. It was characteristic, in the general turmoil attending the conquest of the city, the chief railway station had been forgotten by the victors. Not a cab in sight. A few blocks down the street, however, we woke up a grotesquely padded Ivotchik asleep upright on the box of his little sleigh. How much to the centre of town? He scratched his head. The Barini won't be able to find a room in any hotel, he said. But I'll take you around for a hundred roubles. Before the revolution it cost two. We objected, but he simply shrugged his shoulders. It takes a good deal of courage to drive a sleigh nowadays, he went on. We could not beat him down below fifty. As he sped along the silent, snowy, half-lighted streets, he recounted his adventures during the six days' fighting. Driving along or waiting for a fare on the corner, he said. All of a sudden, poof! Cannonball exploding here. Poof! A cannonball there. Rat, rat! Rat, rat! A machine gun. I gallop, the devil shooting all around. I get to a nice, quiet street and stop. Doze a little. Poof! Another cannonball. Rat, rat! Devils, 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 brrr. In the centre of the town, the snow-piled streets were quiet with the stillness of convalescence. Only a few arc lights were burning. Only a few pedestrians hurried along the sidewalks. An icy wind blew from the great plain, cutting to the bone. At the first hotel, we entered an office illuminated by two candles. Yes, we have some very comfortable rooms but all the windows are shot out, if the Gospodin does not mind a little fresh air. Down the Tverskaya the shop windows were broken, and there were shell holes and torn up paving stones in the street. Hotel after hotel, 
all four or the proprietors still so frightened that all they could say was no no there is no room there is no room on the main streets where the great banking houses and mercantile houses lay the bolshevik artillery had been indiscriminately effective as one soviet official told me whenever we didn't know just where the yunkers and the white guards were we bombarded their pocketbooks at the big hotel national they finally took us in for we were foreigners and the military revolutionary committee had promised to protect the dwellings of foreigners on the top floor the manager showed us where the shrapnel had shattered several windows <laughs> the animals said he shaking his fist at imaginary bolsheviki but wait their time will come in just a few days now their ridiculous government will fall and then we will make them suffer we dined at a vegetarian restaurant with the enticing name i eat nobody and tolstoy's picture prominent on the walls and then sailed out into the streets the headquarters of the moscow soviet was in the palace of the former governor-general an imposing white building fronting Skobliev Square. Red guards to sentry at the door. At the head of the wide, formal stairway, whose walls were plastered with announcements of committee meetings and the addresses of political parties, we passed through a series of lofty anterooms, hung with red-shrouded pictures in gold frames, to the splendid state salon, with its magnificent crystal lustre and gilded cornishes. A low-voiced hum of talk, underlaid with the whirring bass of a score of sewing machines, filled the place. Huge bolts of red and black cotton cloth were unrolled, serpentining across the parquet floor and over tables, at which sat half a hundred women, cutting and sewing streamers and banners for the funeral of the revolutionary dead. The faces of these women were roughened and scarred with life at its most difficult. They worked now sternly, many of them with eyes red from weeping. The losses of the Red Army had been heavy. At a desk in one corner was Rogov, an intelligent, bearded man with glasses, wearing the black blouse of a worker. He invited us to march with the Central Executive Committee in the funeral procession the next morning. It is impossible to teach the socialist revolutionaries and the Mensheviki anything, he exclaimed. They compromise from sheer habit. Imagine! They propose that we hold a joint funeral with the Yunkers. Graphic. Questionnaire for the bourgeoisie distributed to all bourgeois households in Moscow by the Moscow Military Revolutionary Committee so as to provide a basis for the requisition of clothing for the army and the poor workers. For translation, see Appendix 10, Section 3. Across the hall came a man in a ragged soldier coat and a shapka, whose face was familiar. I recognised Melinchansky, whom I had known as the watchmaker George Melcher in Bayonne, New Jersey, during the great Standard Oil strike. Now, he told me, he was secretary of the Moscow Metal Workers Union and a commissar of the Military Revolutionary Committee during the fighting. You see me, he cried, showing his decrepit clothing. I was with the boys in the Kremlin when the Yunkers came the first time. They shut me up in the cellar and swiped my overcoat, my money, watch, and even the ring on my finger. This is all I've got to wear. From him I learned many details of the bloody six-day battle which had rent Moscow in two. Unlike in Petrograd, in Moscow the city Duma had taken command of the Yunkers and White Guards. Rudnov, the mayor, a minor president of the Duma, had directed the activities of the Committee of Public Safety and the troops. Ryabsev, commandant of the city, a man of democratic instinct, had hesitated about opposing the Military Revolutionary Committee, but the Duma had forced him. It was the mayor who had urged the occupation of the Kremlin. They will never dare fire on you there, he said. One garrison regiment, badly demoralised by long inactivity, had been approached by both sides. The regiment held a meeting to decide what action to take. Resolved that the regiment remain neutral and continue its present activities, which consisted in peddling rubbers and sunflower seeds. 
But worst of all, said Melanchansky, we had to organize while we were fighting. The other side knew just what it wanted, but here the soldiers had their Soviet and the workers theirs. There was a fearful wrangle over who should be commander-in-chief. Some regiments talked for days before they decided what to do, and when the officers suddenly deserted us, we had no battle staff to give orders. Vivid little pictures he gave me. On a cold grey day he had stood at a corner of the Nitsikaya, which was swept by blasts of machine-gun fire. A throng of little boys were gathered there, street waves who used to be newsboys. Shrill excited as if with a new game they waited until the firing slackened and then tried to run across the street many were killed but the rest dashed backward and forward laughing daring each other late in the evening i went to the divuranskoy sobrani the nobles club where the moscow bolsheviki were to meet and consider the report of nogin rykov and the others who had left the council of people's commissars the meeting place was a theatre, in which, under the old regime, to audiences of officers and glittering ladies, amateur presentations of the latest French comedy had once taken place. At first the place filled with the intellectuals, those who lived near the centre of town. Noggin spoke, and most of his listeners were plainly with him. It was very late before the workers arrived. The working-class quarters were on the outskirts of town, and no streetcars were running. But about midnight they began to clump up the stairs, in groups of ten or twenty, big, rough men in coarse clothes, fresh from the battle line where they had fought like devils for a week, seeing their comrades fall all about them. Scarcely had the meeting formally opened before Noggin was assailed with a tempest of jeers and angry shouts. In vain he tried to argue, to explain. They would not listen. He had left the council of people's commissars. He had deserted his post while the battle was raging. As for the bourgeois press, here in Moscow there was no more bourgeois press. Even the city Duma had been dissolved. See Appendix 10, Section 4. Dukarin stood up. Savage, logical, with a voice which plunged and struck, plunged and struck. Him they listened to with shining eyes. Resolution to support the action of the Council of People's Commissars passed by overwhelming majority. So spoke Moscow. Graphic. Passed to the Kremlin. Translation. By this the Military Revolutionary Committee requests to give a pass for the purpose of investigating the Kremlin. The representatives of the American Socialist Party attached to the Socialist Press, comrades Reed and Bryant, chief of the Military Revolutionary Committee for the Secretary. Late in the night we went through the empty streets and under the Iberian Gate to the great red square in front of the Kremlin. The church of Vasily Blazny loomed fantastic. Its bright coloured, convoluted and blazoned cupolas vague in the darkness. There was no sign of any damage. Along one side of the square the dark towers and walls of the Kremlin stood up. On the high walls flickered redly the light of hidden flames. Voices reached us across the immense place and the sound of picks and shovels. We crossed over. Mountains of dirt and rock were piled high near the base of the wall. Climbing these, we looked down into two massive pits, ten or fifteen feet deep and fifty yards long, where hundreds of soldiers and workers were digging in the light of huge fires. A young student spoke to us in German. The Brotherhood grave, he explained. Tomorrow we shall bury here five hundred proletarians who died for the revolution. He took us down into the pit. In frenetic haste swung the picks and shovels and the earth mountains grew. No one spoke. Overhead the night was thick with stars and the ancient imperial Kremlin wall towered up immeasurably. Here in this holy place, said the student, holiest of all Russia, we shall bury our most holy. Here where the tombs of the Tsars, our Tsar, the people, shall sleep. His arm was in a sling from a bullet wound gained in the fighting. He looked at it. You foreigners look down on us Russians because so long we tolerated a medieval monarchy, said he. 
But we saw that the Tsar was not the only tyrant in the world. Capitalism was worse, and in all the countries of the world, capitalism was emperor. Russian revolutionary tactics are best. As we left, the workers in the pit, exhausted and running with sweat in spite of the cold, began to climb wearily out. Across the red square a dark knot of men came hurrying. They swarmed into the pits, picked up the tools and began digging, digging without a word. So, all along the night, volunteers of the people relieved each other, never halting in their driving speed, and the cold light of dawn lay bare the great square, white with snow and the yawning brown pits of the Brotherhood grave, quite finished. We rose before sunrise, and hurried through the dark streets to Skobliev Square. In all the great city not a human being could be seen, but there was a faint sound of stirring, far and near, like a deep wind coming. In the pale half-light a little group of men and women were gathered before the Soviet headquarters, with a sheaf of gold-lettered red banners, the Central Executive Committee of the Moscow Soviets. It grew light. From afar, the vague stirring sound deepened and became louder, a steady and tremendous bass. The city was rising. We set out down the Tverskaya, the banners flapping overhead. The little street chapels along our way were locked and dark, as was the chapel of the Iberian Virgin, which each new Tsar used to visit before he went to the Kremlin to crown himself, and which, day or night, was always open and crowded, and brilliant with candles of the devout gleaming on the gold and silver jewels of the icons. Now, for the first time since Napoleon was in Moscow, they say, the candles were out. The Holy Orthodox Church had withdrawn the light of its countenance from Moscow, the nest of irreverent vipers who had bombarded the Kremlin. Dark and silent and cold were the churches. The priests had disappeared. There were no popes to officiate at the red burial. There had been no sacrament for the dead, nor were there any prayers to be said over the grave of the blasphemers. Tycon, Metropolitan of Moscow, was soon to excommunicate the Soviets. Also, the shops were closed, and the propertied classes stayed at home, but for other reasons. This was the day of the people. This was the day of the people. The rumour of those coming was thunderous as surf. Already through the Iberian Gate a human river was flowing, and the vast red square was spotted with people, thousands of them. I remark that as the throng passed the Iberian Chapel, where always before the passerby had crossed himself, they did not seem to notice it. We forced our way through the dense mass packed near the Kremlin Wall, and stood upon one of the dirt mountains. Already several men were there, among them Muranov, the soldier who had been elected Commandant of Moscow, a tall, simple-looking bearded man with a gentle face. Through all the streets to the Red Square the torrents of people poured, thousands upon thousands of them, all with the look of the poor and the toiling. A military band came marching up playing the Internationale, and spontaneously the song caught and spread like wind ripples on the sea, slow and solemn. From the top of the Kremlin wall, gigantic banners unrolled to the ground, red with great letters in gold and in white, saying, Martyrs of the beginning of world social revolution, and long live the brotherhood of workers of the world. A bitter wind swept the square, lifting the banners. Now from the far quarters of the city, the workers of the different factories were arriving, with their dead. They could be seen coming through the gate, the blare of their banners and the dull red-like blood of the coffins they carried. These were rude boxes, made of unplaned wood and daubed with crimson, borne high on the shoulders of rough men who marched with tears streaming down their faces, and followed by women who sobbed and screamed, or walked stiffly with white dead faces. Some of the coffins were open, the lid carried behind them, others were covered with gilded or silvered cloth, or had a soldier's hat nailed on the top. There were many wreaths of hideous artificial flowers. Through an irregular lane that opened and closed again, the procession slowly moved towards us. 
and through the gate was flowing an endless stream of banners, all shades of red, with silver and gold lettering, knots of crepe hanging from the top, and some anarchist flags, black with white letters. The band was playing the revolutionary funeral march, and against the immense singing of the mass of people, standing uncovered, the paraders sang hoarsely, choked with sobs. Between the factory workers came companies of soldiers with their coffins too, and squadrons of cavalry riding at salute and artillery batteries. The cannon wound with red and black forever, it seemed. Their banners said, Long live the Third International, or We want an honest, general, democratic peace. Slowly the marchers came with their coffins to the entrance of the grave, and the bearers clambered up with their burdens and went down into the pit. Many of them were women, squat, strong, proletarian women. Behind the dead came other women, women young and broken, or old, wrinkled women making noises like hurt animals, who tried to follow their sons and husbands into the brotherhood grave, and shrieked when compassionate hands restrained them. The poor love each other so. All the long day the funeral procession passed, coming in by the Iberian Gate and leaving the square by way of the Nicolasaya, a river of red banners, bearing words of hope and brotherhood and stupendous prophecies against a background of 50,000 people, under the eyes of the world's workers and their descendants forever. One by one the 500 coffins were laid in the pits. Dusk fell and still the banners came drooping and fluttering, the band played the funeral march and the huge assemblage chanted in the leafless branches of the trees above the grave the wreaths were hung like strange multicolored blossoms two hundred men began to shovel in the dirt it rained dully down upon the coffins with a thuddering sound audible beneath the singing the lights came out the last banners passed and the last moaning women looking back with awful intensity as they went Slowly from the great square ebbed the proletarian tide. I suddenly realized that the devout Russian people no longer needed priests to pray them into heaven. On earth they were building a kingdom more bright than any heaven had to offer, and for which it was a glory to die. End of chapter 10 Recording by Richard Beck Chapter 11, Part 1 of Ten Days That Shook the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Beck. Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed. Chapter 11. The Conquest of Power. See Appendix 11, Section 1. Declaration of the Rights of the People of Russia. See Appendix 11, Section 2. The First Congress of Soviets, in June of this year, proclaimed the right of the peoples of Russia to self-determination. The Second Congress of Soviets, in November last, confirmed this inalienable right of the peoples of Russia more decisively and definitely. Executing the will of these Congresses, the Council of People's Commissars has resolved to establish as a basis for its activity in the question of nationalities the following principles. 1. The equality and sovereignty of the peoples of Russia. 2. The right of the peoples of Russia to free self-determination, even to the point of separation and the formation of an independent state. 3 the abolition of any and all national and national religious privileges and disabilities. 4. The free development of national minorities and ethnographic groups inhabiting the territory of Russia. Decrees will be prepared immediately upon the formation of a commission on nationalities. In the name of the Russian Republic, People's Commissar for Nationalities, Yusyov de Vili Stalin. President of the Council of People's Commissars, V. Yulenov Lenin. 
The Central Rada at Kiev immediately declared Ukraine as an independent republic, as did the government of Finland through the Senate at Helsingfors. Independent governments sprang up in Siberia and the Caucasus. The Polish chief military committee swiftly gathered together the Polish troops in the Russian army, abolished their committees and established an iron discipline. All these governments and movements had two characteristics in common. They were controlled by the propertied classes, and they feared and detested Bolshevism. Steadily, and with the chaos of shocking change, the Council of People's Commissars hammered at the scaffolding of the socialist order. Decree on social insurance, on workers' control, regulations for the lost land committees, abolition of ranks and titles, abolition of courts and the creation of people's tribunals. See Appendix 11, Section 3. Army after army, fleet after fleet, sent deputations, joyfully to greet the new government of the people. In front of Solny, one day, I saw a ragged regiment just come up from the trenches. The soldiers were drawn up before the great gates, thin and grey-faced, looking up at the building as if God were in it. Some pointed out the imperial eagles over the door, laughing. Red guards came to mount guard. All the soldiers turned to look curiously, as if they had heard of them, but never seen them. They laughed good-naturedly, and pressed out of line to slap the red guards on the back, with half-joking, half-admiring remarks. The provisional government was no more. On November 15th, in all the churches of the capital, the priest stopped praying for it. But as Lenin himself told the Teiska, that was only the beginning of the conquest of power. Deprived of arms, the opposition, which still controlled the economic life of the country, settled down to organize disorganization, with all the Russian genius for cooperative action to obstruct, cripple and discredit the Soviets. The strike of government employees was well organized, financed by the banks and commercial establishments. Every move of the Bolsheviki to take over the government apparatus was resisted. Trotsky went to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The functionaries refused to recognize him, locked themselves in, and when the doors were forced, resigned. He demanded the keys of the archives. Only when he brought workmen to force the locks were they given up. Then it was discovered that Neratov, former assistant foreign minister, had disappeared with the secret treaties. Shalapinkov tried to take possession of the Ministry of Labour. It was bitterly cold, and there was no one to light the fires. Of all the hundreds of employees, not one would show him where the office of the minister was. Alexandra Kolontai appointed the 13th of November Commissar of the Public Welfare, the Department of Charities and Public Institutions, was welcomed with a strike of all but 40 of the functionaries in the ministry. Immediately the poor of the great cities, the inmates of institutions, were plunged in miserable want. Delegations of starving cripples, of orphans with blue pinched faces, besieged the building. With tears streaming down her face, Kolontai arrested the strikers until they should deliver the keys of the office in the safe. When she got the keys, however, it was discovered that the former minister, Countess Panina, had gone off with the funds, which she refused to surrender except on the order of the Constituent Assembly. See Appendix 11, Section 4. In the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Supplies, the Ministry of Finance, similar incidents occurred, and the employees, summoned to return or forfeit their positions and their pensions, either stayed away or returned to sabotage. Almost all the intelligentsia being anti-Bolshevik, there was nowhere for the Soviet government to recruit new staffs. The private banks remained stubbornly closed, with the back door open for speculators. When Bolshevik commissars entered, the clerks left, secreting the books and removing the funds. All the employees of the state banks struck except the clerks in charge of the vaults and the manufacture of money, who refused all demands from Smolny and privately paid out huge sums to the Committee for Salvation and the City Duma. Twice a commissar, 
with a company of Red Guards, came formally to insist upon the delivery of large sums for government expenses. The first time, the City Duma members and the Menshevik and Socialist revolutionary leaders were present in imposing numbers, and spoke so gravely of the consequences that the Commissar was frightened. The second time he arrived with a warrant, which he proceeded to read aloud and in due form. But someone called his attention to the fact that it had no date and no seal, and the traditional Russian respect for documents forced him again to withdraw. The officials of the credit chancery destroyed their books, so that all record of the financial relations of Russia with foreign countries was lost. The supply committees, the administrations of the municipal owned public utilities, either did not work at all, or sabotaged. And when the Bolsheviki, compelled by the desperate needs of the city population, attempted to help or control the public service, all the employees went on strike immediately, and the Duma flooded Russia with telegrams about Bolshevik violation of municipal autonomy. At military headquarters, in the offices of the Ministries of War and Marine, where the old officials had consented to work, the army committees and the high command blocked the Soviets in every way possible, even to the extent of neglecting the troops at the front. The Vixel was hostile, refusing to transport Soviet troops. Every troop train that left Petrograd was taken out by force, and railway officials had to be arrested each time, whereupon the Vixel threatened an immediate general strike unless they were released. Smolny was plainly powerless. The newspapers said that all the factories of Petrograd must shut down for lack of fuel in three weeks. The Vixel announced that the trains must cease running by December 1st. There was food for three days only in Petrograd, and no more coming in, and the army on the front was starving. The Committee for Salvation, the various central committees, sent word all over the country exhorting the population to ignore the government decrees, and the Allied embassies were either coldly indifferent or openly hostile. The opposition newspapers, suppressed one day and reappearing next morning under new names, heaped bitter sarcasm on the new regime. See Appendix 11, Section 5. Even Novaya Zizin characterized it as a combination of demagoguery and impotence. From day to day, it said, the government of the People's Commissars sinks deeper and deeper into the mire of superficial haste. Having easily conquered the power, the Bolsheviki cannot make use of it. Powerless to direct the existing mechanism of government, they are unable at the same time to create a new one which might work easily and freely according to the theories of social experimenters. Just a while ago the Bolsheviki hadn't enough men to run their growing party, a work above all speakers and writers. Where then are they going to find trained men to execute the diverse and complicated functions of government? The new government acts and threatens. It sprays the country with decrees, each one more radical and more socialist than the last. But in this exhibition of socialism on paper, more likely designed for the stupefaction of our descendants, there appears neither the desire nor the capacity to solve the immediate problems of the day. Meanwhile, the Zikhaus conference to form a new government continued to meet night and day. Both sides had already agreed in principle to the basis of the government. The composition of the People's Council was being discussed. The cabinet was tentatively chosen, with Tchernov as premier. The Bolsheviki were admitted in large minority, but Lenin and Trotsky were barred. The central committees of the Menshevik and Socialist Revolutionary Parties, the Executive Committee of the Peasant Soviets, resolved that, although unalterably opposed to the criminal politics of the Bolsheviki, they would, in order to halt the fratricidal bloodshed, not oppose their entrance into the People's Council. The flight of Kerensky, however, and the astounding success of the Soviets everywhere, altered the situation. On the 16th, in a meeting of the Ta-i-Ka, 
the left socialist revolutionaries insisted that the Bolsheviki should form a coalition government with the other socialist parties. Otherwise, they would withdraw from the Military Revolutionary Committee and the Tsaykar. Malkin said, The news from Moscow, where our comrades are dying on both sides of the barricades, determines us to bring up once more the question of organization of power, and it is not only our right to do so, but our duty. We have won the right to sit with the Bolsheviki here within the walls of Smolny Institute, and to speak from this tribune. After the bitter internal party struggle, we shall be obliged, if you refuse to compromise, to pass to open battle outside. We must propose to the democracy terms of an acceptable compromise. After a recess to consider this ultimatum, the Bolsheviki returned with a revolution, read by Kamenev. The Tsika considers it necessary that there enter into the government representatives of all the socialist parties composing the Soviets of workers, soldiers and peasants' deputies who recognize the conquests of the revolution of November 7th. That is to say, the establishment of a government of Soviets, the decrees on peace, land, workers' control over industry, and the arming of the working class. The Tsika therefore resolved to propose negotiations concerning the constitution of the government to all parties of the Soviet, and insists upon the following conditions as a basis. The government is responsible to Tsika. The Tsika shall be enlarged to 150 members. To these 150 delegates of the Soviets of Workers and Soldiers Deputies shall be added 75 delegates of the Provincial Soviets of Peasants Deputies, 80 from the front organizations of the Army and Navy, 40 from the Trades Unions, 25 from the various All-Russian Unions in proportion to their importance, 10 from the Vigzel and 5 from the Post and Telegraph Workers and 50 delegates from the socialist groups in the Petrograd City Duma. In the ministry itself, at least one half the portfolios must be reserved to the Bolsheviki. The ministries of labor, interior and foreign affairs must be given to the Bolsheviki. The command of the garrisons of the Petrograd and Moscow must remain in the hands of the delegates of the Moscow and Petrograd Soviets. The government undertakes the systematic arming of the workers of all Russia. It is resolved to insist upon the candidature of comrades Lenin and Trotsky. Kamenev explained, The so-called People's Council, he said, proposed by the conference, would consist of about 420 members, of which about 150 would be Bolsheviki. Besides, there would be delegates from the counter-revolutionary old Seika, 100 members chosen by the municipal Dumas Kornilovtsi, or 100 delegates from the peasants Soviets appointed by Aksentiev, and 80 from the old army committees who no longer represent the soldier masses. We refuse to admit the old Seika and also the representatives of the municipal Dumas. The delegates from the Peasants Soviets will be elected by the Congress of Peasants, which we have called, and which we will at the same time elect a new executive committee. The proposal to exclude Lenin and Trotsky is a proposal to decapitate our party, and we do not accept it. And finally, we see no necessity for a People's Council anyway. The Soviets are open to all socialist parties, and the Tsika represents them in their real proportions among the masses. Kerolin, for the left socialist revolutionaries, declared that his party would vote for the Bolshevik resolution, reserving the right to modify certain details, such as the representation of the peasants, and demanding that the Ministry of Agriculture be reserved for the left socialist revolutionaries. This was agreed to. Later, at a meeting of the Petrograd Soviet, Trotsky answered a question about the formation of the new government. I don't know anything about that. I am not taking part in the negotiations. However, I don't think that they are of great importance. 
That night there was great uneasiness in the conference. Delegates of the City Duma withdrew. But at Smolny itself, in the ranks of the Bolshevik party, a formidable opposition to Lenin's policy was growing. On the night of November 17th, the Great Hall was packed and ominous for the meeting of the Zika. Larin, Bolshevik, declared that the moment of the elections to the Constituent Assembly approached, and it was time to do away with political terrorism. The measures taken against the freedom of the press should be modified. They had their reason during the struggle, but now they have no further excuse. The press should be free, except for appeals to riot and insurrection. In a storm of hisses and hoots from his own party, Larin offered the following resolution. The decree of the Council of People's Commissars concerning the press is herewith repealed. Measures of political repression can only be employed subject to the decision of a special tribunal elected by the C.E.K. proportionally to the strength of the different parties represented, and this tribunal shall have the right also to reconsider measures of repression already taken. This was met by a thunder of applause, not only from the left socialist revolutionaries, but also from a part of the Bolsheviki. Avanesov, for the Leninites, hastily proposed that the question of the press be postponed until after some compromise between the socialist parties had been reached, overwhelmingly voted down. The revolution which is now being accomplished, went on Avanesov, has not hesitated to attack private property, and it is as private property that we must examine the question of the press. Thereupon he read the official Bolshevik resolution. The suppression of the bourgeois press was dictated not only by purely military needs in the course of the insurrection, and for the checking of counter-revolutionary action, but it is also necessary as a measure of transition towards the establishment of a new regime with regard to the press a regime under which the capitalist owners of printing presses and of paper cannot be the all-powerful and exclusive manufacturers of public opinion. We must further proceed to the confiscation of private printing plants and supplies of paper, which should become the property of the Soviets both in the capital and the provinces, so that the political parties and groups can make use of the facilities of printing in proportion to the actual strength of the ideas they represent, in other words, proportionally to the number of their constituents. The re-establishment of the so-called freedom of the press, the simple return of printing presses and paper to the capitalists, poisoners of the mind of the people, this would be an inadmissible surrender to the will of capital, a giving up of one of the most important conquests of the revolution, in other words, it would be a measure of unquestionably counter-revolutionary character. Proceeding from the above, the Tsika categorically rejects all propositions aiming at the re-establishment of the old regime in the domain of the press and unequivocally supports the point of view of the Council of People's Commissars on this question, against pretensions and ultimatums dictated by petty bourgeois prejudices or by the evident surrender to the interests of the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie. The reading of this resolution was interrupted by ironical shouts from the left socialist revolutionaries and bursts of indignation from the insurgent Bolsheviki. Karolin was on his free protesting. Three weeks ago the Bolsheviki were the most ardent defenders of the freedom of the press. The arguments in this resolution suggest singularly the point of view of the old black hundreds and the censors of the Tsarist regime, for they also talked of poisoners of the mind of the people. Trotsky spoke at length in favour of the resolution. He distinguished between the press during the Civil War and the press after the victory. During Civil War, the right to use violence belongs only to the oppressed. Cries of, who's the oppressed now, cannibal? The victory over our adversaries is not yet achieved, 
and the newspapers are arms in their hands. In these conditions, the closing of the newspapers is a legitimate measure of defence. Then passing to the question of the press after the victory, Trotsky continued. The attitude of socialists on the question of freedom of the press should be the same as their attitude towards the freedom of business. The rule of democracy which is being established in Russia demands that the domination of the press by private property must be abolished, just as the domination of industry by private property. The power of the Soviet should confiscate all printing presses. Cries, confiscate the printing shop of Pravda. The monopoly of the press by the bourgeoisie must be abolished. Otherwise it isn't worthwhile for us to take the power. Each group of citizens should have access to print shops and paper. The ownership of print type and of paper belongs first to the workers and peasants and only afterwards to the bourgeois parties which are in a minority. The passing of the power into hands of the Soviets will bring about a radical transformation of the essential conditions of existence, and this transformation will necessarily be evident in the press. If we are going to nationalise the banks, can we then tolerate the financial journals? The old regime must die. That must be understood once and for all. Applause and angry cries. Carolyn declared that the Tsayika had no right to pass upon this important question, which should be left to a special committee. Again, passionately, he demanded that the press be free. Then Lenin, calm, unemotional, his forehead wrinkled as he spoke slowly, choosing his words, each sentence falling like a hammer blow. The civil war is not yet finished. The enemy is still with us. Consequently, it is impossible to abolish the measures of repression against the press. We Bolsheviki have always said that when we reached a position of power, we would close the bourgeois press. To tolerate the bourgeois newspapers would mean to cease being a socialist. When one makes a revolution, one cannot mark time. One must always go forward or go back. He who now talks about the freedom of the press goes backward and halts our headlong course towards socialism. We have thrown off the yoke of capitalism, just as the first revolution threw off the yoke of Tsarism. If the first revolution had the right to suppress the monarchist papers, then we have the right to suppress the bourgeois press. It is impossible to separate the question of the freedom of the press from the other questions of the class struggle. We have promised to close these newspapers, and we shall do it. The immense majority of the people is with us. Now that the insurrection is over, we have absolutely no desire to suppress the papers of the other socialist parties, except in as much as they appeal to the armed insurrection or to disobedience to the socialist government. However, we shall not permit them, under the pretense of freedom of the socialist press, to obtain, through the secret support of the bourgeoisie, a monopoly of printing presses, ink and paper. These essentials must become the property of the Soviet government and be apportioned, first of all, to the socialist parties in strict proportion to their voting strength. Then the vote. The resolution of Larin and the left socialist revolutionaries was defeated by 31 to 22. The Lenin motion was carried by 34 to 24. Among the minority were the Bolsheviki Ryazanov and Lozonsky, who declared that it was impossible for them to vote against any restriction on the freedom of the press. Upon this, the left socialist revolutionaries declared they could no longer be responsible for what was being done, and withdrew from the Military Revolutionary Committee and all other positions of executive responsibility. Five members, Nogin, Rykov, Milutin, Teodorovich and Siabnikov, resigned from the Council of People's Commissars, declaring... We are in favour of a socialist government composed of all the parties in the Soviets. 
we consider that only the creation of such a government can possibly guarantee the results of the heroic struggle of the working class and the revolutionary army outside of that there remains only one way the constitution of a purely bolshevik government by means of political terrorism this last is the road taken by the council of people's commissars we cannot and will not follow it we see that this leads directly to the elimination from political life of many proletarian organizations to the establishment of an irresponsible regime and to the destruction of the revolution and the country we cannot take the responsibility for such a policy and we renounce before the tsai -e -ka our function as people's commissars other commissars without resigning their positions sign the declaration ryazanov derbychev of the press department arbuzov of the government printing plant Yureniev of the red guard fyodorov of the commissariat of labor and larin secretary of the section of elaboration of decrees at the same time kameniev Rykov, Milutin, Zinoviev, and Nogin resigned from the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party, making public their reasons. The constitution of such a government, composed of all the parties of the Soviet, is indispensable to prevent a new flow of blood, the coming famine, the destruction of the revolution by the Kaledinists, to assure the convocation of the Constituent Assembly at the proper time and to apply effectively the program adopted by the Congress of Soviets. We cannot accept the responsibility for the disastrous policy of the Central Committee, carried on against the will of an enormous majority of the proletariat and the soldiers who are eager to see the rapid end of the bloodshed between the different political parties of the democracy. We renounce our title as members of the Central Committee, in order to be able to say openly our opinion to the masses of workers and soldiers. We leave the Central Committee at the moment of victory. We cannot calmly look on while the policy of the chiefs of the Central Committee leads towards the loss of the fruits of victory and the crushing of the proletariat. The masses of the workers, the soldiers of the garrison, stirred restlessly, sending their delegations to Smolny, to the conference for formation of the new government, where the break in the ranks of the Bolsheviki caused the liveliest joy. But the answer of the Leninites was swift and ruthless. Shlapnikov and Teodorovich submitted to party discipline and returned to their posts. Kameniev was stripped of his powers as president of the Seika, and Zverdlov elected in his place. Zinoviev was deposed as president of the Petrograd Soviet. On the morning of the 5th, Pravda contained a ferocious proclamation to the people of Russia, written by Lenin, which was printed in hundreds of thousands of copies, posted on the walls everywhere and distributed over the face of Russia. The Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets gave the majority to the Bolshevik Party. Only a government formed by this party can therefore be a Soviet government. And it is known to all that the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party, a few hours before the formation of the new government and before proposing the list of its members to the All-Russian Congress of Soviets, invited to its meeting three of the most eminent members of the left socialist revolutionary group, comrades Kamkov, Spiro and Kerolin, and asked them to participate in the new government. We regret infinitely that the invited comrades refused. We consider their refusal admissible for the revolutionists and champions of the working class. We are willing at any time to include the left socialist revolutionaries in the government, but we declare that, as the party of the majority at the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets, we are entitled and bound before the people to form a government. Comrades, several members of the Central Committee of our party and the Council of People's Commissars, Kameniev, Zinoviev, Nogin, Rykov, Milutin, and a few others left yesterday, November 17th, 
the Central Committee of our party, and the last three, the Council of People's Commissars. The comrades who left us acted like deserters, because they not only abandoned the posts entrusted to them, but also disobeyed the direct instructions of the Central Committee of our party, to the effect that they should await the decisions of the Petrograd and Moscow party organizations before retiring. We blame decisively such desertion. We are firmly convinced that all conscious workers, soldiers and peasants belonging to our party or sympathizing with it will also disapprove of the behavior of the deserters. Remember, comrades, that two of these deserters, Kameniev and Zinoviev, even before the uprising in Petrograd, appeared as deserters and strike-breakers by voting at the decisive meeting of the Central Committee, October 23rd, 1917, against the insurrection, and even after the resolution passed by the Central Committee, they continued their campaign at a meeting of the party workers. But the great impulse of the masses, the great heroism of millions of workers, soldiers and peasants, in Moscow, Petrograd, at the front, in the trenches, in the villages, pushed aside the deserters as a railway train scatters sawdust. Shame upon those who are of little faith, hesitate, who doubt, who allow themselves to be frightened by the bourgeoisie, or who succumb before the cries of the latter's direct or indirect accomplices. There is not a shadow of hesitation in the masses of Petrograd, Moscow and the rest of Russia. We shall not submit to any ultimatums from small groups of intellectuals which are not followed by the masses, which are practically only supported by Kornolivists, Savinkovists, Yunkers and so forth. End of chapter 11, part 1. Recording by Richard Beck. Chapter 11, Part 2 of Ten Days That Shook the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Beck. Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed. Chapter 11, Part 2. The response from the whole country was like a blast of hot storm. The insurgents never got a chance to say openly their opinion to the masses of workers and soldiers. Upon the Tsayika rolled in like breakers the fierce popular condemnation of the deserters. For days Smolny was thronged with angry delegations and committees, from the front, from the Volga, from the Petrograd factories. Why did they dare leave the government? Were they paid by the bourgeoisie to destroy the revolution? They must return and submit to the decisions of the Central Committee. Only in the Petrograd garrison was there still uncertainty. A great soldier meeting was held on November 24th, addressed by representatives of the, all the political parties. By a vast majority, Lenin's policy was sustained, and the left socialist revolutionaries were told that they must enter the government. See next page. The Mensheviki delivered a final ultimatum, demanding that all ministers and yunkers be released, that all newspapers be allowed full freedom, that the Red Guard be disarmed and the garrison put under the command of the Duma. To this, Solmny answered that all the socialist ministers and also all but a very few yunkers had already been set free, that all newspapers were free except the bourgeois press, and that the Soviet would remain in command of the armed forces. On the 19th, the conference to form a new government disbanded, and the opposition one by one slipped away to Mogilev, where, under the wing of the general staff, they continued to form government after government until the end. Graphic Announcement, posted on the walls of Petrograd, of the result of a meeting of representatives of the garrison regiments, called to consider the question of forming a new government. For translation, see Appendix 11, Section 6. Meanwhile, the Bolsheviki had been undermining the powers of the Vigsel, 
an appeal of the Petrograd Soviet to all railway workers called upon them to force the Vigshel to surrender its powers. On the 15th, the Tsika, following its procedure toward the peasants, called an all-Russian Congress of Railway Workers for December 1st. The Vigsal immediately called its own Congress for two weeks later. On November 16th, the Vigsal members took their seats in the Tseika. On the night of December 2nd, at the opening session of the all-Russian Congress of Railway Workers, the Tseika formally offered the post of Commissar of Ways and Communications to the Vigsal, which accepted. Having settled the question of power, the Bolsheviki turned their attention to problems of practical administration. First of all, the city, the country, the army must be fed. Bands of sailors and red guards scoured the warehouses, the railway terminals, even the barges and the canals, unearthing and confiscating thousands of poods of food held by private speculators. Emissaries were sent to the provinces, where with the assistance of the land committees they seized the storehouses of the great grain dealers. Expeditions of sailors, heavily armed, were sent out in groups of 5,000, to the south, to Siberia, with roving commissions to capture cities still held by the white guards, establish order, and get food. Passenger traffic on the Trans-Siberian Railroad was suspended for two weeks, while thirteen trains, loaded with bolts of cloth and bars of iron assembled by the factory shop committees, were sent out eastward, each in charge of a commissar, to barter with the Siberian peasants for grain and potatoes. Kaladin, being in possession of the coal mines of the Don, the fuel question became urgent. Smolny shut off electric lights in theatres, shops and restaurants, cut down the number of streetcars and confiscated the private stores of firewood held by the fuel dealers. And when the factories of Petrograd were about to close down for lack of coal, the sailors of the Baltic fleet turned over to the workers 200,000 poods from the bunkers of battleships. Toward the end of November occurred the wine pogroms. See Appendix 11, Section 7. Looting of the wine cellars beginning with the plundering of the Winter Palace vaults. For days there were drunken soldiers on the streets. In all, this was evident the hand of the counter-revolutionaries, who distributed among the regiments plans showing the location of the stores of liquor. The commissars of Smolny began by pleading and arguing, which did not stop the growing disorder, followed by pitched battles between soldiers and Red Guards. Finally, the Military Revolutionary Committee sent out companies of soldiers with machine guns, who fired mercilessly upon the rioters, killing many, and by executive order the wine cellars were invaded by committees with hatchets, who smashed the bottles or blew them up with dynamite. Companies of Red Guards, disciplined and well paid, were on duty at the headquarters of the ward Soviets day and night, replacing the old militia. In all quarters of the city, small elective revolutionary tribunals were set up by the workers and soldiers to deal with petty crime. The great hotels, where the speculators still did a thriving business, were surrounded by red guards and the speculators thrown into jail. See Appendix 11, Section 8. Alert and suspicious, the working class of the city constituted itself a vast spy system through the servants prying into bourgeois households and reporting all information to the Military Revolutionary Committee, which struck with an iron hand unceasing. In this way was discovered the monarchist plot led by former Duma member Purishkovich and a group of nobles and officers who had planned an officer's uprising, and had written a letter inviting Kaladin to Petrograd. See Appendix 11, Section 9. In this way was unearthed the conspiracy of the Petrograd cadets, who were sending money and recruits to Kaladin. Neratov, frightened at the outburst of popular fury provoked by his flight, returned and surrendered the secret treaties to Trotsky, who began their publication in Pravda, scandalizing the world. Graphic, Bolshevik order, a proclamation of the committee to fight against pogroms, attached to the Petrograd Soviet. For translation, see Appendix 11, Section 11. The restrictions on the press were increased by a degree. See Appendix 11, Section 10. 
making advertisements a monopoly of the official government newspaper. At this, all the other papers suspended publication as a protest, or disobeyed the law and were closed. Only three weeks later did they finally submit. Still the strike of the ministries went on, still the sabotage of the old officials, the stoppage of normal economic life. Behind Smolny was only the will of the vast, unorganised popular masses, and with them the Council of People's Commissars dealt, directing revolutionary mass action against its enemies. In eloquent proclamations, see Appendix 11, Section 12, couched in simple words and spread over Russia, Lenin explained the revolution, urged the people to take the power into their own hands, by force to break down the resistance of the propertied classes, by force to take over the institutions of government, revolutionary order, revolutionary discipline, strict accounting and control, no strikes, no loafing. Graphic. Appeal of the Petrograd Soviet, the Petrograd Council of Professional Unions, and the Petrograd Council of Factory Shop Committees, to the workers of Petrograd, urging them to work hard and not to strike. For translation, see Appendix 11, Section 13. On the 20th of November, the Military Revolutionary Committee issued a warning. The rich classes oppose the power of the Soviets, the government of workers, soldiers and peasants. Their sympathizers halt the work of the employees of the government and the Duma, incite strikes in the banks, try to interrupt communication by the railways, the post and the telegraph. We warn them they are playing with fire. The country and the army are threatened with famine. To fight against it, the regular functioning of all services is indispensable. The workers' and peasants' government is taking every measure to assure the country and the army that all is necessary. Opposition to these measures is a crime against the people. We warn the rich classes and their sympathizers that, if they do not cease their sabotage and their provocation in halting the transportation of food, they will be the first to suffer. They will be deprived of the right of receiving food. All the reserves which they possess will be requisitioned. The property of the principal criminals will be confiscated. We have done our duty in warning those who play with fire. We are convinced that in case decisive measures become necessary, we shall be solidly supported by all workers, soldiers and peasants. On the 22nd of November, the walls of the city were placarded with a sheet headed Extraordinary Communication. The Council of People's Commissars has received an urgent telegram from the staff of the Northern Front. There must be no further delay. Do not let the army die of hunger. The armies of the Northern Front have not received a crust of bread now for several days, and in two or three days they will not have any more biscuits, which are being doled out to them from reserve supplies until now never touched. Already, Delegates from all parts of the front are talking of a necessary removal of part of the army to the rear, foreseeing that in a few days there will be a headlong flight of the soldiers, dying from hunger, ravaged by the three years' war in the trenches, sick, insufficiently clothed, barefooted, driven mad by superhuman misery. The Military Revolutionary Committee brings this to the notice of the Petrograd garrison and the workers of Petrograd. The situation at the front demands the most urgent and decisive measures. Meanwhile, the higher functionaries of the government institutions, banks, railroads, post and telegraph, are on strike and impeding the work of the government in supplying the front with provisions. Each hour of delay may cost the life of thousands of soldiers. The counter-revolutionary functionaries are the most dishonest criminals towards their hungry and dying brethren on the front. The Military Revolutionary Committee gives these criminals a last warning. In event of the least resistance or opposition on their part, the harshness of the measures which will be adopted against them will correspond to the seriousness of their crime. The masses of workers and soldiers responded by a savage tremor of rage which swept all of Russia. In the capital, the government and bank employees got out hundreds of proclamations and appeals. See 
Appendix 11, Section 14. Protesting, defending themselves, such as this one. To the attention of all citizens, the state bank is closed. Why? Because the violence exercised by the Bolsheviki against the state bank has made it impossible for us to work. The first act of the People's Commissars was to demand 10 million rubles, and on November the 27th they demanded 25 millions, without any indication as to where this money was to go. We functionaries cannot take part in plundering the people's property. We stopped work. Citizens, the money in the state bank is yours, the people's money, acquired by your labour, your sweat and blood. Citizens, save the people's property from robbery and us from violence and we shall immediately resume work. Employees of the State Bank From the Ministry of Supplies, the Ministry of Finance, from the Special Supply Committee, declarations that the Military Revolutionary Committee made it impossible for the employees to work, appeals to the population to support them against Smolny, but the dominant worker and soldier did not believe them. It was firmly fixed in the popular mind that the employees were sabotaging, starving the army, starving the people. In the long bread lines, which has formerly stood in the iron winter streets, it was not the government which was blamed, as it had been under Kerensky, but the Chinovinki, the saboteurs, for the government was their government. Their Soviets and the functionaries of the ministries were against it. At the centre of all this opposition was the Duma and its militant organ, the Committee for Salvation, protesting against all the decrees of the Council of People's Commissars, voting again and again not to recognise the Soviet government, openly cooperating with the new counter-revolutionary government set up at Mogilev. On the 17th of November, for example, the Committee for Salvation addressed all municipal governments, Zemenst Voz, and all democratic and revolutionary organizations of peasants, workers, soldiers, and other citizens. In these words, do not recognize the government of the Bolsheviki and struggle against it. Form local committees for salvation of country and revolution who will unite all democratic forces so as to aid the All-Russian Committee for Salvation in the tasks which it has set itself. Meanwhile, the elections for the Constituents' Assembly in Petrograd, see Appendix 11, Section 15, gave an enormous plurality to the Bolsheviki, so that even the Mensheviki internationalists pointed out that the Duma ought to be re-elected, as it no longer represented the political composition of the Petrograd population. At the same time, floods of resolutions from workers' organizations, from military units, even from the peasants in the surrounded country, poured in upon the Duma, calling it counter-revolutionary, Kornilovitz, and demanding that it resign. The last days of the Duma were stormy with the bitter demands of the municipal workers for decent living wages and the threat of strikes. On the 23rd, a formal decree of the Military Revolutionary Committee dissolved the Committee for Salvation. On the 29th, the Council of People's Commissars ordered the dissolution and re-election of the Petrograd City Duma. In view of the fact that the Central Duma of Petrograd, elected September the 2nd, has definitely lost the right to represent the population of Petrograd, being in complete disaccord with its state of mind and its aspirations, and in view of the fact that the personnel of the Duma majority, although having lost all political following, continues to make use of its prerogatives to resist in a counter-revolutionary manner the will of the workers, soldiers and peasants to sabotage and obstruct the normal work of the government, the Council of People's Commissars considered it its duty to invite the population of the capital to pronounce judgment on the policy of the organ of municipal autonomy. To this end, the Council of People's Commissars resolves 1. To dissolve the Municipal Duma, the dissolution to take effect November 30, 1917. 2. 
all functionaries elected or appointed by the present Duma shall remain at their posts and fulfil the duties confided to them until their places shall be filled by representatives of the new Duma. 3. All municipal employees shall continue to fulfil their duties. Those who leave the service of their own accord shall be considered discharged. 4. The new elections for the Municipal Duma of Petrograd are fixed for December the 9th, 1917. 5. The Municipal Duma of Petrograd shall meet December the 11th, 1917 at 2 o'clock. 6. Those who disobey this decree, as well as those who intentionally harm or destroy the property of the municipality, shall be immediately arrested and brought before the revolutionary tribunals. The Duma met defiantly, passing resolutions to the effect that it would defend its position to the last drop of its blood, and appealing desperately to the population to save their own elected city government. But the population remained indifferent or hostile. On the 31st, Mayor Schreider and several members were arrested, interrogated and released. That day and the next, the Duma continued to meet, interrupted frequently by Red Guards and sailors, who politely requested the assembly to disperse. At the meeting of December the 2nd, an officer and some sailors entered the Nikolai Hall while a member was speaking, and ordered the members to leave, or force would be used. They did so, protesting to the last, but finally, ceding to violence. The new Duma, which was elected ten days later, and for which the moderate socialists refused to vote, was almost entirely Bolshevik. There remain several centres of dangerous opposition, such as the republics of Ukraine and Finland, which were showing definitely anti-Soviet tendencies. Both at Helsingfors and at Kiev, the governments were gathering troops which could be depended upon, and entering upon campaigns of crushing Bolshevism and of disarming and expelling Russian troops. The Ukrainian Rada had taken command of all southern Russia and was furnishing Kaladin reinforcements and supplies. Both Finland and Ukraine were beginning secret negotiations with the Germans and were promptly recognised by the Allied governments, which loaned them huge sums of money joining with the propertied classes to create counter-revolutionary centres of attack upon Soviet Russia. In the end, when Bolshevism had conquered in both these countries, the defeated bourgeoisie called in the Germans to restore them to power. But the most formidable menace to the Soviet government was internal and two-headed, the Kaladin movement and the staff at Moliglev, where General Dukonin had assumed command graphic proclamation of the commission of public education attached to the city duma concerning the strike of school teachers just before the christmas holidays the duma had been re-elected and was composed almost entirely of bolsheviki for translation see appendix 11 section 17 the ubiquitous muravivov was appointed commander of the war against the cossacks and a Red Army was recruited from among the factory workers. Hundreds of propagandists were sent to the Don. The Council of People's Commissars issued a proclamation to the Cossacks. See Appendix 11, Section 16, explaining what the Soviet government was, how the property classes, the Chinovinki, landlords, bankers, their allies, the Cossack princes, landowners and generals, were trying to destroy the revolution and prevent the confiscation of their wealth by the people. On November 27th, the Committee of Cossacks came to Smolny to see Trotsky and Lenin. They demanded if it were true that the Soviet government did not intend to divide the Cossack lands among the peasants of Great Russia. No, answered Trotsky. The Cossacks deliberated for a while. Well, they asked. Does the Soviet government intend to confiscate the estates of our great Cossack landowners and divide them amongst the working Cossacks? To this, Lenin replied, That, he said, is for you to do. We shall support the working Cossacks in all their actions. 
The best way to begin is to form Cossack Soviets. You will be given representation at Tsaika, and then it will be your government too. The Cossacks departed, thinking hard. Two weeks later, General Kaladin received a deputation from his troops. Will you, they asked, promise to divide the great estates of the Cossack landlords amongst the working Cossacks? Only over my dead body, responded Kaladin. A month later, seeing his army melt away before his eyes, Kaladin blew out his brains, and the Cossack movement was no more. Meanwhile, at Mogilev were gathered the Otsaika, the moderate socialist leaders, from Avenkentsev to Chernov, the active chiefs of the old army committees, and the reactionary officers. The staff steadily refused to recognize the Council of People's Commissars. It had united about it the Deaf Battalions, the Knights of St. George, and the Cossacks of the Front, and was in close and secret touch with the Allied military attaches and with the Kaladin movement and the Ukrainian Rada. The Allied governments had made no reply to the peace decree of November the 8th, in which the Congress of Soviets had asked for a general armistice. On November 20th, Trotsky addressed a note to the Allied ambassadors. See Appendix 11, Section 18. I have the honour to inform you, Mr. Ambassador, that the All-Russian Congress of Soviets, on November the 8th, constituted a new government of the Russian Republic, in the form of the Council of People's Commissars. The president of this government is Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. The direction of foreign affairs has been entrusted to me, People's Commissar for Foreign Affairs. In drawing your attention to the text, approved by the All-Russian Congress, of the proposition for an armistice and a democratic peace without annexations or indemnities, based on the right of self-determination of the peoples, I have the honour to request you to consider that document as a formal proposal of an immediate armistice on all fronts, and the opening of immediate peace negotiations, a proposal which the authorised government of the Russian Republic addresses at the same time to all the belligerent peoples and their governments. Please accept, Mr. Ambassador, the profound assurance of the esteem of the Soviet government toward your people, who cannot but wish for peace, like all the other peoples exhausted and drained by this unexampled butchery. The same night the Council of People's Commissars telegraphed to General Dukonin. The Council of People's Commissars considers it indispensable without delay to make a formal proposal of armistice to all the powers, both enemy and allied. A declaration conforming to this decision has been sent by the Commissar for Foreign Affairs to the representatives of the allied powers at Petrograd. The Council of People's Commissars orders you, Citizen Commander, to propose to the enemy military authorities immediately to cease hostilities and enter into negotiations for peace. In charging you with the conduct of these preliminary poor parlours, the Council of People's Commissars orders you 1. To inform the Council by direct wire immediately of any and all steps in the poor parlours with the representatives of the enemy armies. 2. Not to sign the Act of Armistice until it has been passed upon by the Council of People's Commissars. The Allied Ambassadors received Trotsky's note with contemptuous silence, accompanied by anonymous interviews in the newspapers full of spite and ridicule. The order to Dukonin was characterised openly as an act of treason. As for Dukonin, he gave no sign. On the night of November the 22nd, he was communicated with by telephone, and asked if he intended to obey the order. Dukonin answered that he could not, unless it emanated from a government sustained by the army and the country. By telegraph, he was immediately dismissed from the post of Supreme Commander, and Kirilenko appointed in his place. Following his tactics of appealing to the masses, Lenin sent a radio to all regimental, divisional, and corps committees, to all soldiers and sailors of the army and fleet, acquainting them with Dukonin's refusal, 
and ordering that the regiments on the front shall elect delegates to begin negotiations with the enemy detachments opposite their positions. On the 23rd, the military attaches of the Allied nations, acting on instructions from their governments, presented a note to de Conin, in which he was solemnly warned not to violate the conditions of the treaties concluded between the powers of the intent. The note went on to say that if a separate armistice with Germany were concluded, that act would result in the most serious consequences to Russia. This communication de Conin at once sent out to all the soldiers' committees. Next morning Trotsky made another appeal to the troops, characterizing the note of the Allied representatives as a flagrant interference in the internal affairs of Russia, and a bold attempt to force by threats the Russian army and the Russian people to continue the war in execution of the treaties concluded by the Tsar. From Smolny poured out proclamation after proclamation. See Appendix 11, Section 19. Denouncing Dukonin and the counter-revolutionary officers about him. Denouncing the reactionary politicians gathered at Mogilev. Rousing, from one end of the thousand-mile front to the other, millions of angry, suspicious soldiers. And at the same time, Kirilenko, accompanied by three detachments of fanatical sailors, set out for the Stavka breathing threats of vengeance, see Appendix 11, Section 20, and received by the soldiers everywhere with tremendous ovations, a triumphal progress. The Central Army Committee issued a declaration in favour of Dukonin, and at once 10,000 troops moved upon Mogilev. On December the 2nd, the garrison of Mogilev rose and seized the city, arresting Dukonin and the Army Committee, and going out with victorious red banners to meet the new supreme commander. Kirilenko entered Mogilev the next morning, to find a howling mob gathered about the railway car in which Dukonin had been imprisoned. Kirilenko made a speech in which he implored the soldiers not to harm Dukonin, as he was to be taken to Petrograd and judged by the Revolutionary Tribunal. When he had finished, suddenly Dukonin himself appeared at the window, as if to address the throng, but with a savage roar the people rushed the car, and falling upon the old general, dragged him out and beat him to death on this platform. So ended the revolt of the Stavka. Immensely strengthened by the collapse of the last important stronghold of hostile military power in Russia, the Soviet government began with confidence the organization of the state. Many of the old functionaries flocked to its banner, and many members of other parties entered the government's service. The financially ambitious, however, were checked by the decree on salaries of government employees, fixing the salaries of the people's commissars, the highest, at 500 rubles, about $50 a month. The strike of government employees, led by the Union of Unions, collapsed, deserted by the financial and commercial interests which had been backing it. The bank clerks returned to their jobs. With the decree on the nationalization of banks, the formation of the Supreme Council of People's Economy, the putting into practical operation the land decree in the villages, the democratic reorganization of the army, and the sweeping changes in all branches of the government and of life, with all these, effective only by the will of the masses of workers, soldiers, and peasants, slowly began, with many mistakes and hitches, the moulding of proletarian Russia. Not by compromise with the propertied classes, or with the other political leaders, not by conciliating the old government mechanism, did the Bolsheviki conquer the power, nor by the organised violence of a small clique. If the masses all over Russia had not been ready for insurrection, it must have failed. The only reason for Bolshevik success lay in their accomplishing the vast and simple desires of the most profound strata of the people, calling them to the work of tearing down and destroying the old, and afterward, in the smoke of falling ruins, cooperating with them to erect the framework of the new. End of chapter 11, part 2 Recording by Richard Beck
Chapter Twelve of Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simira Thor. Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed. Chapter Twelve: The Peasants' Congress. It was on November eighteenth that the snow came. In the morning, we woke to window ledges heaped white and snowflakes falling so whirling thick that it was impossible to see ten feet ahead the mud was gone in a twinkling the gloomy city became white dazzling the droshki with their padded coachmen turned into slides bounding along the uneven street at a headlong speed their drivers beard stiff and frozen in spite of revolution all russia plunging dizzily into the unknown and terrible future joy swept the city with the coming of the snow everybody was smiling people ran into the streets holding out their arms to the soft falling flakes laughing hidden was all the grayness only the gold and the colored spires and cupolas with heightened barbaric splendor gleamed through the white snow even the sun came out pale and watery at noon the colds and rheumatism of the rainy months vanished the life of the city grew gay and the very revolution ran swifter I sat one evening in a tractor, a kind of a lower class, in across the street from the gates of Molney, a low-ceilinged, loud place called Uncle Tom's cabin, much frequented by red cards. They crowded it now, packed close around the little tables with their dirty tablecloths and enormous china teapots, filling the place with foul cigarette smoke, while the harassed waiters ran about crying, "See chairs, see chairs." in a minute right away in one corner sat a man in the uniform of a captain addressing the assembly which interrupted him at very few words you are no better than murderers he cried shooting down your russian brothers on the streets when did we do that asked a worker last sunday you did it when the yunkers well didn't they shoot us one man exhibited his arm in a sling haven't i got something to remember them by the devils the captain shouted at the top of his voice you should remain neutral you should remain neutral who are you to destroy the legal government who is lenin a german who are you a counter revolutionist a provocator they bellowed at him well when he could make himself hear the captain stood up all right said he you call yourselves the people of russia but you are not the people of russia the peasants are the people of russia wait until the peasants yes they cried wait until the peasants speak we know what the peasants will say aren't they working men like ourselves in the long run everything depended upon the peasants while the peasants had been politically backward still they had their own peculiar ideas and they constituted more than 80% of the people of russia the bolsheviki had a comparatively small following among the peasants and the permanent dictatorship of russia by the industrial workers was impossible the traditional peasant party was a socialist revolutionary party of all the parties now supporting the soviet government the left socialist revolutionaries were the logical inheritors of peasant leadership and the left socialist revolutionaries who were at the mercy of the organized city proletariat desperately needed the backing of the peasants meanwhile molnay had not neglected the peasants after the land decree one of the first actions of the new seike had been to call a congress of peasants over the head of the executive committee of the peasant soviets a few days later was issued detailed regulations for the volost township land committees followed by lenin's instruction to peasants See Appendix Twelve, Section One, which explained the Bolshevik Revolution and the new government in simple terms. And on November sixteenth, Lenin and Milutin published the instructions to provincial emissaries, of whom thousands were sent by the Soviet government into the villages. Upon his arrival in the province to which he is accredited, the emissary should call a joint meeting of the Central Executive Committees. of the soviets of workers soldiers peasants deputies to whom he should make a report on the agrarian laws and then demand that a joint plenary session of the soviets be summoned he must study the aspects of the agrarian problem in the province has the landowner's property been taken over 
and if so in what districts who administers the confiscated land the former proprietor or the land committees what has been done with the agricultural machinery and with the farm animals has the ground cultivated by the peasants been augmented how much and in what respect does the amount of land now under cultivation differ from the amount fixed by the government as an average minimum the emissary must insist that after the peasants have received the land it is imperative that they increase the amount of cultivated land as quickly as possible and that they hasten the sending of grain to the cities as the only means of avoiding famine what are the measures projected or put into effect for the transfer of land from the landowners to the land committees and similar bodies appointed by the soviets it is desirable that agricultural properties well appointed and well organized should be administered by soviets composed of the regular employees of those properties under the direction of competent agricultural scientists all through the villages a ferment of change was going on caused not only by the electrifying action of the land decree but also by thousands of revolutionary minded peasant soldiers returning from the front this man especially welcomed the call to a congress of peasants like the old saike in the matter of the second congress of workers and soldiers soviets the executive committee tried to prevent the peasant congress summoned by molny and like the old saike finding its resistance futile the executive committee sent frantic telegrams ordering the election of conservative delegates word was even spread among the peasants that the congress would meet at Malkilev and some delegates went there but by november 23rd about 400 had gathered in petrograd and the party caucuses had begun the first session took place in alexander hall of the duma building and the first vote showed that more than half of all the delegates were left socialist revolutionaries while the bolsheviki controlled a bare fifth the conservative socialist revolutionaries a quarter and all the rest were united only in their opposition to the old executive committee dominated by exentiv tchaikovsky and pishevskno the great hall was jammed with people and shaken with continual clamor deep stubborn bitterness divided the delegates into angry groups to the right was a sprinkling of officers epaulettes and the patricial bearded faces of the older more substantial peasants in the center were a few peasants non-commissioned officers and some soldiers and on the left almost all the delegates wore the uniforms of common soldiers this last were the young generation who had been serving in the army the galleries were thronged with workers who in russia still remember their peasant origin unlike the old saike the executive committee in opening the session did not recognize the congress as official the official congress was called for december 13th amid a hurricane of applause and angry cries the speaker declared that this gathering was merely extraordinary conference but the extraordinary conference soon showed its attitude toward the executive committee by electing as presiding officer maria spiridonova leader of the left socialist revolution arise most of the first day was taken up by a violent debate as to whether the representatives of volost soviets should be seated or only delegates from the provincial bodies and just as if the workers of soldiers congress in overwhelming majority declared in favor of the widest possible representation whereupon the old executive committee left the hall almost immediately it was evident that most of the delegates were hostile to the government of the people's commissioners Genovev attempting to speak the Bolsheviki was hooted down and as he left the platform amid laughter there were cries there how a people commissioner sits in mud puddle we left socialist revolutionaries refuse cried Nazarev a delegate from the provinces to recognize this called workers and peasants government until the peasants are represented in it at present it is nothing but a dictatorship of the workers we insist upon the formation of a new government which will represent the entire democracy the reactionary delegates shrewdly fostered its feeling declaring in the face of protest from the bolshevik benches 
that the Council of People's Commissioners intended either to control the Congress or dissolve it by force of arms, an announcement which was received by the peasants with burst of fury. On the third day, Lenin suddenly mounted the tribune. For ten minutes the room went mad. Down with him, they shrieked. We will not listen to any of your people's commissioners. We don't recognize your government. Lenin stood there quite calmly, gripping the desk with both hands, his little eyes thoughtfully surveying the tumult beneath. Finally, except for the right side of the hall, the demonstration wore itself out somewhat. I do not come here as a member of the Council of People's Commissioners, said Lenin, and waited again for the noise to subside. But as a member of the Bolshevik faction, Tulai elected to its Congress, and he held his credentials up to that all might see them. However, he went on, in an unmoved voice, Nobody will deny that the present government of Russia has been formed by the Bolshevik party. He had to wait a moment, so that for all purposes it is the same thing. Here the right benches broke into deafening clamor, but the center and left were curious and compelled silence. Lenin's argument was simple. Tell me frankly, you peasants to whom we have given the lands of the Pomish Kitiki, do you want now to present the workers from getting control of industry? This is class war. The Pomish Tiki, of course, oppose the peasants, and the manufacturers oppose the workers. Are you going to allow the ranks of the proletarian to be divided? Which side will you be on? We, the Bolsheviki, are the party of the proletarian, of the peasant proletarian, as well as the industrial proletarian. We, the Bolsheviki, are the protectors of the Soviets of the peasants, Soviets as well as those of the workers and the soldiers. The present government is a government of Soviets. We have not only invited the peasants, Soviets, to join that government, but we have also invited representatives of the left socialist revolutionaries to enter the Council of People's Commissioners. The Soviets are the most perfect representatives of the people, of the workers in the factories and mines, of the workers in the fields. Anybody who attempts to destroy the Soviets is guilty of an anti-democratic and counter-revolutionary act, and I serve notice here on you, comrades, right socialist revolutionaries, and on you, messers. Carrot said, if the Constituent Assembly attempts to destroy the Soviets, we shall not permit the Constituent Assembly to do this thing. On the afternoon of November 25th, Trekarnov arrived in the hot haste from Mogilev, summoned by the Executive Committee only two months before considered an extreme revolutionist and very popular with the peasants. He was now called to check the dangerous drift of the Congress towards the left. Upon his arrival, Tekrana was arrested and taken to Molnai, where after a short conversation he was released. His first act was to bitterly rebuke the executive committee for leaving the Congress. They agreed to return and Tekrana entered the hall welcomed with great applause by the majority and the hoots and jeers of the Bolsheviki. Comrades, I have been away. I participated in the conference of the 12th Army on the question of calling a Congress of all the peasant delegates of the armies of the Western Front, and I know very little about the insurrection which occurred here. Zinoviev rose in his seat and shouted, Yes, you were away for a few minutes. Fearful tumult cries down with the Bolsheviki. Tekranov continued. The accusation that I have led an army of Petrograd has no foundation and is entirely false. Where does such an accusation come from? Show me the source. Zinoviev, Izivetia and Dielo Naroda, your own paper, that's where it comes from. Tekranov's wide face with the small eyes, waving hair and greyish beard became red with breath. But he controlled himself and went on. I repeat, I know practically... Nothing about what has happened here, and I did not lead any army except this army. He pointed to the peasant delegates, which I am largely responsible for bringing here. Laughter and shouts of bravo. Upon my return, I visited Smolny. No such accusation was made against me there. After a brief conversation, I left, and that's all. Let anyone present make such an accusation. An uproar followed in which the Bolsheviki and some of the left socialist revolutionaries were on their feet at once, shaking their fists and yelling, and the rest of the assembly tried to yell them down. 
This is an outrage, not a session, cried Tekranau, and he left the hall. The meeting was adjourned because of the noise and disorder. Meanwhile, the question of the status of the executive committee was agitating all minds. By declaring the assembly extraordinary conference, it had been planned to block the re-election of the executive committee, but this worked both ways. The left socialist revolutionist decided that if the Congress had no power over the executive committee, then the executive committee had no power over the Congress. On November 25th, the assembly resolved that the powers of the executive committee be assumed by the extraordinary conference in which only members of the executive who had been elected as delegates might vote. The next day, in spite of the bitter opposition of the Bolsheviki, the revolution was amended to give all the members of the executive committee, whether elected as delegates or not, voice and vote in the assembly. On the 27th occurred the debate on the land question, which revealed the differences between the agrarian program of the Bolsheviki and the left socialist revolutionaries. Kolchinsky, for the left socialist revolutionaries, outlined the history of the land question during the revolution. The first Congress of the Peasants, Soviets, he said, had voted a precise and formal revolution in favor of putting the landed estates immediately into the hands of the Lands Committee. But the directors of the revolution and the burghers in the government had insisted that the question could not be solved until the Constituent Assembly met. The second period of the revolution, the period of compromise, was signaled by the entrance of Tekranau into the cabinet. The peasants were convinced that now the practical solution of the land question would begin. But in spite of the imperative decision of the first peasant congress, the reactionaries and conciliators in the executive committee had prevented any action. This policy provoked a series of agrarian disorders which appeared as an natural expression of impatience and thwarted energy on the part of the peasants. The peasants understood the exact meaning of the revolution. They tried to turn words into action. The recent events, said the orator, do not indicate a simple riot or a Bolshevik adventure, but on the contrary a real popular rising, which has been greeted with sympathy by the whole country. The Bolshevik in the general took the correct attitude toward the land question, but in recommending that the peasants seize the land by force, they committed a profound error. From the first days, the Bolsheviki declared that the peasants should take over the land by revolutionary mass action. This is nothing but anarchy. The land can be taken over in an organized manner. For the Bolsheviki, it was important that the problems of the revolution should be solved in the quickest possible manner, but the Bolsheviki were not interested in how these problems were to be solved. The land decree of the Congress of Soviets is identical in its fundamentals with the decisions of the First Peasants' Congress. When then did not the new government follow the tactics outlined by the Congress? Because the Council of People's Commissioners wanted to hasten the settlement of the land question, so that the Constituent Assembly would have nothing to do. But also the government saw that it was necessary to adopt the practical measures. So without further reflection, it adopted the regulations for land committees, thus creating a strained situation for the Council of People's Commissioners abolished private property in land, but the regulations drawn up by the land committees are based on private property. However, no harm has been done by that for the land committees are paying no attention to the Soviet decrees, but are putting into operation their own practical decisions, decisions based on the will of the vast majority of the peasants. These land committees are not adapting the legislative solution of the land question, which belongs to the Constituent Assembly alone. But will the Constituent Assembly desire to do the will of the Russian peasants? Of that we cannot be sure. All we can be sure of is that the revolutionary determination of the peasants is now aroused and that the constituent will be forced to settle the land question the way the peasants want it settled. The constituent assembly will not dare to break with the will of the people, followed him Lenin, Listen to now with absorbing intensity. At this moment we are not only trying to solve the land question, but the question of social revolution. Not only here in Russia, but
but all over the world. The land question cannot be solved independently of the other problems of the social revolution. For example, the confiscation of the landed estates will provoke the resistance not only of Russian landowners but also of foreign capital with whom the great landed properties are connected through the intermediary of the banks. The ownership of the land in Russia is the basis for immense operation and the confiscation of the land by the peasants is the most important step of our revolution, but it cannot be separated from the other steps and is clearly manifested by the stages through which the revolution has had to pass. The first stage was the crushing of autocracy and the crushing of the power of the industrial capitalist and the landowners whose interests are closely related. The second stage was the strengthening of the Soviets and the political compromise with the Burgeois. The mystique of the left socialist revolutionaries lies in the fact that at that time they did not oppose the policy of compromise because they held the theory that the consciousness of the masses was not yet fully developed. If socialism can only be realized when the intellectual development of all the people permits it, then we shall not see socialism for at least 500 years. The socialist political party, this is the vanguard of the working class. It must not allow itself to be halted by the lack of education of the mass average, but it must let the masses using the Soviets as organs of revolutionary initiative. But in order to lead the wavering the comrades left socialist revolutionaries themselves must stop hesitating. In July, last a series of open breaks began between the popular masses and the compromisers. But now in November, the left socialist revolutionaries are still holding out their hand to Evkentiv, who is pulling the people with his little finger. If compromise continues, the revolution disappears. No compromise with the Burgiosi is possible. Its power must be absolutely crushed. We Bolsheviki have not changed our land program. We have not given up the abolition of private property in the land and we do not intend to do so. We adopted the regulations for land committees which are not based on private property at all because we want to accomplish the popular will in the way the people have themselves decided to do it so as to draw closer to the coalition of all the elements who are fighting for the social revolution. We invite the left socialist revolutionaries to enter that coalition insisting, however, that they cease looking backward and that they break with the conciliators of their party. As far as the Constituent Assembly is concerned, it is true as the preceding speaker has said that the work of the Constituent will depend on the revolutionary determination of the masses. I say, count on that revolutionary determination but don't forget your gun. Lenin then read the Bolshevik resolution. The Peasants' Congress, fully supporting the land decree of November 8, approves the Provincial Workers' and Peasants' Government of the Russian Republic, established by the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets of Workers' and Soldiers' Deputies. The Peasants' Congress invites all peasants anonymously to sustain that law and to apply it immediately themselves and at the same time invites the peasants to appoint to posts and positions of responsibility only persons who have proved not by words but by acts their entire devotion to the interest of the exploited peasant workers, their desire and their ability to defend this interest against all resistance on the part of the great landowners, the capitalists, their partitions and accomplices. The Peasants Congress at the same time expresses its conviction that the complete realization of all the measures which make up the land decree can only be successful to the triumph of the workers' social revolution, which began November 7, 1917, for only the social revolution can accomplish the definite transfer without responsibility of return of the land to the peasant workers, the confiscation of model farms and their surrender to the peasant communes the confiscation of agricultural machinery belonging to the great landowners, the safeguarding of the interest of the agricultural workers by the complete abolition of wage slavery, the regular and methodical distribution among all regions of Russia 
of the products of agriculture and industry and the seizure of the banks without which the possession of the land by the whole people would be impossible after the abolition of private property and all sorts of assistance by the states to the workers for these reasons the peasant congress sustains entirely the revolution of november seven as a social revolution and expresses its unalterable will to put into operation with whatever modifications are necessary but without any hesitation the social transformation of the russian republic the indispensable conditions of the victory of the social revolution which alone will secure the lasting success and the complete realization of the land decree is the close union of the peasant workers with the industrial working class with the protestant of all advanced countries from now on in the russian republic all the organization and the administration of the state from top to bottom must rest on that union that union crushing all attempts direct or indirect open or dissimulated to return to the policy of conciliation with the burgeoisie conciliation damned by experience with the chiefs of burgeoisie politics can only ensure the victory of socialism throughout the world the reactionaries of the executive committee no longer dared openly to appear tucker now however spoke several times with a modest and whining impartiality he was invited to sit on the platform on the second night of the congress an anonymous note was handed up to the chairman requesting that tucker now be made honorary president asti now read the note allowed and immediately zinoviev was on his feet screaming that this was a trick of the old executive committee to capture the convention in a moment the hall was one billowing mass of waving arms and angry faces on both sides nevertheless tekhanov remained very popular in the stormy debates on the land question and the lenin resolution the bolsheviki were twice on the point of quitting the assembly both times restrained by their leaders it seemed to me as if the congress were hopelessly deadlocked but none of us knew that a series of secret conferences were already going on between the left socialist revolutionaries and the bolshevik at molny at first the left socialist revolutionaries had demanded that there be a government composed of all the socialist parties in and out of soviets to be responsible to a people's council composed of an equal number of delegates from the workers soldiers organization and that of the peasants and completed by representatives of the city dumas and zemstvos lenin and trotsky were to be eliminated and the military revolutionary committee and other repressive organs dissolved wednesday morning november 28th after a terrible all night struggle an agreement was reached the seek composed of 108 members was to be augmented by 108 members elected proportionally from the peasants congress by 100 delegates elected directly from the army and the flat and by 50 representatives of the trade unions 35 from the general unions 10 railway workers and 5 from the post and telegraph workers the dumas and zemstvos were dropped Lenin and Trotsky remained in the government and the military revolutionary committee continued to function the sessions of the congress had now been removed to the imperial law school building fontanka six headquarters of the peasant soviets there is a great meeting hall the delegates gathered on wednesday afternoon the old executive committee had withdrawn and was holding a rum convention of its own in another room of the same building made up of bolting delegates and representatives of the army committees tekerna went from one meeting to the other keeping a watchful eye on the proceedings he knew that an agreement with the bolsheviki was being discussed but he did not know that it had been concluded he spoke to the rum convention at present when everybody is in favor of forming an all socialist move government many people forget the first ministry which was not a coalition government and in which there was only one socialist kerensky a government which in the, its time was very popular now people accuse kerensky they forget that he was raised to the power not only by the soviets but also by the popular masses why did public opinion change toward kerensky the savages set up cards to which they 
pray and which they punish if one of their prayers is not answered that is what is happening at this moment yesterday karenskaya today lenin and trotskaya another tomorrow we have proposed to both karenskaya and the bolsheviki to retire from the power karenskaya has accepted today he announced from his hiding place that he was resigned as premier but the bolsheviki wish to retain the power and they do not know how to use it if the bolsheviki succeeded or if they fail the fate of russia will not be changed the russian villages understand perfectly what they want and they are now carrying out their own measures the villages will save us in the end in the mill while in the great hall stina had announced the agreement between the peasants congress and molnay received by the delegates with the wildest joy suddenly chakranov appeared and demanded the floor I understand he began that an agreement is being concluded between the peasants congress and molnay such an agreement would be illegal seeing that the true congress of peasants soviets does not meet until next week moreover i want to warn you now that the bolsheviki will never accept your demands he was interrupted by a great burst of laughter and realizing the situation he left the platform and the room taking his popularity with him late in the afternoon of thursday november 16th the congress met in extraordinary session there was a holiday feeling in the air on every face was a smile the remainder of the business before the assembly was hurried through and the old nathan son the white bearded dean of the left wing of the socialist revolutionaries his voice trembling and tears in his eyes read the report of the wedding of the peasants soviets with the workers and soldiers soviets at every mention of the word union there was ecstatic applause at the end astina announced the arrival rival of a delegation from molnay accompanied by representatives of the red army greeted with a rising ovation one after another a workman a soldier and a sailor took the floor hailing them then boris rinstein delegate of the american socialist labor party the day of the union of the congress of peasants and the soviets of workers and soldiers deputies is one of the great days of the revolution the sound of it will ring with the resounding echoes throughout the whole world in paris in london and across the ocean in new york this union will fill with happiness the hearts of all toilers a great idea has dreamed the western america expected from russia from the russian proletariat something tremendous the proletariat of the world is waiting for the russian revolution waiting for the great things that is accomplishing Svedalo, president of the Seike, greeted them and with a shout, "Long live the end of civil war! Long live the united democracy!" The peasants poured out of the building. It was already dark, and on the ice-covered snow glittered the pale light of the moon and star. Along the bank of the canal were drawn up, in full marching order, the soldiers of the Pavlovsky regiment with their band, which broke into the Masalyevs. amid the crashing full-throated shouts of the soldiers the peasants formed in line unfurling the great red banner of the executive committee of the all russian peasants soviets embroidered newly in gold long live the union of revolutionary and toiling masses following were other banners of the district soviets of pulitlov factory which read we bow to this flag in order to create the brotherhood of all people from somewhere torches appeared blazing orange in the night a thousand times reflected in the facets of the ice streaming out smokily over the strong as it moved down the bank of the fontanka sinking between crowds that stood in the astonished silence long live the revolutionary army long live the red guard long live the peasants so the great procession would through the city growing and unfurling ever new red banners lettered in gold two old peasants bored with toil were walking hand in hand their faces illumined with the childlike plays well said one i had liked to see them take away our land again now near molnay the red car was lined up on both the sides of the street while with delight the other old peasant spoke to his comrade i am not tired he said i walked on air all the way on the steps of molnay about a hundred workers and soldiers deputies were massed with their banner dark against a blaze of light streaming out between the arches like a wave they 
rushed down, clasping the peasants in their arms and kissing them, and the procession poured in through the great door and up the stairs with a noise like thunder. In the immense white meeting room, the Seike was waiting with the whole Petrograd Soviet and a thousand spectators beside, with that solemnity which attends great conscious moments in history. Zinoviev announced the agreement with the Peasants' Congress to a shaking roar which rose and burst into storm as the sound of music blared down the corridor, and the head of the procession came in. On the platform, the presidium rose and made place for the Peasants' Presidium, the two emperors sing. Behind them, the two banners were intertwined against the white wall over the empty frame from which the sir's picture had been torn they opened the triumphal session after a few words of welcome from Verdlov, maria spiridonova slight pale and spectacles and hair drawn flatted down and the heir of a new england school teacher took the tribune the most loved and the most powerful woman in all russia before the workers of russia opened new horizons which history has never known all workers moments in the past have been defeated but the present moment is international and that is why it is invincible there is no force in the world which can put out the fire of the revolution the old world crumbles down and the new world begins then strotsky full of fire i wish you welcome comrades peasants you come here not as a guest but as a masters of this house which holds the heart of the russian revolution the will of millions of workers is now concentrated in the hall. There is now only one master of the Russian land, the union of the workers, soldiers and the peasants. With biting sarcasm, he went on to speak of the allied diplomats, till then contemptuous of Russia's invitation to an armistice which had been accepted by the central powers. A new humanity will be born of this war. In this hall, we swear to work of all lands uh, to remain at our revolutionary post if we are broken then it will be in defending our flag it will be in defending our flag with biting sarcasm he went on to speak of the allied diplomats till then contemptuous of russia's invitation to an armistice which had been accepted by the central powers a new humanity will be born of this war in this hall we swear to workers of all lands to remain at our revolutionary post, if we are broken, then it will be in defending our flag. Rylenko followed him, explaining the situation at the front, where Dukonin was preparing to resist the Council of People's Commissioners. Let Dukonin and those with him understand well that we shall not deal gently with those who bar the road to peace. Bybenko saluted the assembly in the name of the fleet, and Krushinsky member of the whistle said from this moment when the union of true socialists is realized the whole army of railway workers places itself absolutely at the disposition of the revolutionary democracy and lunan karskai almost weeping and prussian for the left socialist revolutionaries and finally shara shivali for the united social democrats internationalist composed of members of the martos and of korskai group who declared we left the tseike because the uncompromising policy of the bolsheviki and to force them to make concessions in order to realize the union of the revolutionary democracy now that the union is brought about we consider it is a sacred duty to take our places once more in seike we declare that all those who have withdrawn from the seike should now return sketchkow a dignified old peasant of the presidium of the peasants congress bowed to the four corners of the room i greet you with the christianing of a new russian life and freedom Gronsky, in the name of the Polish Social Democracy, Skripnik for the factory shop committees, Tifonov for the Russian soldiers at Salonika, and others, interminably speaking out for full hearts with the happy eloquence of hopes fulfilled. It was late in the night when the following resolution was put and, and passed unanimously. The Seika united in extraordinary session with the Petrograd Soviet and the Peasants Congress confirms the land and peace decrees adopted by the second congress of soviets of workers and soldiers deputies and also the decree on workers control adopted by the seike 
The joint session of the SEIC and the Peasants Congress expresses its firm conviction that the union of workers, soldiers and peasants, this fraternal union of all the workers and all exploited with consolidate the power conquered by them that it will take all revolutionary measures to hasten the passing of the powers into the hands of the working class in other countries and that it will assure in this manner of the lasting accomplishment of a just peace and the victory of socialism see appendix 11 section 2 end of chapter 12 recording by simi rathod Appendix to Chapter 1 of Ten Days That Shook the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed. Appendix to Chapter 1. 1. Oberonzi. Defenders. All the moderate socialist groups adopted or were given this name because they consented to the continuation of the war under Allied leadership on the ground that it was a war of national defense. The Bolsheviki, the left socialist revolutionaries, the Mensheviki internationalists, Martov's faction, and the Social Democrats internationalists, Gorky's group, were in favor of forcing the Allies to declare democratic war aims and to offer peace to Germany on those terms. 2. Wages and Cost of Living Before and During the Revolution The following tables of wages and costs were compiled, on November 1917, by a joint committee from the Moscow Chamber of Commerce and the Moscow Section of the Ministry of Labor, and published in Novaya Zhizn, October 26, 1917. Wages per day, rubles and kopecks. Trade. Carpenter, cabinet maker. July 1914, 1.6 to 2. July 1916, 4 to 6. August 1917, 8.5. Tarasier. July 1914, 1.3 to 1.5. July 1916, 3 to 3.5. Mason Plasterer, July 1914, 1.7 to 2.35, July 1916, 4 to 6, August 1917, 8. Painter Upholsterer, July 1914, 1.8 to 2.2, July 1916, 3 to 5.5, August 1917, 8. Blacksmith. July 1914, 1 to 2.25, July 1916, 4 to 5, August 1917, 8.5. Chimney Sweep, July 1914, 1.5 to 2, July 1916, 4 to 5.5, August 1917, 7.5. Locksmith, July 1914, 0.9 to 2. July 1916, 3.5 to 6. August 1917, 9. Helper. July 1914, 1 to 1.5. July 1916, 2.5 to 4.5. August 1917, 8. In spite of numerous stories of gigantic advances in wages immediately following the revolution of March 1917, these figures, which were published by the Ministry of Labor as characteristic of conditions all over Russia, show that wages did not rise immediately after the revolution, but little by little. On an average, wages increased slightly more than 500 per cent. But at the same time, the value of the ruble fell to less than one-third its former purchasing power, and the cost of the necessities of life increased enormously. The following table was compiled by the Municipal Duma of Moscow, where food was cheaper and more plentiful than in Petrograd. Cost of food, rubles and kopecks. Black bread. Per fund. August 1914, 2 kopecks and a half. August 1917, 12 kopecks. Percent increase, 330. White bread, per fund. 
August 1914, 5 kopecks. August 1917, 20 kopecks. Percent increase, 300. Beef per fund. August 1914, 22 kopecks. August 1917, 1 ruble, 10 kopecks. Percent increase, 400. Veal per fund. August 1914, 26 kopecks. August 1917, 2 rubles, 15 kopecks. Percent increase, 727. Pork, per fund. August 1914, 23 kopecks. August 1917, 2 rubles. Percent increase, 770. Herring, per fund. August 1914, 6 kopecks. August 1917, 52 kopecks. Percent increase, 767. Cheese, per fund. August 1914, 40 kopecks. August 1917, 3 rubles, 50 kopecks. Percent increase, 754. Butter, per fund. August 1914, 48 kopecks. August 1917, 3 rubles, 20 kopecks. Percent increase, 557. Eggs, per dozen. August 1914, 30 kopecks. August 1917, 1 ruble, 60 kopecks. Percent increase, 443. Milk, per krushka. August 1914, 7 kopecks. August 1917, 40 kopecks. Percent increase, 471. On an average, food increased in price 556%, or 51% more than wages. As for the other necessities, the price of these increased tremendously. The following table was compiled by the economic section of the Moscow Soviet of Workers' Deputies and accepted as correct by the Ministry of Supplies of the Provisional Government. Cost of other necessities, rubles and kopecks. Calico, per arshin. August 1914, 11 kopecks. August 1917, 1 ruble, 40 kopecks. Percent increase, 1,173. Cotton cloth per arshin. August 1914, 15 kopecks. August 1917, 2 rubles. Percent increase, 1,233. Dress goods per arshin. August 1914, 2 rubles. August 1917, 40 rubles. Percent increase, 1,900. Castor cloth per arshin. August 1914, 6 rubles. August 1917, 80 rubles. Percent increase, 1,233. Men's shoes per pair. August 1914, 12 rubles. August 1917, 144 rubles. Percent increase, 1,097. Sole leather per pair. August 1914, 20 rubles. August 1917, 400 rubles. Percent increase, 1,900. Rubbers, per pair. August 1914, 2 rubles, 50 kopecks. August 1917, 15 rubles. Percent increase, 500. Men's clothing, per suit. August 1914, 40 rubles. August 1917, 400 to 455 rubles. Percent increase, 900 to 1,109. T, per fund. August 1914, 4 rubles, 50 kopecks. August 1917, 18 rubles. Percent increase, 300. Matches, per carton. August 1914, 10 kopecks. August 1917, 50 kopecks. Percent increase, 400. Soap, per pood. August 1914, 4 rubles, 50 kopecks. August 1917, 40 rubles. Percent increase, 780. Gasoline, per vedro. August 1914, 1 ruble, 70 kopecks. August 1917, 
11 rubles, percent increase, 547. Candles, per pood, August 1914, 8 rubles, 50 kopecks. August 1917, 100 rubles, percent increase, 1,076. Caramel, per fund, August 1914, 30 kopecks. August 1917, 4 rubles, 50 kopecks, percent increase, 1,400. Firewood, per load. August 1914, 10 rubles. August 1917, 120 rubles, percent increase, 1,100. Charcoal, per load. August 1914, 80 kopecks. August 1917, 13 rubles, percent increase, 1,525. Sundry metalware, August 1914, 1 ruble, August 1917, 20 rubles, percent increase, 1900. On an average, the above categories of necessities increased about 1,109% in price, more than twice the increase of salaries. The difference, of course, went into the pockets of speculators and merchants. In September 1917, when I arrived in Petrograd, the average daily wage of a skilled industrial worker, for example, a steel worker in the Pudilov factory, was about 8 rubles. At the same time, profits were enormous. I was told by one of the owners of the Thornton Woolen Mills, an English concern on the outskirts of Petrograd, that while wages had increased about 300% in his factory, his profits had gone up 900%. 3. The Socialist Ministers The history of the efforts of the socialists in the provisional government of July to realize their program in coalition with the bourgeois ministers is an illuminating example of class struggle in politics. Says Lenin, in explanation of this phenomenon, quote, the capitalists, seeing that the position of the government was untenable, resorted to a method which since 1848 has been for decades practiced by the capitalists in order to befog, divide, and finally overpower the working class. This method is the so-called coalition ministry, composed of bourgeois and of renegades from the socialist camp. In those countries where political freedom and democracy have existed side by side with the revolutionary movement of the workers, for example in England and France, the capitalists make use of this subterfuge, and very successful too. The socialist leaders, upon entering the ministries, invariably prove mere figureheads, puppets, simply a shield for the capitalists, a tool with which to defraud the workers. The democratic and republican capitalists in Russia set in motion this very same scheme. The socialist revolutionaries and Mensheviki fell victim to it, and on June 1st a coalition ministry, with the participation of Chernov, Zaratelli, Skobolev, Avskentiev, Savinkov, Zarudny, and Nikitin, became an accomplished fact. End quote. From Problems of the Revolution. 4. September Municipal Elections in Moscow In the first week of October, 1917, Novaya Zhizn published the following comparative table of election results, pointing out that this meant the bankruptcy of the policy of coalition with the propertied classes. Quote, if civil war can yet be avoided, it can only be done by a united front of all the revolutionary democracy. End quote. Elections for the Moscow Central and Ward Dumas. Socialist Revolutionaries, June 1917, 58 members. September 1917, 14 members. Cadets, June 1917, 17 members. September 1917, 30 members. Mensheviki, June 1917, 12 members. September 1917, 4 members. Bolsheviki, June 1917, 11 members, September 1917, 47 members. 5. Growing Arrogance of the Reactionaries September 18th, 
the cadet Shulgin, writing in a Kiev newspaper, said that the provisional government's declaration that Russia was a republic constituted a gross abuse of its powers. Quote, we cannot admit either a republic or the present republican government, and we are not sure that we want a republic in Russia. End quote. October 23rd. At a meeting of the cadet party held at Ryazan, M. Dukanin declared, quote, On March 1st we must establish a constitutional monarchy. We must not reject the legitimate heir to the throne, Mikhail Alexandrovich. End quote. October 27th. Resolution passed by the Conference of Businessmen at Moscow. Quote, the conference insists that the provisional government take the following immediate measures in the army. 1. Forbidding of all political propaganda, the army must be out of politics. 2. Propaganda of anti-national and international ideas and theories deny the necessity for armies and hurt discipline. It should be forbidden and all propagandists punished. 3. The function of the army committees must be limited to economic questions exclusively. All their decisions should be confirmed by their superior officers, who have the right to dissolve the committees at any time. 4. The salute to be re-established and made obligatory, full re-establishment of disciplinary power in the hands of officers, with right of review of sentence. 5. Expulsion from the corps of officers of those who dishonor it by participating in the movement of the soldier masses, which teaches them disobedience. Re-establishment for this purpose of the courts of honor. 6. The provisional government should take the necessary measures to make possible the return of the army of generals and other officers unjustly discharged under the influence of committees and other irresponsible organizations. End quote. End of Chapter 1 Appendix Appendix to Chapter 2 of Ten Days That Shook the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed Appendix to Chapter 2 1. The Kornilov Revolt is treated in detail in my forthcoming volume, Kornilov to Brest-Litovsk. The responsibility of Kerensky for the situation which gave rise to Kornilov's attempt is now pretty clearly established. Many apologists for Kerensky say that he knew of Kornilov's plans, and by a trick drew him out prematurely, and then crushed him. Even Mr. A. J. Sack, in his book, The Birth of the Russian Democracy, says, quote, Several things are almost certain. The first is that Kerensky knew about the movement of several detachments from the front toward Petrograd, and it is possible that as Prime Minister and Minister of War, realizing the growing Bolshevist danger, he called for them. End quote. The only flaw in that argument is that there was no Bolshevist danger at that time, the Bolsheviki still being a powerless minority in the Soviets, and their leaders in jail or hiding. 2. Democratic Conference When the Democratic Conference was first proposed to Kerensky, he suggested an assembly of all the elements in the nation, the live forces as he called them, including bankers, manufacturers, landowners, and representatives of the cadet party. The Soviet refused and drew up the following table of representation, which Kerensky agreed to. One hundred delegates, all Russian Soviets workers and soldiers deputies. One hundred delegates, all Russian Soviets peasants deputies. Fifty delegates, provincial Soviets workers and soldiers deputies. Fifty delegates, peasants district land committees. One hundred delegates, trade unions. 84 delegates, army committees at the front. 150 delegates, workers and peasants cooperative societies. 20 delegates, railway workers union. 10 delegates, post and telegraph workers union. 20 delegates, commercial clerks. 15 delegates, liberal professions, doctors, lawyers, journalists, etc. 50 delegates, provincial zemstvos. 
59 delegates, nationalist organizations, Poles, Ukrainians, etc. This proportion was altered twice or three times. The final disposition of delegates was, 300 delegates, all Russian Soviets workers, soldiers, and peasants deputies. 300 delegates, cooperative societies. 300 delegates, municipalities. 150 delegates, army committees at the front. 150 delegates, provincial zemstvos. 200 delegates, trade unions. 100 delegates, nationalist organizations. 200 delegates, several small groups. 3. The function of the Soviets is ended. On September 28, 1917, Izviestia, organ of the Zeika, published an article which said, speaking of the last provincial ministry, quote, At last a truly democratic government, born of the will of all classes of the Russian people, the first rough form of the future liberal parliamentary regime, has been formed. Ahead of us is the Constituent Assembly, which will solve all questions of fundamental law, and whose composition will be essentially democratic. The function of the Soviets is at an end, and the time is approaching when they must retire, with the rest of the revolutionary machinery, from the stage of a free and victorious people, whose weapons shall hereafter be the peaceful ones of political action. End quote. The leading article of Izvestia for October 23rd was called The Crisis in the Soviet Organizations. It began by saying that travelers reported a lessening activity of local Soviets everywhere. Quote, this is natural, said the writer, for the people are becoming interested in the more permanent legislative organs, the municipal dumas and the zemstvs. In the important centers of Petrograd and Moscow, where the Soviets are best organized, they did not take in all the democratic elements. The majority of the intellectuals did not participate, and many workers also, some of the workers because they were politically backward, others because the center of gravity for them was in their uns. We cannot deny that these organizations are firmly united with the masses, whose everyday needs are better served by them. That the local democratic administrations are being energetically organized is highly important. The city Dumas are elected by universal suffrage, and in purely local matters have more authority than the Soviets. Not a single Democrat will see anything wrong in this. Elections to the municipalities are being conducted in a better and more democratic way than the elections to the Soviets. All classes are represented in the municipalities, and as soon as the local self-governments begin to organize life in the municipalities, the role of the local Soviets naturally ends. There are two factors in the falling off of interest in the Soviets. The first we may attribute to the lowering of political interest in the masses. The second to the growing effort of political and local governing bodies to organize the building of a new Russia. The more the tendency lies in this latter direction, the sooner disappears the significance of the Soviets. We ourselves are being called the undertakers of our own organization. In reality, we ourselves are the hardest workers in constructing the new Russia. When autocracy and the whole bureaucratic regime fell, we set up the Soviets as a barracks in which all the democracy could find temporary shelter. Now, instead of barracks, we are building the permanent edifice of a new system, and naturally the people will gradually leave the barracks for more comfortable quarters. End quote. 4. Trotsky's Speech at the Council of the Russian Republic. Quote, the purpose of the Democratic Conference, which was called the Tsayika, was to do away with the irresponsible personal government which produced Kornilov, and to establish a responsible government which would be capable of finishing the war and ensure the calling of the Constituent Assembly at the given time. In the meanwhile, behind the back of the Democratic Conference, by trickery, by deals between Citizen Kerensky, the cadets, and the leaders of the Menshevik and Socialist Revolutionary Parties, we received the opposite result from the officially announced purpose. A power was created around which and in which we have open and secret Kornilovs playing leading parts. 
the irresponsibility of the government is officially proclaimed when it is announced that the council of the russian republic is to be a consultative and not a legislative body in the eighth month of the revolution the irresponsible government creates a cover for itself in this new edition of Beligan's duma the propertied classes have entered this provision council in a proportion which clearly shows from elections all over the country that many of them have no right here whatsoever in spite of that the cadet party which until yesterday wanted the provisional government to be responsible to the state duma this same cadet party secured the independence assembly the propertied classes will no doubt have as favorable position than they have in this council and they will not be able to be irresponsible to the constituent assembly if the propertied classes were really getting ready for the constituent assembly six weeks from now there would be no reason for establishing the irresponsibility of the government at this time the whole truth is that the bourgeoisie who directs the policies of the provisional government has for its aim to break the constituent assembly at present this is the main purpose of the propertied classes which control our entire national policy external and internal in the industrial agrarian and supply departments the politics of the propertied classes acting with the government increases the natural disorganization caused by the war the propertied classes which are provoking a peasant's revolt the propertied classes which are provoking civil war and openly hold their course on the bony hand of hunger with which they intend to overthrow the revolution and finish with the constituent assembly no less criminal also is the international policy of the bourgeoisie and its government after forty months of war the capital is threatened with mortal danger in reply to this arises a plan to move the government to moscow the idea of abandoning the capital does not stir the indignation of the bourgeoisie just the opposite it is accepted as a natural part of the general policy designed to promote counter-revolutionary conspiracy instead of recognizing that the salvation of the country lies in concluding peace instead of throwing openly the idea of immediate peace to all the worn-out peoples over the heads of diplomats and imperialists and making the continuation of the war impossible the provisional government by the order of the cadets the counter-revolutionists and the allied imperialists without sense without purpose and without a plan continues to drag on the murderous war sentencing to useless death new hundreds of thousands of soldiers and sailors and preparing to give up petrograd and to wreck the revolution at a time when bolshevik soldiers and sailors are dying with other soldiers and sailors as a result of the mistakes and crimes of others the so-called supreme commander kerensky continues to suppress the bolshevik press the leading parties of the council are acting as a voluntary cover for these policies we the faction of the social democrats bolsheviki announce that with this government of treason to the people we have nothing in common we have nothing in common with the work of these murderers of the people which goes on behind official curtains we refuse either directly or indirectly to cover up one day of this work while wilhelm's troops are threatening petrograd the government of kerensky and kornilov is preparing to run away from petrograd and turn moscow into a base of counter-revolution we warn the moscow workers and soldiers to be on their guard leaving this council we appeal to the manhood and wisdom of the workers peasants and soldiers of all russia petrograd is in danger the revolution is in danger the government has increased the danger the ruling classes intensify it only the people themselves can save themselves and the country we appeal to the people long live immediate honest democratic peace all power to the soviets all land to the people long live the constituent assembly End quote. five the nakaz to skobeliev resume passed by the tsayika and given to skobeliev as an instruction for the representative of the russian revolutionary democracy at the paris conference the peace treaty must be based on the principle 
no annexations, no indemnities, the right of self-determination of peoples. Territorial Problems 1. Evacuation of German troops from invaded Russia, full right of self-determination to Poland, Lithuania, and Livonia. 2. For Turkish-Armenia autonomy, and later complete self-determination, as soon as local governments are established. 3. The question of alsace lorraine to be solved by a plebiscite after the withdrawal of all foreign troops. 4. Belgium to be restored, compensation for damages from an international fund. 5. Serbia and Montenegro to be restored and aided by an international relief fund. Serbia to have an outlet on the Adriatic. Bosnia and Herzegovina to be autonomous. 6 the disputed provinces in the Balkans to have provisional autonomy, followed by a plebiscite. 7. Romania to be restored, but forced to give complete self-determination to the Dobruja. Romania must be forced to execute the clauses of the Berlin Treaty concerning the Jews, and recognize them as Romanian citizens. 8. In Italia Irredenta, a provisional autonomy, followed by a plebiscite to determine state independence. 9. The German colonies to be returned. 10. Greece and Persia to be restored. Freedom of the seas. All straits opening into inland seas, as well as the Suez and Panama canals, are to be neutralized. Commercial shipping to be free. The right of privateering to be abolished the torpedoing of commercial ships to be forbidden. Indemnities. All combatants to renounce demands for any indemnities, either direct or indirect, as, for instance, charges for the maintenance of prisoners. Indemnities and contributions collected during the war must be refunded. Economic terms. Commercial treaties are not to be a part of the peace terms. Every country must be independent in its commercial relations, and must not be obliged to, or prevented from, concluding an economic treaty by the treaty of peace. Nevertheless, all nations should bind themselves by the peace treaty not to practice an economic blockade after the war, nor to form separate tariff agreements. The right of most favored nation must be given to all countries without distinction. Guarantees of Peace Peace is to be concluded at the peace conference by delegates elected by the national representative institutions of each country. The peace terms are to be confirmed by these parliaments. Secret diplomacy is to be abolished. All parties are to bind themselves not to conclude any secret treaties. Such treaties are declared in contradiction to international law and void. All treaties, until confirmed by the parliaments of the different nations, are to be considered void. Gradual disarmament both on land and sea, and the establishment of a militia system. The League of Nations, advanced by President Wilson, may become a valuable aid to international law, provided that a. all nations are to be obliged to participate in it with equal rights, and b. international politics are to be democratized. Ways to Peace. The Allies are to announce immediately that they are willing to open peace negotiations as soon as the enemy powers declare their consent to the renunciation of all forcible annexations. The Allies must bind themselves not to begin any peace negotiations, nor to conclude peace, except in a general peace conference with the participation of delegates from all the neutral countries. All obstacles to the Stockholm Socialist Conference are to be removed, and passports are to be given immediately to all delegates of parties and organizations who wish to participate. The Executive Committee of the Peasants' Soviets also issued a nakaz, which differs little from the above. 6. Peace at Russia's Expense the rebut revelations of Austria's peace offer to France, the so-called peace conference at Bern, Switzerland, during the summer of 1917, in which delegates participated from all belligerent countries, representing large financial interests in all these countries, and the attempted negotiations of an English agent with a Bulgarian church dignitary, all pointed to the fact that there were strong currents on both sides favorable to patching up a peace at the expense of Russia. 
In my next book, Kornilov to Brest-Litovsk, I intend to treat this matter at some length, publishing several secret documents discovered in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at Petrograd. 7. Russian Soldiers in France Official Report of the Provisional Government Quote, from the time the news of the Russian Revolution reached Paris, Russian newspapers of extreme tendencies immediately began to appear, and these newspapers, as well as individuals, freely circulated among the soldier masses and began a Bolshevik propaganda, often spreading false news which appeared in the French journals. In the absence of all official news and of precise details, this campaign provoked discontent among the soldiers. The result was a desire to return to Russia, and a hatred toward the officers. Finally, it all turned into rebellion. In one of their meetings, the soldiers issued an appeal to refuse to drill, since they had decided to fight no more. It was decided to isolate the rebels, and General Zankievich ordered all soldiers loyal to the provisional government to leave the camp of Courtine, and to carry with them all ammunition. On June 25th, the order was executed. There remained in the camp only the soldiers who said they would submit conditionally to the provisional government. The soldiers at the camp of Kurtin received several times the visit of the commander-in-chief of the Russian armies abroad, of Rapp, the commissar of the Ministry of War, and of several distinguished former exiles who wished to influence them, but these attempts were unsuccessful, and finally Commissar Rapp insisted that the rebels lay down their arms, and, in sign of submission, march in good order to a place called Clairvaux. The order was only partially obeyed. First five hundred men went out, of whom twenty-two were arrested. Twenty-four hours later, about six thousand followed. About two thousand remained. It was decided to increase the pressure. Their rations were diminished, their pay was cut off, and the roads toward the village of Courtine were guarded by French soldiers. General Zankievich, having discovered that a Russian artillery brigade was passing through France, decided to form a mixed detachment of infantry and artillery to reduce the rebels. A deputation was sent to the rebels. The deputation returned several hours later, convinced of the futility of the negotiations. On September 1st, General Zankievich sent an ultimatum to the rebels, demanding that they lay down their arms, and menacing in case of refusal to open fire with artillery if the order was not obeyed by September 3rd at ten o'clock. The order not being executed, a light fire of artillery was opened on the place at the hour agreed upon. Eighteen shells were fired, and the rebels were warned that the bombardment would become more intense. In the night of September 3rd, 160 men surrendered. September 4th, the artillery bombardment recommenced, and at 11 o'clock, after 36 shells had been fired, the rebels raised two white flags and began to leave the camp without arms. By evening, 8,300 men had surrendered. 150 soldiers who remained in the camp opened fire with machine guns that night the 5th of September, to make an end of the affair, a heavy barrage was laid on the camp, and our soldiers occupied it little by little. The rebels kept up a heavy fire with their machine guns. September 6th, at nine o'clock, the camp was entirely occupied. After the disarmament of the rebels, 81 arrests were made. End quote. Thus the report. From secret documents discovered in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, however, we know that the account is not strictly accurate. The first trouble arose when the soldiers tried to form committees, as their comrades in Russia were doing. They demanded to be sent back to Russia, which was refused, and then, being considered a dangerous influence in France, they were ordered to Salonika. They refused to go, and the battle followed. It was discovered that they had been left in camp without officers for about two months, and badly treated, before they became rebellious. All attempts to find out the name of the Russian artillery brigade, which had fired on them, were futile. The telegrams discovered in the ministry left it to be inferred that French artillery was used. After their surrender, more than two hundred of the mutineers were shot in cold blood. 8. Tereschenko's speech, resume. 
The questions of foreign policy are closely related to those of national defense, and so, if in questions of national defense you think it is necessary to hold session in secret, also in our foreign policy we are sometimes forced to observe the same secrecy. German diplomacy attempts to influence public opinion, therefore the declarations of directors of great democratic organizations who talk loudly of a revolutionary congress and the impossibility of another winter campaign are dangerous. All these declarations cost human lives. I wish to speak merely of governmental logic, without touching the questions of the honor and dignity of the state. From the point of view of logic, the foreign policy of Russia ought to be based on a real comprehension of the interests of Russia. These interests mean that it is impossible that our country remain alone, and that the present alignment of forces with us, the Allies, is satisfactory. All humanity longs for peace, but in Russia no one will permit a humiliating peace which would violate the state interests of our fatherland. End quote. The orator pointed out that such a peace would for long years, if not for centuries, retard the triumph of democratic principles in the world, and would inevitably cause new wars. Quote, I'll remember the days of May, when the fraternization on our front threatened to end the war by a simple cessation of military operations, and lead the country to a shameful separate peace and what efforts it was necessary to use to make the soldier masses at the front understand that it was not by this method that the Russian state must end the war and guarantee its interest. End quote. He spoke of the miraculous effect of the July offensive, what strength it gave to the words of Russian ambassadors abroad, and the despair of Germany caused by the Russian victories, and also the disillusionment in allied countries which followed the Russian defeat. Quote, as to the Russian government, it adhered strictly to the formula of May, no annexations and no punitive indemnities. We consider it essential not only to proclaim the self-determination of peoples, but also to renounce imperialist aims. Germany is continually trying to make peace. The only talk in Germany is of peace. She knows she cannot win. I reject the reproaches aimed at the government which allege that Russian foreign policy does not speak clearly enough about the aims of the war. If the question arises as to what ends the Allies are pursuing, it is indispensable first to demand what aims the central powers have agreed upon. The desire is often heard that we publish the details of the treaties which bind the Allies, but people forget that, up to now, we do not know the treaties which bind the central powers. End quote. Germany, he said, evidently wants to separate Russia from the West by a series of weak buffer states. Quote, this tendency to strike at the vital interests of Russia must be checked. And will the Russian democracy, which has inscribed on its banner the rights of nations to dispose of themselves, allow calmly the continuation of oppression upon the most civilized peoples in Austria-Hungary? Those who fear that the Allies will try to profit by our difficult situation, to make us support more than our share of the burden of war, and to solve the questions of peace at our expense, are entirely mistaken. Our enemy looks upon Russia as a market for its products. The end of the war will leave us in a feeble condition, and with our frontier open, the flood of German products can easily hold back for years our industrial development. Measures must be taken to guard against this. I say openly and frankly, the combination of forces which unites us to the Allies is favorable to the interests of Russia. It is therefore important that our views on the questions of war and peace shall be in accord with the views of the Allies as clearly and precisely as possible. To avoid all misunderstanding, I must say frankly that Russia must present at the Paris conference one point of view. End quote. He did not want to comment on the Nakaz to Skobeliev, but he referred to the manifesto of the Dutch Scandinavian Committee, just published in Stockholm. This manifesto declared for the autonomy of Lithuania and Livonia. But that is clearly impossible, said Tereschenko. Quote, for Russia must have free ports on the Baltic all the year round. 
In this question, the problems of foreign policy are also closely related to interior politics, for if there existed a strong sentiment of unity of all great Russia, one would not witness the repeated manifestations everywhere of a desire of peoples to separate from the central government. Such separations are contrary to the interests of Russia, and the Russian delegates cannot raise the issue. End quote. 9. The British Fleet, etc. At the time of the naval battle of the Gulf of Riga, not only the Bolsheviki, but also the ministers of the provisional government, considered that the British fleet had deliberately abandoned the Baltic as one indication of the attitude so often expressed publicly by the British press and semi-publicly by British representatives in Russia. Quote, Russia's finished, no use bothering about Russia. End quote. See interview with Kerensky, Appendix 13. General Gurko was a former chief of staff of the Russian armies under the Tsar. He was a prominent figure in the corrupt imperial court. After the revolution, he was one of the very few persons exiled for his political and personal record. The Russian naval defeat in the Gulf of Riga coincided with the public reception, by King George in London, of General Gurko, a man whom the Russian provisional government considered dangerously pro-German as well as reactionary. 10. Appeals Against Insurrection To Workers and Soldiers Comrades, the dark forces are increasingly trying to call forth in Petrograd and other towns disorders and pogroms. Disorder is necessary to the dark forces, for disorder will give them an opportunity for crushing the revolutionary movement in blood. Under the pretext of establishing order and of protecting the inhabitants, they hope to establish the domination of Kornilov, which the revolutionary people succeeded in suppressing not long ago. Woe to the people if these hopes are realized. The triumphant counter-revolution will destroy the Soviets and the army committees, will disperse the constituent assembly, will stop the transfer of the land to the land committees, will put an end to all the hopes of the people for a speedy peace, and will fill all the prisons with revolutionary soldiers and workers. In their calculations, the counter-revolutionists and Black Hundred leaders are counting on the serious discontent of the unenlightened part of the people with the disorganization of the food supply, the continuation of the war, and the general difficulties of life. They hope to transform every demonstration of soldiers and workers into a pogrom, which will frighten the peaceful population and throw it into the arms of the restorers of law and order." Under such conditions, every attempt to organize a demonstration in these days, although for the most laudable object, would be a crime. All conscious workers and soldiers who are displeased with the policy of the government will only bring injury to themselves and to the revolution if they indulge in demonstrations. Therefore, the Saika asks all workers not to obey any calls to demonstrate. Workers and soldiers, do not yield to provocation. Remember your duty to your country and to the revolution. Do not break the unity of the revolutionary front by demonstrations which are bound to be unsuccessful. The Central Executive Committee of the Soviets of Workers and Soldiers Deputies, Tsaika. Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, The Danger is Near, To All Workers and Soldiers, Read and Hand to Others. Comrades, workers, and soldiers, our country is in danger. On account of this danger, our freedom and our revolution are passing through difficult days. The enemy is at the gates of Petrograd. The disorganization is growing with every hour. It becomes more and more difficult to obtain bread for Petrograd. All, of from the smallest to the greatest, must redouble their efforts, must endeavor to arrange things properly." We must save our country, save freedom. More arms and provisions for the army, bread for the great cities, order and organization in the country. And in these terrible critical days, rumors creep about that somewhere a demonstration is being prepared, that someone is calling on the soldiers and workers to destroy revolutionary peace and order. Rabachi Put, the newspaper of the Bolsheviki, is pouring oil on the flames. 
it flattering, trying to please the unenlightened people, tempting the worker and soldiers, urging them on against the government, promising them mountains of good things. The confiding ignorant men believe, they do not reason, and from the other side come also rumors, rumors that the dark forces, the friends of the Tsar, the German spies, are rubbing their hands with glee. They are ready to join the Bolsheviki, and with them fan the disorders into civil war. The Bolsheviki and the ignorant workers and soldiers seduced by them cry senselessly, Down with the government, all power to the Soviets! And the dark servants of the Tsar and the spies of Wilhelm will egg them on. Beat the Jews, beat the shopkeepers, rob the markets, devastate the shops, pillage the wine stores, slay, burn, rob! and then will begin a terrible confusion, a war between one part of the people and the other. All will become still more disorganized, and perhaps once more blood will be shed on the streets of the capital. And then, what then? Then the road to Petrograd will be open to Wilhelm. Then no bread will come to Petrograd. The children will die of hunger. Then the army at the front will remain without support, our brothers in the trenches will be delivered to the fire of the enemy. Then Russia will lose all prestige in other countries, our money will lose its value, everything will be so dear as to make life impossible. Then the long-awaited constituent assembly will be postponed, it will be impossible to convene it in time. And then death to the revolution, death to our liberty. Is it this that you want, workers and soldiers? No. If you do not, then go, go to the ignorant people seduced by the betrayers, and tell them the whole truth which we have told you. Let all know that every man who in these terrible days calls on you to come out in the streets against the government is either a secret servant of the Tsar, a provocator, or an unwise assistant of the enemies of the people, or a paid spy of Wilhelm. Every conscious worker revolutionist, every conscious peasant, every revolutionary soldier, all who understand what harm a demonstration or a revolt against the government might cause to the people, must join together and not allow the enemies of the people to destroy our freedom. The Petrograd Electoral Committee of the Mensheviki Oberansi 11. Lenin's Letter to the Comrades this series of articles appeared in the Rabochi Put several days running, at the end of October and beginning of November, 1917. I give here only extracts from two installments. 1. Kamaniev and Ryazanov say that we have not a majority among the people, and that without a majority insurrection is hopeless. Answer. People capable of speaking such things are falsifiers, pedants, or simply don't want to look the real situation in the face. In the last elections, we received in all the country more than 50% of all the votes. The most important thing in Russia today is the peasants' revolution. In Tambov government, there has been a real agrarian uprising with wonderful political results. Even Dielo Naroda has been scared into yelling that the land must be turned over to the peasants, and not only the socialist revolutionaries in the Council of the Republic, but also the government itself has been similarly affected. Another valuable result was the bringing of bread which had been hoarded by the Pamietschiki to the railroad stations in that province. The Ruskaya Volia had to admit that the stations were filled with bread after the peasants' rising. 2. We are not sufficiently strong to take over the government, and the bourgeoisie is not sufficiently strong to prevent the constituent assembly. Answer. This is nothing but timidity, expressed by pessimism as regards workers and soldiers, and optimism as regards the failure of the bourgeoisie. If Yunkers and Cossacks say they will fight, you believe them. If workmen and soldiers say so, you doubt it. What is the distinction between such doubts and siding politically with the bourgeoisie? Kornilov proved that the Soviets were really a power. To believe Kerensky and the Council of the Republic, if the bourgeoisie is not strong enough to break the Soviets, it is not strong enough to break the constituent. But that is wrong. 
the bourgeoisie will break the constituent by sabotage by lockouts by giving up petrograd by opening the front to the germans this has already been done in the case of riga three the soviets must remain a revolver at the head of the government to force the calling of the constituent assembly and to repress any further kornilov attempts answer refusal of insurrection is refusal of all power to the soviets since september the bolshevik party has been discussing the question of insurrection refusing to rise means to trust our hopes in the faith of the good bourgeoisie who have promised to call the constituent assembly when the soviets have all the power the calling of the constituent is guaranteed and its success assured refusal of insurrection means surrender to the lieber dons either we must drop all power to the soviets or make an insurrection there is no middle course four the bourgeoisie cannot give up petrograd although the rodziankos want it because it is not the bourgeoisie who are fighting but our heroic soldiers and sailors answer this did not prevent two admirals from running away at the moonsund battle the staff has not changed it is composed of kornilovtsi if the staff with kerensky at its head wants to give up petrograd it can do it doubly or trebly it can make arrangements with the germans or the british open the fronts it can sabotage the army's food supply at all these doors has it knocked we have no right to wait until the bourgeoisie chokes the revolution rodzianko is a man of action who has faithfully and truthfully served the bourgeoisie for years half the labor dons are cowardly compromisers half of them simple fatalists five we are getting stronger every day we shall be able to enter the constituent assembly as a strong opposition then why should we play everything on one card answer this is the argument of a sophomore with no practical experience who reads that the constituent assembly is being called and trustfully accepts the legal and constitutional way even the voting of the constituent assembly will not do away with hunger or beat wilhelm the issue of hunger and of surrendering petrograd cannot be decided by waiting for the constituent assembly hunger is not waiting the peasants revolution is not waiting the admirals who ran away did not wait blind people are surprised that hungry people betrayed by admirals and generals do not take an interest in voting six if the kornilovtsi make an attempt we would show them our strength but why should we risk everything by making an attempt ourselves answer history doesn't repeat perhaps kornilov will some day make an attempt what a serious base for proletarian action but suppose kornilov waits for starvation for the opening of the fronts what then this attitude means to build the tactics of a revolutionary party on one of the bourgeoisie's former mistakes let us forget everything except that there is no way out but by the dictatorship of the proletariat either that or the dictatorship of kornilov let us wait comrades for a miracle twelve milyakov's speech resume Quote, everyone admits it seems that the defense of the country is our principal task and that to assure it we must have discipline in the army and order in the rear to achieve this there must be a power capable of daring not only by persuasion but also by force the germ of all our evils comes from the point of view original truly russian concerning foreign policy which passes for the internationalist point of view the noble lenin only imitates the noble kiroyevsky when he holds that from russia will come the new world which shall resuscitate the aged west and which will replace the old banner of doctrinary socialism by the new direct action of starving masses and that will push humanity forward and force it to break in the doors of the social paradise these men sincerely believed that the decomposition of russia would bring about the decomposition of the whole capitalist regime starting from that point of view they were able to commit the unconscious treason in war time of calmly telling the soldiers to abandon the trenches and instead of fighting the external enemy creating internal civil war and attacking the proprietors and capitalists End quote. 
here Milyukov was interrupted by furious cries from the left, demanding what socialist had ever advised such action. Quote, Martov says that only the revolutionary pressure of the proletariat can condemn and conquer the evil will of imperialist cliques and break down the dictatorship of these cliques. Not by an accord between governments for a limitation of armaments, but by the disarming of these governments and the radical democratization of the military system. End quote. He attacked Martov viciously and then turned on the Mensheviki and socialist revolutionaries, whom he accused of entering the government as ministers with the avowed purpose of carrying on the class struggle. Quote, the socialists of Germany and of the Allied countries contemplated these gentlemen with ill-concealed contempt, but they decided that it was for Russia, and sent us some apostles of the universal conflagration. The formula of our democracy is very simple. No foreign policy, no art of diplomacy, an immediate democratic peace, a declaration to the Allies, we want nothing, we haven't anything to fight with and then our adversaries will make the same declaration, and the brotherhood of peoples will be accomplished. Milyukov took a fling at the Zimmerwald Manifesto, and declared that even Kerensky has not been able to escape the influence of quote, that unhappy document which will forever be your indictment. End quote. He then attacked Skobeliev, whose position in foreign assemblies, where he would appear as a Russian delegate, yet opposed to the foreign policy of his government, would be so strange that people would say, What's that gentleman carrying, and what shall we talk to him about? As for the Nakaz, Milyukov said that he himself was a pacifist, that he believed in the creation of an international arbitration board, and the necessity for a limitation of armaments, and parliamentary control over secret diplomacy, which did not mean the abolition of secret diplomacy. As for the socialist ideas in the Nakaz, which he called Stockholm ideas, peace without victory, the right of self-determination of peoples, and renunciation of the economic war, quote, the German successes are directly proportionate to the successes of those who call themselves the revolutionary democracy. I do not wish to say, to the successes of the revolution, because I believe that the defeats of the revolutionary democracy are victories for the revolution. The influence of the Soviet leaders abroad is not unimportant. One had only to listen to the speech of the Minister of Foreign Affairs to be convinced that, in this hall, the influence of the revolutionary democracy on foreign policy is so strong that the minister does not dare to speak face to face with it about the honor and dignity of Russia. We can see, in the Nakaz of the Soviets, that the ideas of the Stockholm Manifesto have been elaborated in two directions, that of utopianism and that of German interests. End quote. Interrupted by the angry cries of the left and rebuked by the president, Milyukov insisted that the proposition of peace concluded by popular assemblies, not by diplomats, and the proposal to undertake peace negotiations as soon as the enemy had renounced annexations, were pro-German. Recently Kuhlman said that a personal declaration bound only him who made it. Quote, anyway, we will imitate the Germans before we will imitate the Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies. End quote. The sections treating of the independence of Lithuania and Livonia were symptoms of nationalist agitation in different parts of Russia, supported, said Milyukov, by German money. Amid bedlam from the left, he contrasted the clauses of the Nakaz concerning alsace Lorraine, Romania, and Serbia with those treating of the nationalities in Germany and Austria. The Nakaz embraced the German and Austrian point of view, said Milyukov. Passing to Tereschenko's speech, he contemptuously accused him of being afraid to speak the thought in his mind, and even afraid to think in terms of the greatness of Russia. The Dardanelles must belong to Russia. Quote, you are continually saying that the soldier does not know why he is fighting, and that when he does know, he'll fight. It is true that the soldier doesn't know why he is fighting, but now you have told him that there is no reason for him to fight, that we have no national interests, and that we are fighting for alien ends. End quote. Paying tribute to the Allies, 
who, he said, with the assistance of America, quote, will yet save the cause of humanity, he ended, quote, long live the light of humanity, the advanced democracies of the West, who for a long time have been travelling the way we now only begin to enter, with ill-assured and hesitating steps. Long live our brave allies. End quote. 13. Interview with Kerensky. The Associated Press man tried his hand. Mr. Kerensky, he began, in England and France people are disappointed with the revolution. Yes, I know, interrupted Kerensky quizzically. Abroad the revolution is no longer fashionable. What is your explanation of why the Russians have stopped fighting? That is a foolish question to ask. Kerensky was annoyed. Russia entered the war first of all the Allies, and for a long time she bore the whole brunt of it. Her losses have been inconceivably greater than those of all the other nations put together. Russia has now the right to demand of the Allies that they bring greater force of arms to bear. End quote. He stopped for a moment and stared at his interlocutor. Quote, you are asking why the Russians have stopped fighting, and the Russians are asking where is the British fleet, with German battleships in the Gulf of Riga? Again he ceased suddenly, and as suddenly burst out. The Russian Revolution hasn't failed, and the Revolutionary Army hasn't failed. It is not the Revolution which caused disorganization in the Army. That disorganization was accomplished years ago by the old regime. Why aren't the Russians fighting? I will tell you because the masses of the people are economically exhausted, and because they are disillusioned with the Allies. End quote. The interview of which this is an excerpt was cabled to the United States, and in a few days sent back by the American State Department with a demand that it be altered. This Kerensky refused to do, but it was done by his secretary, Dr. David Soskis, and, thus purged of all offensive references to the Allies, was given to the press of the world. End of chapter 2 Appendix Appendix to chapters 3 and 4 of Ten Days That Shook the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed. Appendix to Chapter 3. 1. Resolution of the Factory Shop Committees. Workers' Control. 1. See page 43. 2. The organization of workers' control is a manifestation of the same healthy activity in the sphere of industrial production as our party organizations in the sphere of politics, trade unions in employment, cooperatives in the domain of consumption, and literary clubs in the sphere of culture. 3. The working class has much more interest in the proper and uninterrupted operation of factories than the capitalist class. Workers' control is a better security in this respect for the interests of modern society, of the whole people, than the arbitrary will of the owners, who are guided only by their selfish desire for material profits or political privileges. Therefore, workers' control is demanded by the proletariat not only in their own interest, but in the interest of the whole country, and should be supported by the revolutionary peasantry as well as the revolutionary army. 4. Considering the hostile attitude of the majority of the capitalist class toward the revolution, experience shows that proper distribution of raw materials and fuel, as well as the most efficient management of factories, is impossible without workers' control. 5. Only workers' control over capitalist enterprises, cultivating the workers' conscious attitude toward work and making clear its social meaning, can create conditions favorable to the development of a firm self-discipline in labor, and the development of all labor's possible productivity. 6. The impending transformation of industry from a war to a peace basis and the redistribution of labor all over the country, as well as among the different factories, 
can be accomplished without great disturbances only by means of the democratic self-government of the workers themselves. Therefore, the realization of workers' control is an indispensable preliminary to the demobilization of industry. 7. In accordance with the slogan proclaimed by the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, Bolsheviki, workers' control on a national scale, in order to bring results, must extend to all capitalist concerns, and not be organized accidentally, without system. It must be well planned, and not separated from the industrial life of the country as a whole. 8. The economic life of the country, agriculture, industry, commerce, and transport, must be subjected to one unified plan, constructed so as to satisfy the individual and social requirements of the wide masses of the people, it must be approved by their elected representatives and carried out under the direction of these representatives by means of national and local organizations. 9. That part of the plan which deals with hand labor must be carried out under supervision of the peasants and land workers' organizations, that relating to industry, trade, and transport operated by wage earners by means of workers' control. The natural organs of workers' control inside the industrial plant will be the factory shop and similar committees, and in the labor market, the trade unions. 10. The collective wage agreements arranged by the trade unions for the majority of workers in any branch of labor must be binding on all the owners of plants employing this kind of labor in the given district. 11. Employment bureaus must be placed under the control and management of the trade unions, as class organizations acting within the limits of the whole industrial plan and in accordance with it. 12. Trade unions must have the right, upon their own initiative, to begin legal action against all employers who violate labor contracts or labor legislation, and also in behalf of any individual worker in any branch of labor. 13. On all questions relating to workers' control over production, distribution, and employment, the trade unions must confer with the workers of individual establishments through their factory shop committees. 14. Matters of employment and discharge, vacations, wage scales, refusal of work, degree of productivity and skill, reasons for abrogating agreements, disputes with the administration, and similar problems of the internal life of the factory, must be settled exclusively according to the findings of the factory shop committee, which has the right to exclude from participation in the discussion any members of the factory administration. 15. The factory shop committee forms a commission to control the supplying of the factory with raw materials, fuel, orders, labor power and technical staff, including equipment, and all other supplies and arrangements, and also to assure the factory's adherence to the general industrial plan. The factory administration is obliged to surrender to the organs of workers' control, for their aid and information, all data concerning the business to make it possible to verify this data and to produce the books of the company upon demand of the factory shop committee. 16. Any illegal acts on the part of the administration discovered by the factory shop committees, or any suspicion of such illegal acts which cannot be investigated or remedied by the workers alone, shall be referred to the district central organization of factory shop committees charged with the particular branch of labor involved, which shall discuss the matter with the institutions charged with the execution of the general industrial plan, and find means to deal with the matter, even to the extent of confiscating the factory. 17. The union of the factory shop committees of different concerns must be accomplished on the basis of the different trades, in order to facilitate control over the whole branch of industry, so as to come within the general industrial plan, and so as to create an effective plan of distribution among the different factories of orders, raw materials, fuel, technical, and labor power, and also to facilitate cooperation with the trade unions, which are organized by trades. 18. 
the central city councils of trade unions and factory shop committees represent the proletariat in the corresponding provincial and local institutions formed to elaborate and carry out the general industrial plan and to organize economic relations between the towns and the villages workers and peasants they also possess final authority for the management of factory shop committees and trade unions so far as workers control in their district is concerned and they shall issue obligatory regulations concerning workers discipline in the routine of production which regulations however must be approved by vote of the workers themselves two the bourgeois press on the bolsheviki ruskaya volia october twenty eight quote, the decisive moment approaches it is decisive for the bolsheviki either they will give us a second edition of the events of july sixteen to eighteen or they will have to admit that with their plans and intentions with their impertinent policy of wishing to separate themselves from everything consciously national they have been definitely defeated what are the chances of bolshevik success it is difficult to answer that question for their principal support is the ignorance of the popular masses they speculate on it they work upon it by a demagogy which nothing can stop the government must play its part in this affair supporting itself morally by the council of the republic the government must take a clearly defined attitude toward the bolsheviki and if the bolsheviki provoke an insurrection against the legal power and thus facilitate the german invasion they must be treated as mutineers and traitors End quote. Brzevia via Damasti, October 28. Quote, now that the Bolsheviki have separated themselves from the rest of the democracy, the struggle against them is very much simpler, and it is not reasonable, in order to fight against Bolshevism, to wait until they make a manifestation. The government should not even allow the manifestation. The appeals of the Bolsheviki to insurrection and anarchy are acts punishable by the criminal courts, and in the freest countries their authors would receive severe sentences. For what the Bolsheviki are carrying on is not a political struggle against the government or even for the power. It is propaganda for anarchy, massacres, and civil war. This propaganda must be extirpated at its roots. It would be strange to wait, in order to begin action against an agitation for pogroms, until the pogroms actually occurred. End quote. Novoye Vremya, November 1. Quote, Why is the government excited only about November 2nd, date of calling the Congress of Soviets, and not about September 12th or October 3rd? This is not the first time that Russia burns and falls in ruins, and that the smoke of the terrible conflagration makes the eyes of our allies smart. Since it came to power, has there been a single order issued by the government for the purpose of halting anarchy, or has anyone attempted to put out the Russian conflagration? There were other things to do. The government turned its attention to a more immediate problem. It crushed an insurrection, the Kornilov attempt, concerning which everyone is now asking, did it ever exist? End quote. 3. Moderate Socialist Press on the Bolsheviki. Dielo Naroda, October 28, Socialist Revolutionary. Quote, the most frightful crime of the Bolsheviki against the revolution is that they impute exclusively to the bad intentions of the revolutionary government all the calamities which the masses are so cruelly suffering, when as a matter of fact these calamities sprung from objective causes. They make golden promises to the masses, knowing in advance that they can fulfill none of them. They lead the masses on a false trail, deceiving them as to the source of all their troubles. The Bolsheviki are the most dangerous enemies of the revolution. End quote. Dn, October 30, Menshevik. Quote, Is this really the freedom of the press? Every day Novaya Rus and Rabachi Put openly incite to insurrection. Every day these two papers commit in their columns actual crimes. Every day they urge pogroms. Is that the freedom of the press? 
the government ought to defend itself and defend us. We have the right to insist that the government machinery does not remain passive while the threat of bloody riots endangers the lives of its citizens. End quote. 4. Yadinstvo. Plekhanov's paper Yadinstvo suspended publication a few weeks after the Bolsheviki seized the power. Contrary to popular report, Yadinstvo was not suppressed by the Soviet government. An announcement in the last number admitted that it was unable to continue because there were too few subscribers. 5. Were the Bolsheviki conspirators? The French newspaper Entente of Petrograd, on November 15th, published an article of which the following is a part. Quote, the government of Kerensky discusses and hesitates. The government of Lenin and Trotsky attacks and acts. This last is called a government of conspirators, but that is wrong. Government of usurpers, yes, like all revolutionary governments which triumph over their adversaries. Conspirators, no. No, they did not conspire. On the contrary, openly, audaciously, without mincing words, without dissimulating their intentions, they multiplied their agitation, intensified their propaganda in the factories, the barracks, at the front, in the country, everywhere, even fixing in advance the date of their taking up arms, the date of their seizure of the power. They, conspirators? Never. End quote. 6. Appeal Against Insurrection from the Central Army Committee quote, Above everything we insist upon the inflexible execution of the organized will of the majority of the people, expressed by the provisional government in accord with the Council of the Republic and the Seika, as organ of the popular power. Any demonstration to depose this power by violence, at a moment when a government crisis will infallibly create disorganization, the ruin of the country, and civil war, will be considered by the army as a counter-revolutionary act, and repressed by force of arms. The interests of private groups and classes should be submitted to a single interest, that of augmenting industrial production and distributing the necessities of life with fairness. All who are capable of sabotage, disorganization, or disorder, all deserters, all slackers, all looters, should be forced to do auxiliary service in the rear of the army. We invite the provisional government to form, out of these violators of the people's will, these enemies of the revolution, labor detachments to work in the rear, on the front, in the trenches under enemy fire. End quote. 7. Events of the Night, November 6th. Toward evening, bands of Red Guards began to occupy the printing shops of the bourgeois press, where they printed Rabochi Put, Soldat, and various proclamations by the hundred thousand. The city militia was ordered to clear these places, but found the offices barricaded and armed men defending them. Soldiers who were ordered to attack the print shops refused. About midnight, a colonel with a company of Yunkers arrived at the club, free mind, with a warrant to arrest the editor of Rabochi Put. Immediately an enormous mob gathered in the street outside and threatened to lynch the Yunkers. The colonel thereupon begged that he and the Yunkers be arrested and taken to Peter Paul prison for safety. This request was granted. At 1 a.m. a detachment of soldiers and sailors from Smolny occupied the telegraph agency. At 1.35 the post office was occupied. Toward morning the military hotel was taken, and at 5 o'clock the telephone exchange. At dawn the state bank was surrounded, and at 10 a.m. a cordon of troops was drawn about the Winter Palace. Appendix to Chapter 4 1. Events of November 7th. From 4 a.m. until dawn, Kerensky remained at the Petrograd staff headquarters, sending orders to the Cossacks and to the Yunkers in the officers' schools in and around Petrograd, all of whom answered that they were unable to move. Colonel Polkovnikov, commandant of the city, hurried between the staff and the Winter Palace, evidently without any plan. 
Kerensky gave an order to open the bridges. Three hours passed without any action, and then an officer and five men went out on their own initiative, and putting to flight a picket of red guards, opened the Nikolai Bridge. Immediately after they left, however, some sailors closed it again. Kerensky ordered the print shop of Rabochi Put to be occupied. The officer detailed to the work was promised a squad of soldiers. Two hours later he was promised some yunkers. Then the order was forgotten. An attempt was made to recapture the post office and the telegraph agency. A few shots were fired, and the government troops announced that they would no longer oppose the Soviets. To a delegation of yunkers Kerensky said, as chief of the provisional government and as supreme commander I know nothing, I cannot advise you. But as a veteran revolutionist, I appeal to you, young revolutionists, to remain at your posts and defend the conquests of the revolution. End quote. Orders of Kishkin, November 7th. Quote, By decree of the provisional government, I am invested with extraordinary powers for the re-establishment of order in Petrograd, in complete command of all civil and military authorities. In accordance with the powers conferred upon me by the provisional government, I herewith relieve from his functions as commandant of the Petrograd military district, Colonel George Polkovnikov. End quote. Appeal to the Population, signed by Vice Premier Konovalov, November 7th. Quote, Citizens, save the fatherland, the republic, and your freedom. Maniacs have raised a revolt against the only governmental power chosen by the people, the provisional government. The members of the provisional government fulfill their duty, remain at their post, and continue to work for the good of the fatherland, the re-establishment of order, and the convocation of the constituent assembly, future sovereign of Russia, and of all the Russian peoples. Citizens, you must support the provisional government. You must strengthen its authority. You must oppose these maniacs, with whom are joined all enemies of liberty and order, and the followers of the Tsarist regime, in order to wreck the Constituent Assembly, destroy the conquests of the Revolution, and the future of our dear fatherland. Citizens, organize around the provisional government for the defense of its temporary authority, in the name of order and the happiness of all peoples. End quote. Proclamation of the Provisional Government. Quote, the Petrograd Soviet has declared the Provisional Government overthrown and has demanded that the governmental power be turned over to it under threat of bombarding the Winter Palace with the cannon of Peter Paul Fortress and of the cruiser of Rora anchored in the Neva. The government can surrender its authority only to the Constituent Assembly. For that reason it has decided not to submit, and to demand aid from the population and the army. A telegram has been sent to the Stavka, and an answer received says that a strong detachment of troops is being sent. Let the army and the people reject the irresponsible attempts of the Bolsheviki to create a revolt in the rear. End quote. About 9 a.m. Kerensky left for the front. Toward evening, two soldiers on bicycles presented themselves at the staff headquarters as delegates of the garrison of Peter Paul Fortress. Entering the meeting room of the staff, where Kishkin, Rutenberg, Peltchinsky, General Bagratuni, Colonel Paradielov, and Count Tolstoy were gathered, they demanded the immediate surrender of the staff, threatening, in case of refusal, to bombard headquarters. After two panicky conferences, the staff retreated to the Winter Palace, and the headquarters were occupied by Red Guards. Late in the afternoon, several Bolshevik armored cars cruised around the palace square, and Soviet soldiers tried unsuccessfully to parley with the Yunkers. Firing on the palace began about seven o'clock in the evening. At 10 p.m. began an artillery bombardment from three sides, in which most of the shells were blanks, only three small shrapnels striking the façade of the palace. 2. Kerensky in flight. Leaving Petrograd in the morning of November 7th, Kerensky arrived by automobile at Kachina, where he demanded a special train. Toward evening he was in Ostrov, province of Skov. 
the next morning extraordinary session of the local soviet of workers and soldiers deputies with participation of cossack delegates there being six thousand cossacks at ostrov kerensky spoke to the assembly appealing for aid against the bolsheviki and addressed himself almost exclusively to the cossacks the soldier delegates protested why did you come here shouted voices kerensky answered to ask the cossacks assistance in crushing the bolshevik insurrection at this there were violent protestations which increased when he continued i broke the kornilov attempt and i will break the bolsheviki the noise became so great that he had to leave the platform the soldier deputies and the usuri cossacks decided to arrest kerensky but the don cossacks prevented them and got him away by train a military revolutionary committee set up during the day tried to inform the garrison of Pskov, but the telephone and telegraph lines were cut kerensky did not arrive at Pskov. revolutionary soldiers had cut the railway line to prevent troops being sent against the capital on the night of november eighth he arrived by automobile at luga where he was well received by the death battalion stationed there next day he took train for the southwest front and visited the army committee at headquarters the fifth army however was wild with enthusiasm over the news of the bolshevik success and the army committee was unable to promise kerensky any support from there he went to the stavka at mogilev where he ordered ten regiments from different parts of the front to move against petrograd the soldiers almost unanimously refused and those regiments which did start halted on the way about five thousand cossacks finally followed him three looting of the winter palace i do not mean to maintain that there was no looting in the winter palace both after and before the winter palace fell there was considerable pilfering the statement of the socialist revolutionary paper narod and of members of the city duma to the effect that precious objects to the value of five hundred million roubles had been stolen was however a gross exaggeration the most important art treasures of the palace paintings statues tapestries rare porcelains and armory had been transferred to moscow during the month of september and they were still in good order in the basement of the imperial palace there ten days after the capture of the kremlin by bolshevik troops i can personally testify to this individuals however especially the general public which was allowed to circulate freely through the winter palace for several days after its capture made away with table silver clocks bedding mirrors and some odd vases of valuable porcelain and semi-precious stone to the value of about fifty thousand dollars the soviet government immediately created a special commission composed of artists and archaeologists to recover the stolen objects on november first two proclamations were issued citizens of petrograd we urgently ask all citizens to exert every effort to find whatever possible of the objects stolen from the winter palace in the night of november seven to eight and to forward them to the commandant of the winter palace receivers of stolen goods antiquarians and all who are proved to be hiding such objects will be held legally responsible and punished with all severity commissars for the protection of museums and artistic collections G. Yatmanov, B. Mandelbaum. End quote. To regimental and fleet committees. In the night of November 7 to 8, in the Winter Palace, which is the inalienable property of the Russian people, valuable objects of art were stolen. We urgently appeal to all to exert every effort so that the stolen objects are returned to the Winter Palace. Commissars G. Yatmanov, B. Mandelbaum. End quote about half the loot was recovered some of it in the baggage of foreigners leaving russia a conference of artists and archaeologists held at the suggestion of smolny appointed a commission to make an inventory of the winter palace treasures which was given complete charge of the palace and of all artistic collections and state museums in petrograd on november sixteenth the winter palace was closed to the public while the inventory was being made 
during the last week in november a decree was issued by the council of people's commissars changing the name of the winter palace to people's museum entrusting it to the complete charge of the artistic archaeological commission and declaring that henceforth all governmental activities within its wall were prohibited four rape of the women's battalion immediately following the taking of the winter palace all sorts of sensational stories were published in the anti-bolshevik press and told in the city duma about the fate of the women's battalion defending the palace it was said that some of the girl soldiers had been thrown from the windows into the street most of the rest had been violated and many had committed suicide as a result of the horrors they had gone through the city duma appointed a commission to investigate the matter on november sixteenth the commission returned from levashovo headquarters of the women's battalion madame turkova reported that the girls had been at first taken to the barracks of the pavlovsky regiment and that there some of them had been badly treated but that at present most of them were at levashovo and the rest scattered about the city in private houses dr mandelbaum another of the commission, testified dryly that none of the women had been thrown out of the windows of the Winter Palace, that none were wounded, that three had been violated, and that one had committed suicide, leaving a note which said that she had been, quote, disappointed in her ideals, end quote. On November 21st, the Military Revolutionary Committee officially dissolved the women's battalion, at the request of the girls themselves, who returned to civilian clothes. In Louise Bryant's book, Six Red Months in Russia, there is an interesting description of the girl soldiers during this time. End of chapters 3 and 4 Appendices Appendix to Chapters 5 through 8 of Ten Days That Shook the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed. Appendix to Chapter 5 1. Appeals and Proclamations. From the Military Revolutionary Committee, November 8. To all army committees and all Soviets of soldiers' deputies, the Petrograd garrison has overturned the government of Kerensky, which had risen against the revolution and the people. In sending this news to the front and the country, the Military Revolutionary Committee requests all soldiers to keep vigilant watch on the conduct of officers. Officers who do not frankly and openly declare for the revolution should be immediately arrested as enemies. The Petrograd Soviet interprets the program of the new government as immediate proposals of a general democratic peace, the immediate transfer of great landed estates to the peasants, and the honest convocation of the constituent assembly. The People's Revolutionary Army must not permit troops of doubtful morale to be sent to Petrograd. Act by means of arguments, by means of moral suasion, but if that fails, halt the movement of troops by implacable force. The present order must be immediately read to all military units of every branch of the service. Whoever keeps the knowledge of this order from the soldier masses commits a serious crime against the revolution, and will be punished with all the rigor of revolutionary law. Soldiers, for peace, bread, land, and popular government. To all front and rear army, corps, divisional, regimental, and company committees, and all Soviets of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies. Soldiers and revolutionary officers. The Military Revolutionary Committee, by agreement with the majority of the workers, soldiers, and peasants, has decreed that General Kornilov and all the accomplices of his conspiracy shall be brought immediately to Petrograd, for incarceration in Peter Paul Fortress, and arraignment before a military revolutionary court-martial. All who resist the execution of this decree are declared by the committee to be traitors to the revolution, and their orders are herewith declared null and void. The Military Revolutionary Committee attached to the Petrograd Soviet of Workers' and Soldiers' Deputies. 
to all provisional and district soviets of workers soldiers and peasants deputies by resolution of the all-russian congress of soviets all arrested members of land committees are immediately set free the commissars who arrested them are to be arrested from this moment all power belongs to the soviets the commissars of the provisional government are removed the presidents of the various local soviets are invited to enter into direct relations with the revolutionary government military revolutionary committee two protest of the municipal duma the central city duma elected on the most democratic principles has undertaken the burden of managing municipal affairs and food supplies at the time of the greatest disorganization at the present moment the Bolshevik party, three weeks before the elections to the Constituent Assembly, and in spite of the menace of the external enemy, having removed by armed force the only legal revolutionary authority, is making an attempt against the rights and independence of the municipal self-government, demanding submission to its commissars and its illegal authority. In this terrible and tragic moment, the Petrograd City Duma, in the face of its constituents, and of all Russia, declares loudly that it will not submit to any encroachments on its rights and its independence, and will remain at the post of responsibility to which it has been called by the will of the population of the capital. The central city Duma of Petrograd appeals to all Dumas and Zemstvos of the Russian Republic to rally to the defense of one of the greatest conquests of the Russian Revolution, the independence and inviolability of popular self-government. 3. Land Decree, Peasants, Nakaz The land question can only be permanently settled by the General Constituent Assembly. The most equitable solution of the land question should be as follows. 1. The right of private ownership of land is abolished forever. Land cannot be sold, nor leased, nor mortgaged, nor alienated in any way. All dominical lands, lands attached to titles, lands belonging to the emperor's cabinet, to monasteries, churches, possession lands, entailed lands, private estates, communal lands, peasant freeholds, and others, are confiscated without compensation, and become national property, and are placed at the disposition of the workers who cultivate them. Those who are damaged because of this social transformation of the rights of property are entitled to public aid during the time necessary for them to adapt themselves to the new conditions of existence. 2. All the riches beneath the earth, ores, oil, coal, salt, etc., as well as forests and waters having a national importance, become the exclusive property of the state. All minor streams, lakes, and forests are placed in the hands of the communities, on condition of being managed by the local organs of government. 3. All plots of land scientifically cultivated, gardens, plantations, nurseries, seed plots, greenhouses, and others, shall not be divided, but transformed into model farms, and pass into the hands of the state or of the community according to their size and importance buildings communal lands and villages with their private gardens and their orchards remain in the hands of their present owners the dimensions of these plots and the rate of taxes for their use shall be fixed by law four all studs governmental and private cattle breeding and bird breeding establishments and others are confiscated and become national property and are transferred either to the state or to the community according to their size and importance all questions of compensation for the above are within the competence of the Constituent Assembly. 5. All inventoried agricultural property of the confiscated lands, machinery and livestock, are transferred without compensation to the state or the community according to their quantity and importance. The confiscation of such machinery or livestock shall not apply to the small properties of peasants. 6. The right to use the land is granted to all citizens, without distinction of sex, who wish to work the land themselves with the help of their families, or in partnership, and only so long as they are able to work. No hired labor is permitted. 
in the event of the incapacity for work of a member of the commune for a period of two years the commune shall be bound to render him assistance during this time by working his land in common farmers who through old age or sickness have permanently lost the capacity to work the land themselves shall surrender their land and receive instead a government pension seven the use of the land should be equalized that is to say the land shall be divided among the workers according to local conditions the unit of labor and the needs of the individual the way in which land is to be used may be individually determined upon as homesteads as farms by communes by partnerships as will be decided by the villages and settlements eight all land upon its confiscation is pooled in the general people's land fund its distribution among the workers is carried out by the local and central organs of administration beginning with the village democratic organizations and ending with the central provincial institutions with the exception of urban and rural cooperative societies the land fund is subject to periodical redistribution according to the increase of population and the development of productivity and rural economy in case of modification of the boundaries of allotments the original centre of the allotment remains intact the lands of persons retiring from the community return to the land fund providing that near relatives of the persons retiring or friends designated by them shall have preference in the redistribution of these lands when lands are returned to the land fund the money expended for manuring or improving the land which has not been exhausted shall be reimbursed if in some localities the land fund is insufficient to satisfy the local population the surplus population should emigrate the organization of the emigration also the costs thereof and the providing of emigrants with the necessary machinery and livestock shall be the business of the state the emigration shall be carried out in the following order first the peasants without land who express their wish to emigrate then the undesirable members of the community deserters etc and finally by drawing lots on agreement all which is contained in this knack has being the expression of the indisputable will of the great majority of conscious peasants of russia is declared to be a temporary law and until the convocation of the constituent assembly becomes effective immediately so far as is possible and in some parts of it gradually as will be determined by the district soviets of peasants deputies four the land and deserters the government was not forced to make any decision concerning the rights of deserters to the land the end of the war and the demobilization of the army automatically removed the deserter problem five the council of people's commissars the council of people's commissars was at first composed entirely of bolsheviki this was not entirely the fault of the bolsheviki however on november eighth they offered portfolios to members of the left socialist revolutionaries who declined see page two hundred seventy three of original volume appendix to chapter six one appeals and denunciations appeal to all citizens and to the military organizations of the socialist revolutionary party Quote, the senseless attempt of the bolsheviki is on the eve of complete failure the garrison is disaffected the ministries are idle bread is lacking all factions except a handful of bolsheviki have left the congress of soviets the bolsheviki are alone abuses of all sorts acts of vandalism and pillage the bombardment of the winter palace arbitrary arrests all these crimes committed by the bolsheviki have aroused against them the resentment of the majority of the sailors and soldiers the central float refuses to submit to the orders of the bolsheviki 
we call upon all sane elements to gather around the committee for salvation of country and revolution to take serious measures to be ready at the first call of the central committee of the party to act against the counter-revolutionists who will doubtless attempt to profit by these troubles provoked by the bolshevik adventure and to watch closely the external enemy who also would like to take advantage of this opportune moment when the front is weakened the military section of the central committee of the socialist revolutionary party from pravda quote, what is kerensky a usurper whose palace is in peter paul prison with kornilov and kishkin a criminal and traitor to the workers soldiers and peasants who believed in him kerensky a murderer of soldiers kerensky a public executioner of peasants kerensky a strangler of workers such is the second kornilov who now wants to butcher liberty End quote. appendix to chapter seven one two decrees on the press in the serious decisive hour of the revolution and in the days immediately following it the provisional revolutionary committee is compelled to adopt a series of measures against the counter-revolutionary press of all shades immediately on all sides there are cries that the new socialist authority is in this violating the essential principles of its own program by an attempt against the freedom of the press the workers and peasants government calls the attention of the population to the fact that in our country behind this liberal shield is hidden the opportunity for the wealthier classes to seize the lion's share of the whole press and by this means to poison the popular mind and bring confusion into the consciousness of the masses every one knows that the bourgeois press is one of the most powerful weapons of the bourgeoisie especially in this critical moment when the new authority of the workers and peasants is in process of consolidation it is impossible to leave it in the hands of the enemy at a time when it is not less dangerous than bombs and machine guns this is why temporary and extraordinary measures have been adopted for the purpose of stopping the flow of filth and calumny in which the yellow and green press would be glad to drown the young victory of the people as soon as the new order is consolidated all administrative measures against the press will be suspended full liberty will be given it within the limits of responsibility before the law in accordance with the broadest and most progressive regulations bearing in mind however the fact that any restrictions of the freedom of the press even in critical moments are admissible only within the bounds of necessity the council of people's commissars decrees as follows one the following classes of newspapers shall be subject to closure a those inciting to open resistance or disobedience to the workers and peasants government b those creating confusion by obviously and deliberately perverting the news c those inciting to acts of a criminal character punishable by the laws two the temporary or permanent closing of any organ of the press shall be carried out only by virtue of a resolution of the Council of People's Commissars. 3. The present decree is of a temporary nature, and will be revoked by a special ukaz when normal conditions of public life are re-established. President of the Council of People's Commissars, Vladimir Ulyanov, Lenin. On Workers' Militia 1. All Soviets of Workers and Soldiers' Deputies shall form a Workers' Militia. 2. This Workers' Militia shall be entirely at the orders of the Soviets of Workers and Soldiers' Deputies. 3. Military and civil authorities must render every assistance in arming the workers and in supplying them with technical equipment, even to the extent of requisitioning arms belonging to the War Department of the Government. 4. This decree shall be promulgated by telegraph. Petrograd, November 10, 1917. People's Commissar of the Interior, A. I. Rykov. This decree encouraged the formation of companies of Red Guards all over Russia, which became the most valuable arm of the Soviet government in the ensuing civil war. 2. The Strike Fund 
the fund for the striking government employees and bank clerks was subscribed by banks and business houses of petrograd and other cities and also by foreign corporations doing business in russia all who consented to strike against the bolsheviki were paid full wages and in some cases their pay was increased it was the realization of the strike fund contributors that the bolsheviki were firmly in power followed by their refusal to pay strike benefits which finally broke the strike appendix to chapter eight one kerensky's advance on november ninth kerensky and his cossacks arrived at gatchina where the garrison hopelessly split into two factions immediately surrendered the members of the gatchina soviet were arrested and at first threatened with death later they were released on good behavior the cossack advance guards practically unopposed occupied pavlovsk and drovsk and other stations and reached the outskirts of sarskoy selo next morning november tenth at once the garrison divided into three groups the officers loyal to kerensky part of the soldiers and non-commissioned officers who declared themselves neutral and most of the rank and file who were for the bolsheviki the bolshevik soldiers who were without leaders or organization fell back toward the capital the local soviet also withdrew to the village of pulkovo from pulkovo six members of the sarkoy selo soviet went with an automobile load of proclamations to gatchina to propagandize the cossacks they spent most of the day going around gatchina from one cossack barracks to another pleading arguing and explaining toward evening some officers discovered their presence and they were arrested and brought before general krasnov who said you fought against kornilov now you are opposing kerensky i'll have you all shot after reading aloud to them the order appointing him commander-in-chief of the petrograd district krasnov asked if they were bolsheviki they replied in the affirmative upon which krasnov went away a short time later an officer came and set them free saying that it was by order of general krasnov in the meanwhile delegations continued to arrive from petrograd from the duma the committee for salvation and last of all from the vikshel the union of railway workers insisted that some agreement be reached to halt the civil war and demanded that kerensky treat with the bolsheviki and that he stop the advance on petrograd in case of refusal the vikshel threatened a general strike at midnight of november eleventh kerensky asked to be allowed to discuss the matter with the socialist ministers and with the committee for salvation he was plainly undecided on the eleventh cossack outposts reached krasnoi selo from which the local soviet and the heterogeneous forces of the military revolutionary committee precipitately retired some of them surrendering that night they also touched pulkovo where the first real resistance was encountered cossacks deserters began to dribble into petrograd declaring that kerensky had lied to them that he had spread broadcast over the front proclamations which said that petrograd was burning that the bolsheviki had invited the germans to come in and that they were murdering women and children and looting indiscriminately the military revolutionary committee immediately sent out some dozens of agitators with thousands of printed appeals to inform the cossacks of the real situation two proclamations of the military revolutionary committee Quote, to all soviets of workers soldiers and peasants deputies the All-Russian Congress of Soviets of Workers, Soldiers, and Peasants Deputies charges the local Soviets immediately to take the most energetic measures to oppose all counter-revolutionary, anti-Semitic disturbances, and all pogroms of whatever nature. The honor of the Workers, Peasants, and Soldiers' Revolution cannot tolerate any disorders. The Red Guard of Petrograd, the Revolutionary Garrison, and the Sailors have maintained complete order in the capital. Workers, soldiers, and peasants, everywhere you should follow the example of the workers and soldiers of Petrograd. Comrades, soldiers, and Cossacks, on us falls the duty of keeping real revolutionary order. All revolutionary Russia and the whole world have their eyes on you. 
the all-russian congress of soviets decrees to abolish capital punishment at the front which was reintroduced by kerensky complete freedom of propaganda is to be re-established in the country all soldiers and revolutionary officers now under arrest for so-called political crimes are at once to be set free the ex-premier kerensky overthrown by the people refuses to submit to the congress of soviets and attempts to struggle against the legal government elected by the all-russian congress the council of people's commissars the front has refused to aid kerensky moscow has rallied to the new government in many cities minsk mogilev kharkov the power is in the hands of the soviets no infantry detachment consents to march against the workers and peasants government which in accord with the firm will of the army and the people has begun peace negotiations and has given the land to the peasants we give public warning that if the cossacks do not halt kerensky who has deceived them and is leading them against petrograd the revolutionary forces will rise with all their might for the defense of the precious conquests of the revolution peace and land citizens of petrograd kerensky fled from the city abandoning the authority to kishkin who wanted to surrender the capital to the germans rutenberg of the black band who sabotaged the municipal food supply and palchinsky hated by the whole democracy kerensky has fled abandoning you to the germans to famine to bloody massacres the revolting people have arrested kerensky's ministers and you have seen how the order and supplying of petrograd at once improved kerensky at the demand of the aristocrat proprietors the capitalists speculators marches against you for the purpose of giving back the land to the landowners and continuing the hated and ruinous war citizens of petrograd we know that the great majority of you are in favor of the people's revolutionary authority against the kornilovtsi led by kerensky do not be deceived by the lying declarations of the impotent bourgeois conspirators who will be pitilessly crushed workers soldiers peasants we call upon you for revolutionary devotion and discipline millions of peasants and soldiers are with us the victory of the people's revolution is assured three acts of the council of people's commissars in this book i am giving only such decrees as are in my opinion pertinent to the bolshevik conquest of power the rest belong to a detailed account of the structure of the soviet state for which i have no place in this work this will be dealt with very fully in the second volume now in preparation kornilov to brest litovsk concerning dwelling places one the independent municipal self-governments have the right to sequestrate all unoccupied or uninhabited dwelling places two the municipalities may, according to laws and arrangements established by them, install in all available lodgings citizens who have no place to live, or who live in congested or unhealthy lodgings. 3. The municipalities may establish a service of inspection of dwelling places, organize it, and define its powers. 4. The municipalities may issue orders in the institution of house committees, define their organization, their powers, and give them juridical authority. 5. The municipalities may create housing tribunals, define their powers and their authority. 6. This decree is promulgated by telegraph. People's Commissar of the Interior, A. I. Rykov. On Social Insurance the russian proletariat has inscribed on its banners the promise of complete social insurance of wage earners as well as of the town and village poor the government of the czar the proprietors and the capitalists as well as the government of coalition and conciliation failed to realize the desires of the workers with regard to social insurance the workers and peasants government relying upon the support of the soviets of workers soldiers and peasants deputies announces to the working class of russia and to the town and village poor that it will immediately prepare laws on social insurance based on the formulas proposed by the labor organizations one 
insurance for all wage workers without exception, as well as for all urban and rural poor. 2. Insurance to cover all categories of loss of working capacity, such as illness, infirmities, old age, childbirth, widowhood, orphanage, and unemployment. 3. All the costs of insurance to be charged to employers. 4. Compensation of at least full wages in all loss of working capacity and unemployment. 5. Complete workers' self-government of all insurance institutions. In the name of the Government of the Russian Republic, the People's Commissar of Labor, Alexander Shliapnikov. On Popular Education Citizens of Russia, with the insurrection of November 7th, the working masses have won for the first time the real power. The All-Russian Congress of Soviets has temporarily transferred this power both to its Executive Committee and to the Council of People's Commissars. By the will of the revolutionary people, I have been appointed People's Commissar of Education. The work of guiding in general the people's education, inasmuch as it remains with the central government, is, until the Constituent Assembly meets, entrusted to a commission on the people's education, whose chairman and executive is the people's commissar. Upon what foundational propositions will rest this state commission? How is its sphere of competence determined? The general line of educational activity. Every genuinely democratic power must, in the domain of education, in a country where illiteracy and ignorance reign supreme, make its first aim the struggle against this darkness. It must acquire in the shortest time universal literacy, by organizing a network of schools answering to the demands of modern pedagogics. It must introduce universal, obligatory, and free tuition for all, and establish at the same time a series of such teachers' institutes and seminaries as will in the shortest time furnish a powerful army of people's teachers so necessary for the universal instruction of the population of our boundless Russia. Decentralization the State Commission on People's Education is by no means a central power governing the institutions of instruction and education. On the contrary, the entire schoolwork ought to be transferred to the organs of local self-government. The independent work of the workers, soldiers, and peasants, establishing on their own initiative cultural educational organizations, must be given full autonomy, both by the state center and the municipal centers. The work of the State Commission serves as a link and helpmate to organize resources of material and moral support to the municipal and private institutions, particularly to those with a class character established by the workers. The State Committee on People's Education A whole series of invaluable law projects was elaborated from the beginning of the Revolution by the State Committee for People's Education, a tolerably democratic body as to its composition, and rich in experts. The State Commission sincerely desires the collaboration of this committee. It has addressed itself to the Bureau of the Committee, with the request at once to convoke an extraordinary session of the committee for the fulfillment of the following program. 1. The revision of rules of representation in the committee, in the sense of greater democratization. 2 the revision of the committee's rights in the sense of widening them, and of converting the committee into a fundamental state institute for the elaboration of law projects calculated to reorganize public instruction and education in Russia upon democratic principles. 3. The revision, jointly with the new state commission, of the laws already created by the committee, a revision required by the fact that in editing them the committee had to take into account the bourgeois spirit of previous ministries, which obstructed it even in this its narrowed form. After this revision these laws will be put into effect without bureaucratic red tape in the revolutionary order. THE PEDAGOGUES AND THE SOCIETISTS the State Commission welcomes the pedagogues to the bright and honorable work of educating the people, the masters of the country. 
no one measure in the domain of the people's education ought to be adopted by any power without the attentive deliberation of those who represent the pedagogues on the other hand a decision cannot by any means be reached exclusively through the cooperation of specialists this refers as well to reforms of the institutes of general education the cooperation of the pedagogues with the social forces this is how the commission will work both in its own constitution in the state committee and in all its activities as its first task the commission considers the improvement of the teacher's status and first of all of those very poor though almost most important contributors to the work of culture the elementary school teachers their just demands ought to be satisfied at once and at any cost the proletariat of the schools has in vain demanded an increase of salary to one hundred roubles per month it would be a disgrace any longer to keep in poverty the teachers of the overwhelming majority of the russian people but a real democracy cannot stop at mere literacy at universal elementary instruction it must endeavor to organize a uniform secular school of several grades the ideal is equal and if possible higher education for all the citizens so long as this idea has not been realized for all the natural transition through all the schooling grades up to the university a transition to a higher stage must depend entirely upon the pupil's aptitude and not upon the resources of his family the problem of a genuinely democratic organization of instruction is particularly difficult in a country impoverished by a long criminal imperialistic war but the workers who have taken the power must remember that education will serve them as the greatest instrument in their struggle for a better lot and for a spiritual growth however needful it may be to curtail other articles of the people's budget the expenses on education must stand high a large educational budget is the pride and glory of a nation the free and enfranchised peoples of russia will not forget this the fight against illiteracy and ignorance cannot be confined to a thorough establishment of school education for children and youths adults too will be anxious to save themselves from the debasing position of a man who cannot read and write the school for adults must occupy a conspicuous place in the general plan of popular instruction instruction and education one must emphasize the difference between instruction and education instruction is the transmission of ready knowledge by the teacher to his pupil education is a creative process the personality of the individual is being educated throughout life is being formed grows richer in content stronger and more perfect the toiling masses of the people the workmen the peasants the soldiers are thirsting for elementary and advanced instruction but they are also thirsting for education neither the government nor the intellectuals nor any other power outside of themselves can give it to them the school the book the theatre the museum etc may here be only aids they have their own ideas formed by their social position so different from the position of those ruling classes and intellectuals who have hitherto created culture they have their own ideas their own emotions their own ways of approaching the problems of personality and society the city laborer according to his own fashion the rural toiler according to his will each build his clear world conception permeated with the class idea of the workers there is no more superb or beautiful phenomenon than the one of which our nearest descendants will be both witnesses and participants the building by collective labor of its own general rich and free soul instruction will surely be an important but not a decisive element what is more important here is the criticism the creativeness of the masses themselves for science and art have only in some of their parts a general human importance they suffer radical changes with every far-reaching class upheaval throughout russia particularly among the city laborers but also among the peasants a powerful wave of cultural educational movement has arisen workers and soldiers organizations of this kind are multiplying rapidly 
to meet them, to lend them support, to clear the road before them, is the first task of a revolutionary and popular government in the domain of democratic education. The Constituent Assembly will doubtless soon begin its work. It alone can permanently establish the order of national and social life in our country, and at the same time the general character of the organization of popular education. Now, however, with the passage of power to the Soviets, the really democratic character of the Constituent Assembly is assured. The line which the State Commission, relying upon the State Committee, will follow, will hardly suffer any modification under the influence of the Constituent Assembly. Without predetermining it, the new people's government considers itself within its rights in enacting in this domain a series of measures which aim at reaching and enlightening, as soon as possible, the spiritual life of the country. THE MINISTRY the present work must in the interim proceed through the Ministry of the People's Education. Of all the necessary alterations in its composition and construction, the State Commission will have charge, elected by the Executive Committee of the Soviets and the State Committee. Of course the order of State authority in the domain of the People's Education will be established by the Constituent Assembly. Until then, the ministry must play the part of the executive apparatus for both the State Committee and the State Commission for People's Education. The pledge of the country's safety lies in the cooperation of all its vital and genuinely democratic forces. We believe that the energetic effort of the working people and of the honest, enlightened intellectuals will lead the country out of its painful crisis and through complete democracy to the reign of socialism and the brotherhood of nations. People's Commissar on Education, A. V. Lunacharsky On the order in which the laws are to be ratified and published. 1. Until the convocation of the Constituent Assembly, the enacting and publishing of laws shall be carried out in the order decreed by the present Provisional Workmen's and Peasants' Government, elected by the All-Russian Congress of Workers, Peasants' and Soldiers' Deputies. 2. Every bill is presented for consideration of the government by the respective ministry, signed by the duly authorized People's Commissar, or it is presented by the legislative section attached to the government, signed by the chief of the section. 3. After its ratification by the government, the decree in its final edition, in the name of the Russian Republic, is signed by the President of the Council of People's Commissars, or for him by the People's Commissar who presented it for the consideration of the government, and is then published. 4. The date of publishing it in the official Gazette of the Provisional Workmen's and Peasants' Government is the date of its becoming law. 5. In the decree there may be appointed a date, other than the date of publication, on which it shall become law, or it may be promulgated by telegraph, in which case it is to be regarded in every locality as becoming law upon the publication of the telegram. 6. The promulgation of legislative acts of the government by the State Senate is abolished. The legislative section attached to the Council of People's Commissars issues periodically a collection of regulations and orders of the government which possess the force of law. 7. The Central Executive Committee of the Soviets of Workers, Peasants, and Soldiers' Deputies, Tsaika, has at all times the right to cancel, alter, or annul any of the government decrees. In the name of the Russian Republic, the President of the Council of People's Commissars, V. Yulianov Lenin. 4. The Liquor Problem. Order issued by the Military Revolutionary Committee. 1. Until further order, the production of alcohol and alcoholic drinks is prohibited. 2. It is ordered to all producers of alcohol and alcoholic drinks to inform, not later than on the 27th, this month, of the exact site of their stores. 3. All culprits against this order will be tried by a military revolutionary court. The Military Revolutionary Committee. 5. Order number 2. From the Committee of the Finland Guard Reserve Regiment to all House Committees and to the citizens of Vasily Ostrov. 
The bourgeoisie has chosen a very sinister method of fighting against the proletariat. It has established in various parts of the city huge wine depots, and distributes liquor among the soldiers, in this manner attempting to sow dissatisfaction in the ranks of the revolutionary army. It is herewith ordered to all house committees that at three o'clock, the time set for posting this order, they shall in person and secretly notify the president of the committee of the Finland Guard Regiment concerning the amount of wine in their premises. Those who violate this order will be arrested and given trial before a merciless court, and their property will be confiscated, and the stock of wine discovered will be blown up with dynamite two hours after this warning, because more lenient measures, as experience has shown, do not bring the desired results. Remember, there will be no other warning before the explosions. Regimental Committee of the Finland Guard Regiment End of chapters 5 through 8 appendices Appendix to chapters 9 and 10 of 10 Days That Shook the World This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed Appendix to Chapter 9 1. Military Revolutionary Committee, Bulletin Number 2 November 12th, in the evening, Kerensky sent a proposition to the revolutionary troops, quote, to lay down their arms, end quote. Kerensky's men opened artillery fire. Our artillery answered and compelled the enemy to be silent. The Cossacks assumed the offensive. The deadly fire of the sailors, the Red Guards, and the soldiers forced the Cossacks to retreat. Our armored cars rushed in among the ranks of the enemy. The enemy is fleeing. Our troops are in pursuit. The order has been given to arrest Kerensky. Tsarskoy Selo has been taken by the revolutionary troops. The Lettish Riflemen the Military Revolutionary Committee has received precise information that the valiant Lettish riflemen have arrived from the front and taken up a position in the rear of Kerensky's bands. From the Staff of the Military Revolutionary Committee The seizure of Gatchina and Tsarskoy Selo by Kerensky's detachments is to be explained by the complete absence of artillery and machine guns in these places, whereas Kerensky's cavalry was provided with artillery from the beginning. The last two days were days of enforced work for our staff to provide the necessary quantity of guns, machine guns, field telephones, etc., for the revolutionary troops. When this work, with the energetic assistance of the district Soviets and the factories, the Putilov works, Obukhov and others, was accomplished, the issue of the expected encounter left no place for doubt. On the side of the revolutionary troops there was not only a surplus in quantity and such a powerful material base as Petrograd, but also an enormous moral advantage. All the Petrograd regiments moved out to the positions with tremendous enthusiasm. The garrison conference elected a control commission of five soldiers, thus securing a complete unity between the commander-in-chief and the garrison. At the garrison conference, it was unanimously decided to begin decisive action. The artillery fire on the 12th of November developed with extraordinary force by 3 p.m. The Cossacks were completely demoralized. A parliamentarian came from them to the staff of the detachment at Krasnoy Selo and proposed to stop the firing, threatening otherwise to take decisive measures. He was answered that the firing would cease when Kerensky laid down his arms. In the developing encounter, all sections of the troops, the sailors, soldiers, and the Red Guards, showed unlimited courage. The sailors continued to advance until they had fired all their cartridges. The number of casualties has not been established yet, but it is larger on the part of the counter-revolutionary troops, who experienced great losses through one of our armored cars. Kerensky's staff, fearing that they would be surrounded, gave the order to retreat, which retreat speedily assumed a disorderly character. 
by 11 to 12 p.m., Sarkoy Selo, including the wireless station, was entirely occupied by the troops of the Soviets. The Cossacks retreated towards Gatchina and Kolpino. The morale of the troops is beyond all praise. The order has been given to pursue the retreating Cossacks. From the Tsarskoye Selo station, a radio telegram was sent immediately to the front and to all local Soviets throughout Russia. Further details will be communicated. 2. Events of the 13th in Petrograd Three regiments of the Petrograd garrison to take any part in the battle against Kerensky. On the morning of the 13th, they summoned to a joint conference 60 delegates from the front in order to find some way to stop the civil war. This conference appointed a committee to go and persuade Kerensky's troops to lay down their arms. They proposed to ask the government soldiers the following questions. 1. Will the soldiers and Cossacks of Kerensky recognize the Tsayika as the repository of governmental power responsible to the Congress of Soviets? 2. Will the soldiers and Cossacks accept the decrees of the Second Congress of Soviets? 3. Will they accept the land and peace decrees? 4. Will they agree to cease hostilities and return to their units? 5. Will they consent to the arrest of Kerensky, Krasnov, and Savinkov? At the meeting of the Petrograd Soviet, Zinoviev said, quote, it would be foolish to think that this committee could finish the affair. The enemy can only be broken by force. However, it would be a crime for us not to try every peaceful means to bring the Cossacks over to us. What we need is a military victory. The news of an armistice is premature. Our staff will be ready to conclude an armistice when the enemy can no longer do any harm. At present, the influence of our victory is creating new political conditions. Today the socialist revolutionaries are inclined to admit the Bolsheviki into the new government. A decisive victory is indispensable, so that those who hesitate will have no further hesitation. End quote. At the city Duma, all attention was concentrated on the formation of the new government. In many factories and barracks, already revolutionary tribunals were operating, and the Bolsheviki were threatening to set up more of these, and try Gotz and Evskentiev before them. Dan proposed that an ultimatum be sent demanding the abolition of these revolutionary tribunals, or the other members of the conference would immediately break off all negotiations with the Bolsheviki. Shingariov, cadet, declared that the municipality ought not to take part in any agreement with the Bolsheviki, quote, Any agreement with the maniacs is impossible until they lay down their arms and recognize the authority of independent courts of law, end quote. Yartsev, for the Yadinstvo group, declared that any agreement with the Bolsheviki would be equivalent to a Bolshevik victory. Mayor Schreider, for the Socialist Revolutionaries, stated that he was opposed to all agreement with the Bolsheviki, quote, As for a government, that ought to spring from the popular will, and since the popular will has been expressed in the municipal elections, the popular will which can create a government is actually concentrated in the Duma, end quote. After other speakers, of which only the representative of the Mensheviki internationalists was in favor of considering the admission of the Bolsheviki into the new government, the Duma voted to continue its representatives in the Vixhels conference, but to insist upon the restoration of the provisional government before everything, and to exclude the Bolsheviki from the new power. 3. Truce, Krasnov's Answer to the Committee for Salvation. Quote, in answer to your telegram proposing an immediate armistice, the Supreme Commander, not wishing further futile bloodshed, consents to enter into negotiations and to establish relations between the armies of the government and the insurrectionists. He proposes to the general staff of the insurrectionists to call its regiments to Petrograd, to declare the line Ligovo Pulkovo Kolpino neutral, and to allow the advance guards of the government cavalry to enter Tsarskoye Selo for the purpose of establishing order. The answer to this proposal must be placed in the hands of our envoys before eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Krasnov. End quote. 4. Events at Tsarskoye Selo. 
On the evening that Kerensky's troops retreated from Tsarskoye Selo, some priests organized a religious procession through the streets of the town, making speeches to the citizens in which they asked the people to support the rightful authority, the provisional government. When the Cossacks had retreated, and the first Red Guards entered the town, witnesses reported that the priests had incited the people against the Soviets, and had said prayers at the grave of Rasputin, which lies behind the imperial palace. One of the priests, Father Ivan Kucherov, was arrested and shot by the infuriated Red Guards. Just as the Red Guards entered the town, the electric lights were shut off, plunging the streets in complete darkness. The director of the electric light plant, Lubavitch, was arrested by the Soviet troops and asked why he had shut off the lights. He was found some time later in the room where he had been imprisoned with a revolver in his hand and a bullet hole in his temple. The Petrograd anti-Bolshevik papers came out next day with headlines, quote, Plekhanov's temperature 39 degrees, end quote. Plekhanov lived at Tsarskoye Selo, where he was lying ill in bed. Red guards arrived at the house and searched it for arms, questioning the old man. "'What class of society do you belong to?' they asked him. "'I am a revolutionist,' answered Plekhanov, who for forty years has devoted his life to the struggle for liberty. "'Anyway,' said a workman, "'you have now sold yourself to the bourgeoisie.' The workers no longer knew Plekhanov, pioneer of the Russian social democracy. 5. Appeal of the Soviet Government Quote, The detachments at Gatchina, deceived by Kerensky, have laid down their arms and decided to arrest Kerensky. That chief of the counter-revolutionary campaign has fled. The army, by an enormous majority, has pronounced in favor of the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets and of the government which it has created. Scores of delegates from the front have hastened to Petrograd to assure the Soviet government of the army's fidelity. No twisting of the facts, no calumny against the revolutionary workers, soldiers, and peasants has been able to defeat the people. The workers' and soldiers' revolution is victorious. The Saika appeals to the troops which march under the flag of the counter-revolution and invites them immediately to lay down their arms, to shed no longer the blood of their brothers in the interests of a handful of landowners and capitalists. The workers, soldiers, and peasants' revolution curses those who remain even for a moment under the flag of the people's enemies. Cossacks, come over to the rank of the victorious people! Railway men, postmen, telegraphers, all, all support the new government of the people. End quote. Appendix to Chapter 10 1. Damage to the Kremlin. I myself verified the damage to the Kremlin, which I visited immediately after the bombardment. The little Nikolai Palace, a building of no particular importance, which was occupied occasionally by receptions of one of the Grand Duchesses, had served as barracks for the Yunkers. It was not only bombarded, but pretty well sacked. Fortunately, there was nothing in it of particular historical value. Uspensky Cathedral had a shell hole in one of the cupolas, but except for a few feet of mosaic in the ceiling, was undamaged. The frescoes on the porch of Blagoveschensky Cathedral were badly damaged by a shell. Another shell hit the corner of Ivan Veliki. Chudovsky Monastery was hit about thirty times, but only one shell went through a window into the interior, the others breaking the brick window molding and the roof cornices. The clock over the Spaskaya Gate was smashed. Troitsky Gate was battered, but easily reparable. One of the lower towers had lost its brick spire. The Church of St. Basil was untouched, as was the great imperial palace with all the treasures of Moscow and Petrograd in its cellar, and the crown jewels in the treasury. These places were not even entered. 2. Lunacharsky's Declaration Quote, Comrades, you are the young masters of the country, and although now you have much to do and think about, you must know how to defend your artistic and scientific treasures. Comrades, that which is happening at Moscow is a horrible, irreparable misfortune. The people in its struggle for the power has mutilated our glorious capital. 
it is particularly terrible in these days of violent struggle, of destructive warfare, to be commissar of public education. Only the hope of the victory of socialism, the source of a new and superior culture, brings me comfort. On me weighs the responsibility of protecting the artistic wealth of the people. Not being able to remain at my post, where I had no influence, I resigned. My comrades, the other commissars, considered this resignation inadmissible. I shall therefore remain at my post. And, moreover, I understand that the damage done to the Kremlin is not as serious as has been reported. But I beg you, comrades, to give me your support. Preserve for yourselves and for your descendants the beauty of our land. Be the guardians of the property of the people." soon very soon even the most ignorant who have been held in ignorance so long will awake and understand what a source of joy strength and wisdom is art End quote. three questionnaire for the bourgeoisie ward number address family name christian name profession house committee number sex age supplies on hand Textiles, arshins. For underwear, for suits, for overcoats, other kinds. Ready-made clothes, pieces. Overcoats, winter, summer, fall. Dresses and suits. Underwear, shoes, rubbers. Monthly average, income, expenditures. Monthly rent, apartment, room. I, the undersigned, declare that the data given above is true, and that I have not received this card elsewhere. Signature. Signature of leaseholder. Moscow. 19. Blank. Seal of the House Committee. 4. Revolutionary Financial Measure. Order. In virtue of the powers vested in me by the Military Revolutionary Committee attached to the Moscow Soviet of Workers' and Soldiers' Deputies, I decree... 1. All banks with branches, the Central State Savings Bank with branches, and the savings banks at the Post and Telegraph offices are to be opened beginning November 22nd from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. until further order. 2. On current accounts and on the books of the savings banks, payments will be made by the above-mentioned institutions of not more than 150 rubles for each depositor during the course of the next week. 3. Payments of amounts exceeding 150 rubles a week on current accounts and savings banks books, also payments on other accounts of all kinds, will be allowed during the next three days, November 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, only in the following cases. a. On the accounts of military organizations for the satisfaction of their needs. b for the payment of salaries of employees and the earnings of workers according to the tables and lists certified by the factory committees or soviets of employees and attested by the signatures of the commissars or the representatives of the military revolutionary committee and the district military revolutionary committees four not more than one hundred fifty rubles are to be paid against drafts the remaining sums are to be entered on current account payments on which are to be made in the order established by the present decree. 5. All other banking operations are prohibited during these three days. 6. The receipt of money on all accounts is allowed for any amount. 7. The representatives of the Finance Council for the certification of the authorizations indicated in Clause 3 will hold their office in the building of the Stock Exchange, Ilyinka Street, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. 8. The banks and savings banks shall send the totals of daily cash operations by 5 p.m. to the headquarters of the Soviet, Skobiliev Square, to the Military Revolutionary Committee for the Finance Council. 9. All employees and managers of credit institutions of all kinds who refuse to comply with this decree shall be responsible as enemies of the revolution and of the mass of the population before the revolutionary tribunals. Their names shall be published for general information. 10. For the control of the operations of branches of the savings banks and banks within the limits of this decree, 
the district military revolutionary committees shall elect three representatives and appoint their place of business fully authorized commissar of the military revolutionary committee s shiverdin maximenko end of chapters nine and ten appendices Appendix to Chapter 11, Part 1 of Ten Days That Shook the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed. Appendix to Chapter 11. 1. Limitations of this chapter. This chapter extends over a period of two months, more or less. It covers the time of negotiations with the Allies, the negotiations and armistice with the Germans, and the beginning of the peace negotiations at Brest-Litovsk, as well as the period in which were laid the foundations of the Soviet state. However, it is no part of my purpose in this book to describe and interpret these very important historical events, which require more space. They are therefore reserved for another volume, Kornilov to Brest-Litovsk. In this chapter, then, I have confined myself to the Soviet government's attempts to consolidate its political power at home, and sketched its successive conquests of hostile domestic elements, which process was temporarily interrupted by the disastrous peace of Brest-Litovsk. 2. Preamble, Declaration of the Rights of the Peoples of Russia The October Revolution of the Workers and Peasants began under the common banner of emancipation. The peasants are being emancipated from the power of the landowners, for there is no longer the landowner's property right in the land. It has been abolished. The soldiers and sailors are being emancipated from the power of autocratic generals, for generals will henceforth be elective and subject to recall. The working men are being emancipated from the whims and arbitrary will of the capitalists for henceforth there will be established the control of the workers over mills and factories. Everything living and capable of life is being emancipated from the hateful shackles. There remain only the peoples of Russia, who have suffered and are suffering oppression and arbitrariness, and whose emancipation must immediately be begun, whose liberation must be effected resolutely and definitely. During the period of Tsarism, the peoples of Russia were systematically incited against one another. The result of such a policy are known, massacres and pogroms on the one hand, slavery of peoples on the other. There can be, and there must be, no return to this disgraceful policy. Henceforth the policy of a voluntary and honest union of the peoples of Russia must be substituted. In the period of imperialism, after the March Revolution, when the power was transferred into the hands of the cadet bourgeoisie, the naked policy of provocation gave way to one of cowardly distrust of the peoples of Russia, to a policy of fault-finding, of meaningless freedom and equality of peoples. The results of such a policy are known, the growth of national enmity, the impairment of mutual confidence. An end must be put to this unworthy policy of falsehood and distrust, of fault-finding and provocation. Henceforth it must be replaced by an open and honest policy leading to the complete mutual confidence of the peoples of Russia. Only as the result of such a trust can there be formed an honest and lasting union of the peoples of Russia. Only as the result of such a union can the workers and peasants of the peoples of Russia be cemented into one revolutionary force able to resist all attempts on the part of the imperialist annexationist bourgeoisie. 3. Decrees. On the Nationalization of the Banks. In the interest of the regular organization of the national economy, of the thorough eradication of bank speculation and the complete emancipation of the workers, peasants, and the whole laboring population from the exploitation of banking capital, and with a view to the establishment of a single bank of the Russian Republic, which shall serve the real interests of the people and the poorer classes, the Central Executive Committee, Saika, resolves, 1. The banking business is declared a state monopoly. 2. 
All existing private joint stock banks and banking offices are merged in the state bank. 3. The assets and liabilities of the liquidated establishments are taken over by the state bank. 4. The order of the merger of private banks in the state bank is to be determined by a special decree. 5. The temporary administration of the affairs of the private banks is entrusted to the board of the state bank. 6. The interests of the small depositors will be safeguarded. On the Equality of Rank of All Military Men In realization of the will of the revolutionary people regarding the prompt and decisive abolition of all remnants of former inequality in the army, the Council of People's Commissars decrees 1. All ranks and grades in the army, beginning with the rank of corporal and ending with the rank of general, are abolished. The Army of the Russian Republic consists now of free and equal citizens, bearing the honorable title of Soldiers of the Revolutionary Army. 2. All privileges connected with the former ranks and grades, also all outward marks of distinction, are abolished. 3. All addressing by titles is abolished. 4. All decorations, orders, and other marks of distinction are abolished. 5. With the abolition of the rank of officer, all separate officers' organizations are abolished. Note. Orderlies are left only for headquarters, chanceries, committees, and other army organizations. President of the Council of People's Commissars, Vladimir Ulyanov, Lenin. People's Commissar for Military and Naval Affairs, N. Krylenko. People's Commissar for Military Affairs, N. Podvoisky. Secretary of the Council, N. Gorbanov. On the Elective Principle and the Organization of Authority in the Army. 1. The Army serving the will of the toiling people is subject to its supreme representative, the Council of People's Commissars. 2. Full authority within the limits of military units and combinations is vested in the respective soldiers' committees and Soviets. 3. Those phases of the life and activity of the troops which are already under the jurisdiction of the committees are now formally placed in their direct control. Over such branches of activity which the committees cannot assume, the control of the soldiers' Soviets is established. 4. The election of commanding staff and officers is introduced. All commanders up to the commanders of regiments, inclusive, are elected by general suffrage of squads, platoons, companies, squadrons, batteries, divisions, artillery, two to three batteries, and regiments. All commanders higher than the commander of a regiment, and up to the supreme commander, inclusive, are elected by congresses or conferences of committees. Note. By the term conference must be understood a meeting of the respective committees together with delegates of committees one degree lower in rank, such as a conference of regimental committees with delegates from company committees. Author. 5. The elected commanders above the rank of commander of regiment must be confirmed by the nearest supreme committee. Note. In the event of a refusal by a supreme committee to confirm an elected commander, with a statement of reasons for such refusal, a commander elected by the lower committee a second time must be confirmed. 6. The commanders of armies are elected by army congresses. Commanders of fronts are elected by congresses of the respective fronts. 7. To posts of a technical character, demanding special knowledge or other practical preparation, namely doctors, engineers, technicians, telegraph and wireless operators, aviators, automobilists, etc., only such persons as possess the required special knowledge may be elected by the committees of the units of the respective services. 8. Chiefs of staff must be chosen from among persons with special military training for that post. 9. All other members of the staff are appointed by the Chief of Staff and confirmed by the respective Congresses. Note. All persons with special training must be listed in a special list. 10. The right is reserved to retire from the service all commanders on active service who are not elected by the soldiers to any post and who consequently are ranked as privates. 11. 
all other functions beside those pertaining to the command with the exception of posts in the economic departments are filled by appointment of the respective elected commanders twelve detailed instructions regarding the elections of the commanding staff will be published separately president of the council of people's commissars vladimir ulianov lenin people's commissar for military and naval affairs n krylenko people's commissar for military affairs n podvoisky secretary of the council n gorbunov on the abolition of classes and titles one all classes and class divisions, all class privileges and delimitations, all class organizations and institutions, and all civil ranks are abolished. 2. All classes of society, nobles, merchants, petty bourgeois, etc., and all titles, prince, count, and others, and all denominations of civil rank, privy state councillor, and others, are abolished, and there is established the general denomination of citizen of the Russian Republic. 3. The property and institutions of the classes of nobility are transferred to the corresponding autonomous zemstvos. 4. The property of merchant and bourgeois organizations is transferred immediately to the municipal self-governments. 5. All class institutions of any sort, with their property, their rules of procedure, and their archives, are transferred to the administration of the municipalities and zemstvos. 6. All articles of existing laws applying to these matters are herewith repealed. 7. The present decree becomes effective on the day it is published and applied by the Soviets of Workers, Soldiers, and Peasants' Deputies. The present decree has been confirmed by the Saika at the meeting of November 23, 1917, and signed by President of the Saika, Sverdlov. President of the Council of People's Commissars, Vladimir Ulianov, Lenin. Executive of the Council of People's Commissars, V. Bonch Secretary of the Council, M. Gorbanov. On December 3rd, the Council of People's Commissars resolved, quote, to reduce the salaries of functionaries and employees in all government institutions and establishments, general or special, without exception. End quote. To begin with, the Council fixed the salary of a people's commissar at 500 rubles per month, with 100 rubles additional for each grown member of the family incapable of work. This was the highest salary paid to any government official. 4. Countess Penina was arrested and brought to trial before the First Supreme Revolutionary Tribunal. The trial is described in the chapter on Revolutionary Justice in my forthcoming volume, Kornilov to Brist-Litovsk. The prisoner was sentenced to, quote, return the money and then be liberated to the public contempt, end quote. In other words, she was set free. 5. Ridicule of the New Regime from Drug Naroda, Menshevik, November 18th. Quote, the story of the immediate peace of the Bolsheviki reminds us of a joyous moving picture film. Naratov runs, Trotsky pursues. Naratov climbs a wall, Trotsky too. Naratov dives into the water, Trotsky follows. Naratov climbs onto the roof, Trotsky right behind him. Naratov hides under the bed, and Trotsky has him. He has him. Naturally, peace is immediately signed. All is empty and silent at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The couriers are respectful, but their faces wear a caustic expression. How about arresting an ambassador and signing an armistice or a peace treaty with him? But they are strange folk, these ambassadors. They keep silent just as if they had heard nothing. Hola, hola, England, France, Germany. We have signed an armistice with you. Is it possible that you know nothing about it? Nevertheless, it has been published in all the papers and posted on all the walls. On a Bolshevik's word of honor, peace has been signed. We're not asking much of you. You just have to write two words. The ambassadors remain silent. The powers remain silent. All is empty and silent in the office of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Listen, says Robespierre Trotsky to his assistant Merit Uritsky. 
run over to the british ambassadors tell him we're proposing peace go yourself says merritt aritsky he is not receiving telephone him then i've tried the receiver's off the hook send him a telegram i did well with what result merritt aritsky sighs and does not answer robespierre trotsky spits furiously into the corner listen merritt recommences trotsky after a moment we must absolutely show that we're conducting an active foreign policy how can we do that launch another decree about arresting neratov answers uritsky with a profound air merat you're a blockhead cries trotsky all of a sudden he arises terrible and majestic looking at this moment like robespierre write uritsky he says with severity write a letter to the british ambassador a registered letter with receipt demanded write i also will write the peoples of the world await an immediate peace in the enormous and empty ministry of foreign affairs are to be heard only the sound of two typewriters with his own hands trotsky is conducting an active foreign policy End quote. six on the question of an agreement to the attention of all workers and all soldiers november eleventh in the club of the preobrazhensky regiment was held an extraordinary meeting of representatives of all the units of the petrograd garrison the meeting was called upon the initiative of the preobrazhensky and semenovsky regiments for the discussion of the question as to which socialist parties are for the power of the soviets which are against which are for the people which against and if an agreement between them is possible the representatives of the saika of the municipal duma of the Avskentiev peasant soviets and of all the political parties from the bolsheviki to the populist socialists were invited to the meeting after long deliberation having heard the declarations of all parties and organizations the meeting by a tremendous majority of votes agreed that only the bolsheviki and the left socialist revolutionaries are for the people and that all the other parties are only attempting under cover of seeking an agreement to deprive the people of the conquests won in the days of the great workers and peasants revolution of november here is the text of the resolution carried at this meeting of the petrograd garrison by sixty-one votes against eleven and twelve not voting Quote, the garrison conference summoned at the initiative of the semenovsky and preobrazhensky regiments on hearing the representatives of all the socialist parties and popular organizations on the question of an agreement between the different political parties finds that one the representatives of the saika the representatives of the bolshevik party and the left socialist revolutionaries declared definitely that they stand for a government of the soviets for the decrees on land peace and workers control of industry and that upon this platform they are willing to agree with all the socialist parties two at the same time the representatives of the other parties mensheviki socialist revolutionaries either gave no answer at all or declared simply that they were opposed to the power of the soviets and against the decrees on land peace and workers control in view of this the meeting resolves one to express severe censure of all parties which under cover of an agreement wish practically to annul the popular conquests of the revolution of november two to express full confidence in the saika and the council of people's commissars and to promise them complete support at the same time the meeting deems it necessary that the comrades left socialist revolutionaries should enter the people's government End quote. seven wine pogroms it was afterward discovered that there was a regular organization maintained by the cadets for provoking rioting among the soldiers there would be telephone messages to the different barracks announcing that wine was being given away at such and such an address and when the soldiers arrived at the spot an individual would point out the location of the cellar the council of people's commissars appointed a commissar for the fight against drunkenness who besides mercilessly putting down the wine riots destroyed hundreds of thousands of bottles of liquor the winter palace cellars containing rare vintages valued at more than five million dollars were at first flooded 
and then the liquor was removed to Kronstadt and destroyed. In this work, the Kronstadt sailors, flower and pride of the revolutionary forces, as Trotsky called them, acquitted themselves with iron self-discipline. 8. Speculators. Two orders concerning them. Council of People's Commissars to the Military Revolutionary Committee. The disorganization of the food supply created by the war, and the lack of system, is becoming to the last degree acute, thanks to the speculators, marauders, and their followers on the railways, in the steamship offices, forwarding offices, etc. Taking advantage of the nation's greatest misfortunes, these criminal spoilators are playing with the health and life of millions of soldiers and workers, for their own benefit. Such a situation cannot be borne a single day longer. The Council of People's Commissars proposes to the Military Revolutionary Committee to take the most decisive measures towards the uprooting of speculation, sabotage, hiding of supplies, fraudulent detention of cargoes, etc. All persons guilty of such actions shall be subject, by special orders of the Military Revolutionary Committee, to immediate arrest and confinement in the prisons of Kronstadt, pending their arraignment before the Revolutionary Tribunal. All the popular organizations are invited to cooperate in the struggle against the spoilators of food supplies. President of the Council of People's Commissars, V. Yulianov Lenin. Accepted for execution, Military Revolutionary Committee attached to the CEC of the Soviets of W. and S. Deputies. Petrograd, November 23rd, 1917. To all honest citizens, the Military Revolutionary Committee decrees, Spoilators, marauders, speculators, are declared to be enemies of the people. The Military Revolutionary Committee proposes to all public organizations, to all honest citizens, to inform the Military Revolutionary Committee immediately of all cases of spoilation, marauding, speculation, which become known to them. The struggle against this evil is the business of all honest people. The Military Revolutionary Committee expects the support of all to whom the interests of the people are dear. The Military Revolutionary Committee will be merciless in pursuit of speculators and marauders. The Military Revolutionary Committee, Petrograd, December 2, 1917. 9. Perishkovich's Letter to Kaladin. Quote, the situation at Petrograd is desperate. The city is cut off from the outside world and is entirely in the power of the Bolsheviki. People are arrested in the streets, thrown into the Neva, drowned and imprisoned without any charge. Even Burtsev is shut up in Peter Paul Fortress, under strict guard. The organization at whose head I am is working without rest to unite all the officers, and what is left of the Yunker schools, and to arm them. The situation cannot be saved except by creating regiments of officers and Yunkers. Attacking with these regiments, and having gained a first success, we could later gain the aid of the garrison troops but without that first success it is impossible to count on a single soldier, because thousands of them are divided and terrorized by the scum which exists in every regiment. Most of the Cossacks are tainted by Bolshevik propaganda, thanks to the strange policy of General Dutov, who allowed to pass the moment when by decisive action something could have been obtained. The policy of negotiations and concessions has borne its fruits, all that is respectable is persecuted, and it is the plebe and the criminals who dominate, and nothing can be done except by shooting and hanging them. We are awaiting you here, General, and at the moment of your arrival we shall advance with all the forces at your disposal. But for that we must establish some communication with you, and before all clear up the following points. 1. Do you know that in your name all officers who could take part in the fight are being invited to leave Petrograd on the pretext of joining you? 2. About when can we count on your arrival at Petrograd? We should like to know in order to coordinate our actions. In spite of the criminal inaction of the conscious people here, which allowed the yoke of Bolshevism to be laid upon us, 
in spite of the extraordinary pig-headedness of the majority of officers so difficult to organize we believe in spite of all that truth is on our side and that we shall conquer the vicious and criminal forces who say that they are acting for motives of love and country and in order to save it whatever comes we shall not permit ourselves to be struck down and shall remain firm until the end End quote. Perishkovich, being brought to trial before the Revolutionary Tribunal, was given a short prison term. 10. Decree on the Monopoly of Advertisements 1. The printing of advertisements in newspapers, books, billboards, kiosks, in offices and other establishments, is declared to be a state monopoly. 2. Advertisements may only be published in the organs of the Provisional Workers' and Peasants' Government at Petrograd, and in the organs of local Soviets. 3. The proprietors of newspapers and advertising offices, as well as all employees of such establishments, should remain at their posts until the transfer of the advertisement business to the government, superintending the uninterrupted continuation of their houses, and turning over to the Soviets all private advertising and the sums received therefor, as well as all accounts and copy. 4. All managers of publications and businesses dealing with paid advertising, as well as their employees and workers, shall agree to hold a city congress, and to join, first the city trade unions, and then the all-Russian unions, to organize more thoroughly and justly the advertising business in the Soviet publications, as well as to prepare better rules for the public utility of advertising. 5. All persons found guilty of having concealed documents or money, or having sabotaged the regulations indicated in paragraphs 3 and 4, will be punished by a sentence of not more than three years imprisonment, and all their property will be confiscated. 6. The paid insertion of advertisements, in private publications, or under a masked form, will also be severely penalized. 7. Advertising offices are confiscated by the government, the owners being entitled to compensation in cases of necessity. Small proprietors, depositors, and stockholders of the confiscated establishments will be reimbursed for all monies held by them in the concern. 8. All buildings, officers, counters, and in general every establishment doing a business in advertising should immediately inform the Soviet of workers' and soldiers' deputies of its address and proceed to the transfer of its business under penalty of the punishment indicated in paragraph 5. President of the Council of People's Commissars, Vladimir Yulianov, Lenin. People's Commissar for Public Instruction, A. V. Lunacharsky. Secretary of the Council, N. Gorbanov. 11. Obligatory Ordinance. 1. The city of Petrograd is declared to be in a state of siege. 2. All assemblies, meetings, and congregations on the streets and squares are prohibited. 3. Attempts to loot wine cellars, warehouses, factories, stores, business premises, private dwellings, etc., etc., will be stopped by machine gun fire without warning. 4. House committees, doormen, janitors, and militiamen are charged with the duty of keeping strict order in all houses, courtyards, and in the streets, and house doors and carriage entrances must be locked at nine o'clock in the evening and opened at seven o'clock in the morning. After nine o'clock in the evening, only tenants may leave the house under strict control of the house committees. 5. Those guilty of the distribution, sale, or purchase of any kind of alcoholic liquor, and also those guilty of the violation of sections two and four, will be immediately arrested and subjected to the most severe punishment. Petrograd, 6th of December, 3 o'clock in the night. Committee to Fight Against Pogroms, attaché to the Executive Committee of the Soviet of Workers' and Soldiers' Deputies. 12. Two Proclamations. Lenin, to the People of Russia. Quote, Comrades, workers, soldiers, peasants, all toilers. The Workers' and Peasants' Revolution has won at Petrograd, at Moscow, from the front and the villages arrive every day, every hour, greetings to the new government. 
the victory of the revolution is assured, seeing that it is sustained by the majority of the people. It is entirely understandable that the proprietors and the capitalists, the employees and functionaries closely allied with the bourgeoisie, in a word, all the rich and all those who join hands with them, regard the new revolution with hostility, oppose its success, threaten to halt the activity of the banks, and sabotage or obstruct the work of other establishments. Every conscious worker understands perfectly that we cannot avoid this hostility, because the high officials have set themselves against the people, and do not wish to abandon their posts without resistance. But the working classes are not for one moment afraid of that resistance. The majority of the people are for us. For us are the majority of the workers and the oppressed of the whole world. We have justice on our side. Our ultimate victory is certain. The resistance of the capitalists and high officials will be broken. No one will be deprived of his property without a special law on the nationalization of banks and financial syndicates. This law is in preparation. Not a worker will lose a single kopeck. On the contrary, he will be assisted. Without at this moment establishing the new taxes, the new government considers one of its primary duties to make a severe accounting and control on the reception of taxes decreed by the former regime. Comrades workers, remember that you yourselves direct the government. No one will help you unless you organize yourselves and take into your own hands the affairs of the state. Your Soviets are now the organs of governmental power. Strengthen them, establish a severe revolutionary control, pitilessly crush the attempts at anarchy on the part of drunkards, brigands, counter-revolutionary yunkers, and Kornilovists. Establish a strict control over production and the accounting for products. Arrest and turn over to the revolutionary tribunal of the people every one who injures the property of the people by sabotage in production, by concealment of grain reserves, reserves of other products, by retarding the shipments of grain, by bringing confusion into the railroads, the posts, and the telegraphs, or in general opposing the great work of bringing peace and transferring the land to the peasants. Comrades, workers, soldiers, peasants, all toilers. Take immediately all local power into your hands. Little by little, with the consent of the majority of peasants, we shall march firmly and unhesitatingly toward the victory of socialism, which will fortify the advance guards of the working class of the most civilized countries, and give to the peoples an enduring peace, and free them from every slavery and every exploitation. End, quote. End of chapter 11 appendix part 1Appendices to Chapter 11, Part 2, and Chapter 12 of Ten Days That Shook the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed. 13. To all workers of Petrograd. Comrades, the revolution is winning. The revolution has won. All the power has passed over to our Soviets. The first weeks are the most difficult ones. The broken reaction must be finally crushed, a full triumph must be secured to our endeavors. The working class ought to, must, show in these days the greatest firmness and endurance, in order to facilitate the execution of all the aims of the new people's government of Soviets. In the next few days decrees on the labor question will be issued, and among the very first will be the decree on the workers' council over the production and regulation of industry. Strikes and demonstrations of the worker masses in Petrograd now can only do harm. We ask you to cease immediately all economic and political strikes, to take up your work and do it in perfect order. The work in the factories and all the industries is necessary for the new government of Soviets, because any interruption of this work will only create new difficulties for us, and we have enough as it is. 
all to your places. The best way to support the new government of Soviets in these days is by doing your job. Long live the iron firmness of the proletariat. Long live the revolution. Petrograd Soviet of W and S. D. Petrograd Council of Trade Unions. Petrograd Council of Factory Shop Committees. 14. Appeals and Counter Appeals. From the employees of the state and private banks to the population of Petrograd. Comrades, workers, soldiers, and citizens. The Military Revolutionary Committee in an extraordinary notice is accusing the workers of the state and private banking and other institutions of impeding the work of the government directed towards the insuring of the front with provisions. Comrades and citizens do not believe this calumny brought against us who are part of the general army of labor. However difficult it be for us to work under the constant threat of interference by acts of violence in our hard-working life, however depressing it be to know that our country and the revolution are on the verge of ruin, we, nevertheless, all of us, from the highest to the lowest, employees, artelstiki, counters, laborers, couriers, etc., are continuing to fulfill our duties which are connected with the ensuring of provisions and munitions to the front and country. Counting upon your lack of information, comrades, workers, and soldiers, in questions of finance and banking, you are being incited against workers like yourselves, because it is desirable to divert the responsibility for the starving and dying brother soldiers at the front, from the guilty persons to the innocent workers who are accomplishing their duty under the burden of general poverty and disorganization. Remember, workers and soldiers, the employees have always stood up for, and will always stand up for, the interests of the toiling people, part of which they are themselves, and not a single kopeck necessary for the front and the workers has ever been detained, and will not be detained, by the employees. From November 6th to November 23rd, i.e. during 17 days, 500 million rubles were dispatched to the front, and 120 millions to Moscow, besides the sums sent to other towns. Keeping guard over the wealth of the people, the master of which can be only the constituent assembly representing the whole nation, the employees refuse to give out money for purposes which are unknown to them. Do not believe the calumniators calling you to take the law into your own hands. Central Board of the All-Russian Union of Employees of the State Bank. Central Board of the All-Russian Trade Union of Employees of Credit Institutions. To the population of Petrograd. Citizens, do not believe the falsehood which irresponsible people are trying to suggest to you by spreading terrible calumnies against the employees of the Ministry of Supplies and the workers in other supply organizations who are laboring in these dark days for the salvation of Russia. Citizens, in posted placards you are called upon to lynch us. We are accused falsely of sabotage and strikes. We are blamed for all the woes and misfortunes that the people are suffering, although we have been striving indefatigably and uninterruptedly, and are still striving, to save the Russian people from the horrors of starvation. Notwithstanding all that we are bearing as citizens of unhappy Russia, we have not for one hour abandoned our heavy and responsible work of supplying the army and population with provisions. The image of the army, cold and hungry, saving our very existence by its blood and its tortures, does not leave us for a single moment. Citizens, if we have survived the blackest days in the life and history of our people, if we have succeeded in preventing famine in Petrograd, if we have managed to procure to the suffering army bread and forage by means of enormous, almost superhuman efforts, it is because we have honestly continued and are still continuing to do our work. To the, quote, last warning, end quote, of the usurpers of the power, we reply, it is not for you who are leading the country to ruin to threaten us who are doing all that we can not to allow the country to perish. We are not afraid of threats. 
Before us stands the sacred image of tortured Russia. We will continue our work of supplying the army and the people with bread to our last efforts, so long as you will not prevent us from accomplishing our duty to our country. In the contrary case, the army and the people will stand before the horrors of famine, but the responsibility therefore belongs to the perpetrators of violence. Executive Committee of the Employees of the Ministry of Supplies To the Chinovniki, Government Officials it is notified hereby that all officials and persons who have quitted the service in government and public institutions, or have been dismissed for sabotage, or for having failed to report for work on the day fixed, and who have nevertheless received their salary paid in advance for the time they have not served, are bound to return such salary, not later than on November 27, 1917, to those institutions where they were in service. In the event of this not being done, these persons will be rendered answerable for stealing the Treasury's property, and tried by the Military Revolutionary Court. The Military Revolutionary Committee, December 7, 1917 From the Special Board for the Supplies Citizens The conditions of our work for the supplying of Petrograd are getting more and more difficult every day. The interference with our work, which is so ruinous to our business, of the commissars of the Revolutionary Committee is still continuing. Their arbitrary acts, their annulling of our orders, may lead to a catastrophe. Seals have been affixed to one of the cold storages where the meat and butter destined for the population are kept, and we cannot regulate the temperature so that the products would not be spoiled one carload of potatoes and one carload of cabbages have been seized and carried away no one knows where to cargoes which are not liable to requisition calva are requisitioned by the commissars and as was the case one day five boxes of calva were seized by the commissar for his own use we are not in a position to dispose of our storages where the self-appointed commissars do not allow the cargoes to be taken out, and terrorize our employees, threatening them with arrest. All that is going on in Petrograd is known in the provinces, and from the Don, from Siberia, from Varanas and other places people are refusing to send flour and bread. This cannot go on much longer. The work is simply falling out of our hands. Our duty is to let the population know of this. To the last possibility, we will remain on guard of the interests of the population. We will do everything to avoid the oncoming famine, but if under these difficult conditions our work is compelled to stop, let the people know that it is not our fault. 15. Elections to the Constituent Assembly in Petrograd there were 19 tickets in Petrograd. The results are as follows, published November 30th. Party. Populist Socialists. Vote. 19,109. Cadets. 245,006. Christian Democrats. 3,707. Bolsheviki. 424,027. Socialist Universalists. 158. S.D. and S.R. Ukrainian and Jewish Workers, 4,219. League of Women's Rights, 5,310. Socialist Revolutionaries, Oberansi, 4,696. Left Socialist Revolutionaries, 152,230. League of the People's Development, 385. Radical Democrats, 41. Orthodox Parishes, 24,139. Feminine League for Salvation of Country, 318. Independent League of Workers, Soldiers, Peasants, 4,942. Christian Democrats, Catholic, 14,382. Unified Social Democrats, 11,740. Mensheviki, 17,427. Yedinstvo Group, 1,823. League of Cossack Troops, 6,712. 
16. From the Council of People's Commissars to the Toiling Cossacks. Brothers Cossacks, you are being deceived. You are being incited against the people. You are told that the Soviets of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies are your enemies, that they want to take away your Cossack land, your Cossack liberty. Don't believe it, Cossacks. Your own generals and landowners are deceiving you in order to keep you in darkness and slavery. We, the Council of People's Commissars, address ourselves to you, Cossacks, with these words. Read them attentively and judge yourselves which is the truth and which is cruel deceit. The life and service of a Cossack were always bondage and penal servitude. At the first call of the authorities, a Cossack always had to saddle his horse and ride out on campaign. All his military equipment a Cossack had to provide with his own hardly earned means. A Cossack is on service, his farm is going to rack and ruin. Is such a condition fair? No, it must be altered forever. The Cossacks must be freed from bondage. The new people's Soviet power is willing to come to the assistance of the toiling Cossacks. It is only necessary that the Cossacks themselves should resolve to abolish the old order, that they should refuse submission to their slave-driver officers, landowners, rich men, that they should throw off the cursed yoke from their necks. Arise, Cossacks, unite! The Council of People's Commissars calls upon you to enter a new, fresh, more happy life. In November and December, in Petrograd, there were all Russian congresses of Soviets of soldiers, workers, and peasants' deputies. These congresses transferred all the authority in the different localities into the hands of the Soviets, i.e., into the hands of men elected by the people. From now on, there must be in Russia no rulers or functionaries who command the people from above and drive them. The people create the authority themselves. A general has no more rights than a soldier. All are equal. Consider, Cossacks, is this wrong or right? We are calling upon you, Cossacks, to join this new order and to create your own Soviets of Cossacks' deputies. To such Soviets all the power must belong in the different localities, not to hetmans with the rank of general, but to the elected representatives of the toiling Cossacks, to your own trustworthy, reliable men. The all-Russian congresses of soldiers, workers, and peasants' deputies have passed a resolution to transfer all landowners' land into the possession of the toiling people. Is that not fair, Cossacks? The Kornilovs, Kaladins, Dutovs, Karayilovs, Bardizhes, all defend with their whole souls the interests of the rich men, and they are ready to drown Russia in blood if only the lands remain in the hands of the landowners. But you, the toiling Cossacks, do not you suffer yourselves from poverty, oppression, and lack of land. How many Cossacks are there who have more than four to five Dessiatins per head? but the landowners, who have thousands of desiatins of their own land, wish besides to get into their hands the lands of the Cossack army. According to the new Soviet laws, the lands of Cossack landowners must pass without compensation into the hands of the Cossack workers, the poorer Cossacks. You are being told that the Soviets wish to take away your lands from you. Who is frightening you? The rich Cossacks, who know that the Soviet authority wishes to transfer the landowners' lands to you. Choose then, Cossacks, for whom you will stand, for the Kornilovs and Kaladins, for the generals and the rich men, or for the Soviets of peasants, soldiers, workers, and Cossacks' deputies. The Council of People's Commissars, elected by the All-Russian Congress, has proposed to all nations an immediate armistice and an honorable democratic peace without loss or detriment to any nation. All the capitalists, landowners, generals Kornilovists, have risen against the peaceful policy of the Soviets. The war was bringing them profits, power, distinctions. And to you, Cossack privates? You were perishing without reason, without purpose, like your brothers soldiers and sailors. It will soon be three years and a half that this accursed war has gone on, a war devised by the capitalists and landowners of all countries for their own profit, 
their world robberies. To the toiling Cossacks the war has only brought ruin and death. The war has drained all the resources from Cossack farm life. The only salvation for the whole of our country, and for the Cossacks in particular, is a prompt and honest peace. The Council of People's Commissars has declared to all governments and peoples, we do not want other people's property, and we do not wish to give away our own. Peace without annexations and without indemnities. Every nation must decide its own fate. There must be no oppressing of one nation by another. Such is the honest, democratic, people's peace, which the Council of People's Commissars is proposing to all governments, to all peoples, allies and enemies. And the results are visible. On the Russian front an armistice has been concluded. The soldiers and the Cossacks' blood is not flowing there any more. Now Cossacks decide. Do you wish to continue this ruinous, senseless, criminal slaughter? Then support the cadets, the enemies of the people. Support Chernov, Tseretelli, Skobielev, who drove you into the offensive of July 1st. Support Kornilov, who introduced capital punishment for soldiers and Cossacks at the front. But if you wish a prompt and honest peace, then enter the ranks of the Soviets and support the Council of People's Commissars. Your fate, Cossacks, lies in your own hands. Our common foes, the landowners, capitalists, officers Kornilovists, bourgeois newspapers, are deceiving you and driving you along the road to ruin. In Orenburg, Dutov has arrested the Soviet and disarmed the garrison. Kaladin is threatening the Soviets in the province of the Don. He has declared the province to be in a state of war and is assembling his troops. Karalyulov is shooting the local tribes in the Caucasus. The cadet bourgeoisie is supplying them with its millions. Their common aim is to suppress the people's Soviets, to crush the workers and peasants, to introduce again the discipline of the whip in the army, and to eternalize the bondage of the toiling Cossacks. Our revolutionary troops are moving to the Don and the Ural in order to put an end to this criminal revolt against the people. The commanders of the revolutionary troops have received orders not to enter into any negotiations with the mutinous generals, to act decisively and mercilessly. Cossacks, on you depends now whether your brother's blood is to flow still. We are holding out our hand to you. Join the whole people against its enemies. Declare Kaladin, Kornilov, Dutov, Karayulov, and all their aiders and abettors to be enemies of the people, traitors and betrayers. Arrest them with your own forces, and turn them over into the hands of the Soviet authority, which will judge them in open and public revolutionary tribunal. Cossacks, form Soviets of Cossacks deputies. Take into your toil-worn hands the management of all the affairs of the Cossacks. Take away the lands of your own wealthy landowners. Take over their grain, their inventoried property and livestock, for the cultivation of the lands of the toiling Cossacks, who are ruined by the war. Forward, Cossacks, to the fight for the common cause of the people. Long live the toiling Cossacks. Long live the union of the Cossacks, the soldiers, peasants, and workers. Long live the power of the Soviets of Cossacks, soldiers, workers, and peasants' deputies. Down with the war, down with the landowners and the Kornilovist generals. Long live peace and the brotherhood of peoples. Council of People's Commissars 17. From the Commission on Public Education, attached to the Central City Duma. Comrades, working men and working women, a few days before the holidays, a strike has been declared by the teachers of the public schools. The teachers side with the bourgeoisie against the workers and peasants' government. Comrades, organize parents' committees and pass resolutions against the strike of the teachers. Propose to the ward Soviets of workers and soldiers' deputies, the trade unions, the factory shop and party committees, to organize protest meetings. Arrange with your own resources, Christmas trees and entertainments for the children, and demand the opening of the schools, after the holidays, at the date which will be set by the Duma. 
Comrades, strengthen your position in matters of public education. Insist on the control of the proletarian organizations over the schools. Commission on Public Education, attached to the Central City Duma. 18. Diplomatic Correspondence of the Soviet Government. The notes issued by Trotsky to the Allies and to the Neutral Powers, as well as the note of the Allied military attaches to General Dukonin, are too voluminous to give here. Moreover, they belong to another phase of the history of the Soviet Republic, which with this book has nothing to do, the foreign relations of the Soviet government. This I treat at length in the next volume, Kornilov to Brest-Litovsk. 19. Appeals to the Front Against Dukonin The struggle for peace has met with the resistance of the bourgeoisie and the counter-revolutionary generals, from the accounts in the newspapers, at the Stavka of former Supreme Commander Dukonin, are gathering the agents and allies of the bourgeoisie, Verkovsky, Avskientev, Chernoff, Gotz, Saratelli, etc. It seems even that they want to form a new power against the Soviets. Comrades, soldiers, all the persons we have mentioned have been ministers already. They have acted in accord with Kerensky and the bourgeoisie. They are responsible for the offensive of July 1st, and for the prolongation of the war. They promised the land to the peasants, and then arrested the land committees. They re-established capital punishment for soldiers. They obey the orders of French, English, and American financiers. General Dukonin, for having refused to obey orders of the Council of People's Commissars, has been dismissed from his position as Supreme Commander. For answer, he is circulating among the troops the note from the military attachés of the Allied imperialist powers, and attempting to provoke a counter-revolution. Do not obey Dukonin. Pay no attention to his provocation. Watch him and his group of counter-revolutionary generals carefully. 20. From Krylenko. Order number 2. The ex-Supreme Commander, General Dukonin, for having opposed resistance to the execution of orders, for criminal action susceptible of provoking a new civil war, is declared enemy of the people. All persons who support Dukonin will be arrested, without respect to their social or political position, or their past. Persons equipped with special authority will operate these arrests. I charge General Manikovsky with the execution of the above-mentioned dispositions. Appendix to Chapter 12 1. Instruction to Peasants In answer to the numerous enquiries coming from peasants, it is hereby explained that the whole power in the country is from now on held by the Soviets of the workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies. The workers' revolution, after having conquered in Petrograd and in Moscow, is now conquering in all other centres of Russia. The workers' and peasants' government safeguards the interests of the masses of peasantry, the poorest of them. It is with the majority of peasants and workers against the landowners and against the capitalists. Hence the Soviets of peasants' deputies, and before all the district Soviets, and subsequently those of the provinces, are from now on and until the Constituent Assembly meets, full-powered bodies of state authority in their localities. All landlords' titles to the land are cancelled by the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets. A decree regarding the land has already been issued by the Provisional Workers' and Peasants' Government. On the basis of the above decree, all lands hitherto belonging to landlords now pass entirely and wholly into the hands of the Soviets of Peasants' Deputies. The Volost, a group of several villages forms a Volost, land committees, are immediately to take over all land from the landlords, and to keep a strict account over it, watching that order be maintained, and that the whole estate be well guarded, seeing that from now on all private estates become public property, and must therefore be protected by the people themselves. All orders given by the Volost land committees, adopted with the assent of the district Soviets of peasants' deputies, in fulfillment of the decrees issued by the revolutionary power, are absolutely legal, and are to be forthwith and irrefutably brought into execution. 
the workers and peasants government appointed by the second all-russian congress of soviets has received the name of the council of people's commissars the council of people's commissars summons the peasants to take the whole power into their hands in every locality the workers will in every way absolutely and entirely support the peasants arrange for them all that is required in connection with machines and tools and in return they request the peasants to help with the transport of grain. President of the Council of People's Commissars, V. Yulianov, Lenin, Petrograd, November 18, 1917. 2. The full-powered Congress of Peasant Soviets met about a week later, and continued for several weeks. Its history is merely an expanded version of the history of the Extraordinary Conference. At first, the great majority of the delegates were hostile to the Soviet government and supported the reactionary wing. Several days later, the assembly was supporting the moderates with Chernoff, and several days after that, the vast majority of the Congress were voting for the faction of Maria Spiridonova and sending their representatives into the Tsayika at Smolny. The right wing then walked out of the Congress and called a Congress of its own, which went on, dwindling from day to day, until it finally dissolved. End of Chapter 11 Appendix Part 2 and Chapter 12 Appendix End of Ten Days That Shook the World by John Reed